there. Again. A princess in a tower is just a bird in a cage. before your queen. It won't take long, I promise. In the world of NACT, every single player has one dream, to raise the ultimate trophy. It builds alliances. It defines rivalries. And it creates superstars. The only question is, who will be next? Greetings, fellow operatives. Agent Beth here, undercover as your favorite eSport host to bring you the latest NACT recap. Just as you thought, the NACT 2024 Spring regular season has come to a, what's the word, stale end. The last day broadcast brought you more twists and turns than you could have expected. Bloodhounds, still grappling with defeat, took a match win straight from Divas Activity's pockets. Meanwhile, Night Horde snatched the eyeballs of tens of thousands of viewers as they dethroned our kings and sent BTK back to square one. With playoffs right around the corner, let's discuss the path to victory for some of your favorite teams. In game one, despite some great sets coming in from Gabuga, 
Bloodhounds found themselves drowning in a 10,000 gold deficit, unable to plot their way to victory against the game. But hold on to your hats because Game 2 was where the Bloodhounds showed us their true potential into a fierce playoff run. Both Carrasco boldly locking in that Eudora not only left her casters speechless at the draft, but surprised the entire NACD community with an insane comeback victory. We got some inside scoopity doop boop into the excitement of the boys after the win, so let's take a listen. Keep going, keep going. Me, I, I'm up on five. I'm up on five. Yeah, you'll be up. You'll be up in time. I'm gonna. I'm going for the tower. Right? Hey, you, you, might, you might have to. You might have to go to that. Both of you guys go. We should just be able to tower lock. I'm coming. I'm coming. Come. Any dice? Keep going. 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 Crazy. One more. Although Bloodhounds eventually fell short in the series, their heroic performance illuminated the path ahead for just what they're capable of in the playoffs. Last week's headline stealer, though, if you haven't caught off yet, was the insane upset of Night Horde against the Bloodthirsty King. A decisive game one wrapped up in under 14 minutes left Joss drop. Then, a stroke of genius with the Ixia pick outranged and outdamaged BTK in Game 3. Nighthorn has proven once again that they are the real Dark Horse in the spring season, just like their logo. Rumor has it though, that Oh My Fo started channeling his inner zoo after that epic win against BTK, so let's tap into the wildness. Yeah. Yo, I'm, I'm not gonna do it in the video. What are you doing? Wait, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Yo, yo, you do interview, bro. Interview, yo, yo. Overall, guys, we wrapped up the regular season with a rather unsurprising GG number one and a BTK number two. What I have my eyes on, and honestly, so should you are the dark horses and rising stars like the Night Horde, Area 77, Fiends, and Devious Activity. But who are you rooting for in the playoffs? Comment down below. Now our inside agents informed us that Legacy is keeping its ace up its sleeves until the playoffs. I guess we'll find out their secret weapon very soon. Looking at the playoffs bracket, it seems like a GG is the only team with a fairly straight shot into the semifinals. Its XY BTK, however, might face a tougher road ahead. Luckily, BTK has stuck with its tried and true regular season roster this time, so let's hope the Kings can swiftly regain momentum and give us a powerhouse performance in the playoffs. That's it for us today, codename NACT regular season, mission success. Will host Liz return to the playoffs or is she codename gone? I guess you'll have to find out this weekend. Agent Beth, signing off.
The NACT spring season has been nothing but big plays and hype moments. 77 is going to have to back off. Bahari doesn't care, though. Look at the damage coming on the oh Jules Cutie, able to shred him down. Every team has fought hard and competed at the highest level. White Chicken able to get the I'm offended. Tarzan Cutie goes down. Maybe they should have just gone for the Lord, but they decide not to. They want to try to force this right here. But Jay is bursted. Shark back on the field. Area 77 are falling. Did they push it too far? Gaming Gladiators don't come to our base just yet. Now let's take a look back at their finest moments. Ed, the Lord is down to half health already. BTK, do they want to try to end this here? Oh, the final slash does lock on to Pro Destroy. Milo back in, Whoa. knock up, taken out. Basic able to pick up the kill. Kahari. Magic taking so much damage, but Kahari is up and ready to go. Speedy Light Wheel. No. Not able to connect just yet. Nicolette able to find another. It's nothing but Kohari and Turo against the world. And the minions are closing in. Will this be a 2-0? Fiends still trying Milo. to put it all on the line here. BTK feeling confident, dropping the toss, toss. Just lock onto the base and finish it. Kohari going to be the next to fall. Milo looking for it, but now Kohari gets the shutdown. And now the minions are back up. It's Turo and Kohari still against the world, but BTK is not playing anymore. We're entering the 20-minute sleeps in trouble. Ooh. Ooh, a lot of damage on a sleepy, but they got to get back to base quick. The Lord is already oh. almost there. Uh oh, Manoan's Fury does come out for Barrage Flicker, but that is a lot wasted there. Can they clear it out? No, they're locking onto the base, and that is it. Well, so it's just like a great combination by them. Ooh. Oh, another Divine Judgment. And Melon able to get the kill. Lord still coming. Bloodhound's down one member. A lot of damage on Ooga Booga. Melon able to get the kill. No T finds up asleep. Gets away with just a sliver. Yato flickers in. Lord is on the base, and it's five members chipping it down. DA take game three. Yeah, it's the vengeance just pretty much doing the damage itself in Jay here. Oh, they tried for the divine judgment, but did get caught. Ohari finds the kill there. A blazing duet from ISO, not able to find too many marks there. You can see the vengeance from Uneven with those electrifying beats, able to put some damage on Kohari on the back line, trying to shred down your rest. He might be the next one, oh and that is it. You can see Kohari. There are no more members for him to take down. Melon on to T, cushion to the backside, look for Boca. Taking a little bit too much damage. Uka Booka able to force him away. T also taking a lot easy peasy, finds the decimation. Immortality oh. down, T down, but the Lord has fallen as well. Base. They want to lock onto the base. Can they finish this? Ooga Booga does it. Iso finds the tower into the Whoa. back. Nicolette with that time journey to try to protect her team. Bursted down, taken down by Mark Cutie. This could be the end. Iso still pushing into the tower. Oh. It's just Kono left. We have minions up at the top. Basic with the blazing duet, trying to clear out the minions. Gets taken out by Iso. Here Yo. comes Mielo with the damage he gets taken out by mark Cuny. it's just cold world left but they have no minions still gonna try to force it at this mid tower we have zane. the timers up your reshi coming in zane is back out is he gonna have the heavy spin ready the, the, the core goes down this is gonna be a sweep for area 77 both sides will get a kill their first kills of the game you are gonna see Cuny nash get the kill for the side of legacy but the invasion on the orange buff Ooh, a lot of damage on to Ryles there. I mean, Rams is there. Rams is going to take it. The Prince Wrath goes down. Oh. Rams is able to just get away with a singular HP there. But we're already seeing the possibilities from the side of LG, the invades. Whoopi now there as well. Ooga Booga looking for the invades. Able to get the knock up. The Tyrant's Revenge. The Templus goes down. Ooga Booga taking a lot of damage. Whoopi looking for the final punch, the knockout punch, and knocks him out. We're still looking at seven turrets in favor for GG, though. But maybe some more for Devious Activity as they are now seizing the opportunity. Ooh, big final slash on to TT goes down. Melon on the run. Fight chicken finds the kill. Kush might oh. just be next. It's a three for one trade. Bet well, best player's been down, and they don't care. Yato now in trouble in the wall, trying to get away. Shark Whoa. not gonna let it happen. It's the final slash, and all that's left is Mikasa. Can they end this here? It's nothing but Mikasa on the field. Mikasa pops the old. Gonna try to, oh my God, look at the damage no. to Mikasa. He's immediately taken out. GG will close the night out early. The teams are ready for their battles, but only two will make it to Vegas for the final showdown. NACT, it's time to pick your champion.
The moment we've all been waiting for, guys. Welcome to day one of the playoffs for NACT Spring 2024. Warm-ups are history now, and it's time to separate the contenders from the pretenders. Fresh rosters, higher stakes, and the threat of fast elimination set the stage for top-tier gaming. Joining with me on the cast recess today are our veterans, Steph Weezy and Private. How's excitement ramping up for playoff stage, boys? Oh, I'm excited. Hey, we're finally here. The playoffs is on fire now. We've had a great regular season and now jumping into day one. Who better to do it with than uh, Liz and also Private? How you doing? Yeah, it's, it's excitement uh, galore here because now it, it is do or die time for all of these teams. Time to pull out all the stops. No more monkeying around. And for some of these teams, it might be their swan song on the way out. Yeah, and we'll find out very soon. First up, let's take a recap at the playoffs format. We are here at day one of the playoffs, still with our same eight rosters, but this time a misstep could mean a swift exit and someone is going home. The format is double elimination series with best of fives for the winner's bracket and best of threes when you drop to the loser's bracket. The playoffs bracket right now is shown on screen and is reflecting of the team's regular season standings. GG and BTK secured a top spot in the regular season, so they have a relatively easier roster to begin with and a pretty clear path to semifinals. But only two teams are going to make it to the grand finals, so we'll find out who's coming to Vegas very soon. Yeah, and I mean, just like you mentioned, it's make it or break it now. There's actually something to lose. It's not a point system anymore. It, you can be knocked out of the NACT going forward here. You know, there's not too many chances left on the board. You have a best of five. In the upper bracket, you get knocked down to the lower bracket, a best of three, and you're gone. So we're going to see who has that merit in them to be able to climb up that ladder to the top to have a seat inside of the grand finals. Yeah, and as we were talking about, there's no more points here, but the points have pretty much laid rest of where these teams are on the brackets. The best taking on the proverbial worst from the season right now, but that doesn't mean that uh, all is done yet. They still have a chance, an opportunity to prove some of those naysayers wrong. Yeah, and even though only the top two teams are making it to Vegas, everyone gets a prize. So let's take a look at the prize pool for all of our teams. Now, prize pool always brings a lot of excitement. We have a total of $25,000 in diamonds for grabs, and the top team will be clinching home a $10,000 cash prize. And in addition to that, we have a $100 USD bonus for the each win and each team. And we have actually an additional finals MVP for grabs, as well as a $3 million prize pool for the MSC. So a lot of prizes this season. And speaking of prizes, another addition, every series that a team wins is another $100 in their pocket as well, which is uh, the first time I believe we've done this in the NACT. So, I mean, as these teams are evolving, so is the NACT for North America. Yeah, and uh, we talked about that that prize pool. There's also the MVP of the night in the grand finals. We'll have a little extra moolah. So there's just, uh, we're just giving out uh, money back and forth to uh, to some of those uh, better players out here. And it's going to be very exciting to see who can come out on top. Yep, and stay tuned for all of our exciting prizes for our viewers. As you catch the stream, we have giveaways coming up after a couple series. So stay tuned. Now, for today's matches, we have the winner's bracket top best of fives with GG versus Legacy and then Area 77 versus Fiends. Now, both teams, we know that GG and Area 77 actually don't have a roster change, but Legacy and Fiends have a pretty big roster change, so a lot that we can go into afterwards. And yeah, definitely a lot to kind of jump into. Gaming Gladiators up against Legacy will be our first series of the day. Best of five. It's going to be a long night, fellas. Maybe a short one for a couple of teams. Hey, time will tell. I'm not going to throw that, that caster curse out there. But anything is possible in the land of Don. I mean, we've been asking the question, who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, you know, the kings of the hill? The, the people that are at the top of the ladder, such as GG sitting in that number one position. And Legacy, who barely slid by, even into the regular season in that top eight. Didn't have the greatest run, but hey, now's their chance. Hopefully they learned enough in the regular season to be able to bridge that gap and put on some great competition today. Yeah, this, I want to say this season for NACT has been loaded with just extra opportunities. Whether it's the qualifiers that happened on two different weeks, which gave you extra uh, opportunities to try to make it into the top eight, or even right now where it's a best of five. So that is, uh, at the very least, three games for you to kind of set the tone to be able to get your wits about you and rise to the occasion. 
And will Legacy's roster change be that fresh start they needed? Let's take a look at what changed for the Legacy team. And there you are, PDR in the XP lane, swapping out for Whoopi. Will be an addition to Legacy. A couple of teams have been swapping around. Switching the XP lane, I feel like it could have a phenomenal impact. I'm excited to see how it goes, but nonetheless, Legacy definitely has a lot of work that they have to be able to step into, especially going up against a team such as Gaming Gladiators. With the new addition on the roster for the playoffs, will it be the difference? Yeah, it's uh, actually really exciting to see if they, because they have had a, a little bit of a struggle uh, when it comes to the team compositions, being able to protect Riles on some of those more comfortable picks that he likes with the assassins. But I mean, if any time is uh, we're we're at that point where it now is all that matters. We're at the playoffs. One of these teams is going to be moving forward. One of these teams is going to be dropping to the lower bracket. And let's see Gigi's rosters coming up. Oh, yeah, you can see how we just it. talked about it. We talked about it before. There are no changes here. It's kind of hard to mess with what uh, we've been considering perfection so far. Is he going to be in the gold lane? Shark in the Rome Hoon taking up the mid lane. A best player at the jungle and fried chicken. Fried chicken, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> bringing up the XP lane. And I mean, it, I mean, there's no reason to change the roster. They've been very successful. Sans one match, but I mean, there was one match that was a very big surprise that kind of came at a cost of maybe them being a little indecisive when it came to some of the draft. So, I mean, we're looking for them to kind of close up those holes here as they move on here in the playoffs. Yeah, and GG is a team where every season they've played so far, they haven't really had a roster change, even in the previous two seasons. And for this playoffs match, do you guys think there's going to be a difference when it comes to best of five series with how the series is going to come up? Uh, I feel like a best of five always has a different dynamic because there's more things that you can kind of work toward if something doesn't work in game number one, right? When you when you lose game number one, it's match point and it could be an easy sweep and you're out of there. But when you have to lose uh, essentially three games in a row to be knocked out, you have a lot more leverage to be able to bounce back. And I think a lot of teams can kind of lean on that, uh, especially when it comes to drafting. I mean, we do have a new hero in the game available. I mean, we got to see him uh, for the end of the season, the regular season for NACT chip is now in effect. I know he hasn't been kind of selected as one of the hot prospects, but it does change a little bit of the dynamic on what you may see in terms of drafting. So with a best of five, definitely expect some surprises. Yeah, especially now that uh, we've been seeing a little bit more, uh, especially Hoon on uh, Lu Yi right now has been really favoring that mage, kind of uh, been able to kind of get them around the map, get uh, other players to their lanes very fast, a lot of damage and CC coming in with it, and then having Shark in the front to kind of protect that Lu Yi. So it's been an amazing games for them so far, but like we've said, this is the playoffs now. It's time to kind of hunker down and get those uh, and roll forward uh, with their picks. And let's see who our casters picked as the favorite today for our predictions. I'm smelling it's GG all the way for our casters. I mean, uh, who can we blame? Gaming Gladiators had a pretty much straight straight run to victory and they have a relative, it reflects in the bracket they're facing, right? For Legacy, on the other hand, they were stuck at zero gravity for the regular season. I mean, they have the roster change coming in today. So do you guys think that's going to make any difference in how it looks for them for today's games? Ah, it's going to be a hard one. I don't want to throw the <laughs> curse on them. You know, something I am surprised, though, with this prediction is that UA voted with everybody this time. I thought it would have been like the anomaly that we usually oh see. God. But hey, I mean, now that UA's voted with everybody, <laughs> there is a chance that Legacy may be able to pull this off. So maybe I should have switched my vote. Or perhaps Yui considers them the underdogs. Interesting. No, uh, I think Yui just kind of uh, joining up with the crew there. But it's it's hard to argue against a team like Gaming Gladiators, who have been so successful in North America, especially when it comes to the playoffs. Uh, and then uh, when you're talking about a, a team like Legacy, the the one shining point for Legacy is that they have zero wins, so there is honestly nowhere to go but up for them. Yeah, I mean, you already hit rock bottom, so all the, the only thing you can come is to come back up. And I mean, UA has been trying to win this whole season. The only team that he's rooting for, no matter what, is Fiends. So I'm sure we're going to see that tomorrow. <laughs> now let's 
but I believe draft is ready. So casters, let's get into the draft for the first game of day one playoffs. Let's get in. That's right, and into the draft we go. Not gonna waste any more time. Game number one, first series of the playoffs is gonna be Game and Gladiators up against Legacy. The number one up against the number eight. Private, in for a show. What are we thinking? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh... It's very interesting what we've been seeing. I, I feel like uh, we talk about gaming gladiators a lot. And when it comes to, especially when it comes to like, uh, it's one of the top teams here in North America. And for me, I kind of want to focus on like what legacy needs to do to be successful. Right now we've seen uh, Riles uh, play an assortment of junglers. He's played those tanky ones uh, and he's been able to play some of his assassins. He's had, he's not had success on uh, really any of them and it's not just him it's the rest of the team that has to kind of collide in and be able to support him with those picks the one thing i'm wanting to see here from this team from legacy tonight is uh, uh timed objectives when those objectives come up i want to be seeing the entire team clamoring around for it or getting a pick off in a side lane but they're the, the time for indecisiveness uh is over and it's time for you guys to make a call uh, and execute that when the time is right. Hey, I like it. I mean, we were kind of talking about it, right? Gaming Gladiators is one of those teams. You give them an inch, they go a mile. They focus on the early game objectives, and usually they thrive there and are able to close the game out at about that 12, 13 minute mark if you let them. On the side of Legacy, though, you know, their early game's just not really there. Even sometimes when they get the more optimal picks, it just doesn't work in their favor. We haven't seen them win. I believe a single game in the entire regular season. So, I mean, if they do win one, I, I guess that is a victory. I mean, if, if they take even just a single match, uh, it would be great for them. But as we are now looking at the draft so far, a couple of picks have been, or bands have been knocked off the table. The Mathilda, a little uh, normal, but we are seeing the Masha. I know you, we kind of talked about this, the Masha being a little bit of that heavy hitter now. Uh, and on the opposing side, the Vexana. Yeah, uh, definitely uh, they're going to, uh, uh, a good ban there for the Vexana. It's been like probably one of the top picks and uh, had the most impact on a lot of teams' compositions, the amount of CC she can throw down, the range there, and especially when it comes to those objective fights. You basically wait in the bush, and then as soon as you're ready for the retribution, Vexana comes in there, CCs the jungler down, and you're able to escape with a retribution onto the turtle and make your escape. You know, and I'm wondering, I haven't seen Chip banned out yet. I really want to kind of see him in effect. I want to be able to cast one of those games with him on the playing field. I know a lot of people are still wondering, is he meta? Is he really even worth it? Because you allow a lot of uh, valuable options to walk on the table. If you do select it, and sometimes he doesn't provide the strongest CC that you're kind of relying on uh, in that roam position. The R lot is going to be taken off the table, though. That will be uh, one of the limited options for uh, either side to be able to pick up. You are still seeing kind of those beefier jungles still available. Something like the uh, Barats can be an option. You can stack it up with an Angela. Both of them very great. Do have to watch out for that Valentina. Something else that is still currently walking, who we have been seeing sneak into the meta scene, is that Lu Yi. Right? You've seen Hoon pick it out. You saw him doing really well on it. Could be a viable option. One thing that's uh, very interesting is we haven't banned out a lot of those assassins that best player is usually known for. Usually when we're going against somebody like Gaming Gladiators, you see the Joy banned out, you see the Nolan banned out. So maybe uh, Legacy knowing something a little uh, that we might not about where best player might be going, but we're gonna go ahead, pick up the Ruby first here. She did take a little bit of a nerf just recently where about 50% of her regen uh, was nerfed down, I wanna say a week ago, but I mean, that has not stopped the dominance of Ruby. Uh, and especially here because it can be kind of a flexible pick, uh, whether it's in the XP lane or as a roam for gaming gladiators. Yeah, I mean, there is still Nolan on the table too. Maybe that will be a pickup for gaming gladiators if they're able to be able to pull it off. I think the Ruby's great though, even with a little bit of the nerf, still a very high utility uh, hero that you can slot either into the roam position, possibly into the XP to keep Legacy on their toes. Looks like they went the double support method though. They are gonna ban out that uh, Mathilda and uh, that Angela, and there it goes, Nolan. They're not gonna let Gaming Gladiators take it. They're gonna go in for the Assassin themselves. Yeah, and then picking up the x -Borg to maybe possibly counter out one of those tankier jungle picks by Gaming Gladiators. I do like it here, but like we've said before, what I'm wanting to see from Legacy here is the support of this pickup because Assassins, while they can be, especially on a Nolan, you can be able to get a traverse the map very quickly, get those objectives quickly and move around uh, to get a lot of that farm. He is susceptible to getting ganked. So you're gonna need to make sure that your team is paying attention. The callouts are there and they're able 
able to close in on gaming gladiators when Riles needs them. Yeah, and I mean, we're gonna have to see where this goes. Oh, speaking of pickups, Joy walks. Now, there is still suppression on the table. I mean, I don't know if it really worked that well inside of the favor for Legacy with the draft that they have so far, which may be a little bit of a problem. I mean, Joy, Joy is one of those heroes, kind of like that Nat you can't swap away uh, if you don't have the suppression to be able to stop him in the tracks. Roger is kind of uh, pulling some things out of the C meta. We've been seeing it translate into the North American scene. Inside of that gold lane, I think it works out really well. You can stack it up with something like a Purify uh, to not really have to worry about too much CC, but it, it gives you the advantage, at least in the early phase, to be a little bit more aggressive and uh, dominate your lane. Yeah, dominate your lane without the need for those rotations. And that makes it very relaxed for gaming gladiators if there isn't a counter on there. I think the only thing that we've really seen that can match up with a Roger in that lane is uh, possibly the, uh, oh, not the Harley, the, um, the Harith. The Harith has been a big thing that can kind of counter, puts up a lot of damage. We've seen them try to match up with uh, carries as well there. But if there isn't one of those two picks, I fear that the Marksman lane is probably going to be pretty dominant for or gaming gladiators or gaming gladiators as we do see that the from is going to be picked up here by legacy yeah they're going for the sustainability right they took out the angela they took out the mathilda picked up the fair miss slots it inside of the mid lane i think it works out pretty well uh, now i am expecting some anti-heal picked up from the side of gaming gladiators not only to counter uh the Ferramus, but also to counter that x borg to top that off so it's kind of getting knocking down two birds with one stone if they're not careful now when you're looking at the at least the synergy from those three heroes, right? You have the Nolan who can rush in, get a quick kill, and then he needs to get back. You have the Export who can provide the utility, he can slow down the team, he can rush him with the last insanity. He can be the initiator uh, as well when the Nolan can't go back in because he's on uh, cooldown. So I think it works out really well, and then you pair it up with the heals provided over there by uh, the Ferramus to keep them alive. When I'm looking at Gaming Gladiators though, right? They have the Ruby. They can keep pretty much everybody in their tracks when they do group, group up on that Ferramus. They have nobody right now, I would say, to kind of stop the Joy. I guess maybe the uh, Export can slow him down with the Ice Queen wand. Could be a possible plan, but nothing to really solidify stopping him in his tracks. Yeah, very interesting bands here coming out. Uh, we've seen uh, that Hoon does favor that Lu Yi that's taken off the board from Legacy. And then I was just talking about that Harith. That it can be probably one of the only counters for Roger. That's going to be taken off the board for gaming Gladiators as they go ahead, pick up uh, a Kaja for the ban and a Valentina, which means they're not going to have that IMU uh, possibly out. And I say, like, uh, depends on what we're going here. We still have, when it comes to, like, those roaming positions, pos the possibilities, uh, We've I I'm assuming Shark is going to go ahead and pick up this ruby so we're looking for that xp lane uh i mean it, it actually the world is uh, out there for fly chicken there's not really too many xp lanes that are banned out right now so he pretty much has his pick of the litter here yeah i mean he has flexibility right he can pretty much pick out what he wants to now when it comes to getting the xp lane to get to the back line though i mean there's not really too many backline heroes available yet you don't know who legacy's gonna pick we haven't seen uh their marksman picked up oh wait a second but there's a pickup is that that's gonna be hilda that is Hilda. I was gonna say I haven't yep. seen a Hilda in a long time. <laughs> yeah, this is, almost didn't this recognize is, her. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, hold on, Hilda got a perm. But anyway, as we are going back into this though, the Hilda definitely can harass inside of the jungle. Uh, can definitely be something that Gaming Gladiators has to watch out for. But they do have Shark. I've always said that Shark has been one of the few roamers in North America who knows how to harass the opponent jungler and stop them from getting their orange or purple buffs and providing that vision. So I expect them to have some good defense, uh, but definitely somebody to have to watch out for. Yeah, very interesting here. I feel like they are... I, I like the confidence of this draft from a Legacy here because a lot of these take a lot of synergy, especially with the Hilda. She's going to be trying to invade. She's going to be trying to get that vision. So you, you're you going to need to make sure that you're supporting them because Gaming Gladiators, as they close in around a Hilda, you're going to need to make sure that she has that support so that she can make that escape there. But from the side of Gaming Gladiators, who's going to go ahead and pick up the Navaria? And then we have uh, a Brody being picked up. Yeah, and, and also, um, I mean, um. <laughs> there's a Miss Ban, too. I don't know where the Miss Ban was. But anyway, that's just something interesting that we kind of noticed. But the Brody's good. I mean, it, especially against a the Hilda, somebody that's going to rush in and try and get to him. Because we were talking about heroes I can get to the back line. Brody's great against that with the Corrosive uh, Strike to be able to get that stun. And to be able to go back to safety with the Flicker. Uh, the Navaria to be able to fight from afar. It doesn't have to worry about the, uh, the Nether Realm over there from the Ferramus. When they do group up to heal up, he can just drop down that Astro Echo and uh, slow down the whole team and provide that damage from afar and assist the team in terms of utility. But speaking of utility, last pick on the board is going to be the Clyde. 
Yeah, a very interesting uh, draft here. I'm, I'm actually waiting to see, is Z going to be sticking with this Brody? So then possibly the Raja is going to be the jungler for mm -hmm. them. Uh, so, I mean, and it's going to be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with the the way how fast you're able to farm up with Roger, you're gonna be able to use that lichen pounce to evade a lot of the CC, a lot of the damage that comes out, and actually close in on the back line if you need to. And somebody who actually might be able to match up with the speed that a Nolan uh, pick has for Riles. Yeah, I mean, hey, you said best player not getting that assassin. Lee said, hey, I got something for you. Let's go mark the assassin, <laughs> switch things up a little bit. But with both rosters finalized, there goes the Claude, there goes the Brody. I think the Claude will be okay. He should be able to get to the back line, go back to safety. Does have to watch out for the Ruby picking him up, though, with that CC. The Lincoln Pounce can be a problem, but I'm expecting some great invasions over there from Legacy. As ladies and gentlemen, we are now jumping into game number one, the first series of the playoffs for the NACT spring season. Who do you think will be able to claim victory? Uh, right now, I mean, as far as a draft, there's, there's a lot of boxes that need to be checked for the side of Legacy to be successful here. But I mean, we have talked about it. They, this is a draft with a lot of confidence. You can already see Kuya Ken over there on the enemy side, just trying to get Vision wandering about and they're not able to bring him down. Yeah, we talked about it, right? Running on that Hilda, being aggressive, invading, but keep an eye on Shark as well. He's trying to provide that defense and keep him at bay. But look at Riles on the invasion as well on the opposing side, trying to get anything they can nice and early. Uh, yeah, and right now, I mean, they're still kind of keeping each other at bay. I do like, like I was saying, the confidence. I like being able to kind of group into the enemy jungle, make sure that you're getting the vision. And Kuya Ken doing such a great job of that right now, as long as he doesn't get caught and taken down, though. You see, my only worry is there is a Roger, and he definitely is like a shark smelling blood in the water if you're low HP. So you are going to have to be careful. He's going to be able to hit you a little bit harder with that Lincoln pounce. Now, Looking at the gold lane, we are looking at the Brody up against the Claude. The Brody, effectively, I would say, in the early phase, is a little bit safer. I mean, the Claude has survivability, though, which will work in his favor. But it is definitely an interesting matchup. You're looking, though, on the bot side, a little bit of an invasion. On the top side, though, Whoopi. <laughs> GG going in for the kill. 4v2. Hoon will be able to take him down first blood for Game of Gladiators. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. The, the little bit of that confidence from Legacy wearing out as uh, Gaming Gladiator is able to very quickly surround. And this is the things I was talking about. Legacy needs to be very quick about uh, seeing these openings, seeing these, or at least seeing these holes, and being able to able to kind of shut them down and get around Gaming Gladiators before they can close in on their teammates. Hey, like we said, they're the team. You give them an inch, they go a mile. <laughs> so you have to be careful. But Kuya Kent, he's not letting it go. He's just going to harass Trying to force out the retribution. That way, Legacy can get this turtle. But best player in position trying to contest with Shark is going to be able to get it. Ryle claiming the turtle for Legacy. Kuya Kid need to get out of there, though, taking heavy damage. Yeah, and, uh, and, and uh, still holding it at about uh, one kill here right now. But, I mean, that's not going to maintain. We still need to kind of have Legacy kind of continue. This is where they're going to start getting shut down. They're going to start slowing down with some of that aggression. And we need to see them actually make a play happen out of here. Yeah, speaking of plays, Kuya Kin on the bot side. Doing some damage on the Shark. 50% HP. Need to watch out. I mean, just look how heavy of a hitter Hilda is so far. Kuya Kin, like the one-man army, rushes into Hoon! One more hit, maybe able to pull it off. Hit by the CC from Shark. Another round going down for the sustainability. You are going to see both sides fight it out. Blake Dweck from Jolie. Riles joined the party. Looks like both sides will disengage and nobody will fall. And this is exactly what I was talking about. What I wanted to see from Legacy is all of them. You saw that Kuya Ken actually got well deep into Gaming Gladiator's territory, but you have Sinski coming in there with that Nether Realm to be able to top him off, and then the rest of Legacy comes in to help and aid in the escape. Yeah, definitely focusing on the synergized plays from both sides, just rotating and trying to group up. But right now, you are seeing Game of Gladiators ahead by one kill. They did lose that turtle, though, working in Legacy's favor. And we said Legacy had a little bit of a struggle, at least in the regular season, when it came to the early game. But this time around, they were able to take the first major objective, but at the loss of one member. Yeah, and uh, and they're able to kind of hold them out at this right now. Only about a 700 gold lead for the side of Gaming Gladiators right now. Kuya Ken still trying to get some vision, but now being a little bit more wary, especially a Shark doing a great job of making sure he's zoning out the rest of Legacy, making sure that they're not coming and interfering in any of these buffs. 
Yeah, and you know, Legacy, I mean, they can definitely be aggressive. They do have Kuyakin on this Hilda, and he's doing that. You are going to see the Blade of Hephthys is picked up by Riles as well, running that Lethal Ignition. Can be that assassin, and at least to be able to burst down somebody like Hoon, who's trying to stay in the back line. But you're already seeing the Turtle Aggro be pulled this time from Gaming Gladiators with the rotation on the bottom side for the trade-off on Azia 4v1. Riles will be able to get the kill. Best player will claim the Turtle in the Blazing Duet to clear the lane. I absolutely like this coming from Legacy. This is what I've been wanting to see from them all season long. A grouped up, they have four players there to jump down on Zia to kind of make that connection, make sure he had no escape. Yeah, speaking of escapes, cool, you can. I'm able to break those shackles, fried chicken. We'll be able to take him down with the electrifying beats. Yeah, and uh, and that's unfortunate that the Gaming Gladiators matching up kill for kill every single time. And this is what we've been seeing from Gaming Gladiators. Even when you win a fight, there's somewhere else on the map that Gaming Gladiators are always able to find that that uh, that way forward. Whether it's a tower, whether it's getting a kill on the other side of the map. And oh. Sinski very quickly wiped off the face of the, the map there. Just showing you how deadly the Roger can be, even outside of the gold lane, inside of the jungle. Zia, though, on the bot side, will open up the map for Gaming Gladiators, now ahead by two kills in one turret. Yeah, and we just saw there from the gold, I mean, not a huge lead for Gaming Gladiators right now. Legacy doing a good job of kind of keeping it together right now at the five minute mark. We've seen it before though, it takes about two more minutes and Gaming Gladiators usually go with a full frontal assault as we have another attack here coming. <laughs> Yeah, Hoon will be able to find one. Takes down Kuyakin, his second death of the game. And getting a little bit more as best player on the invasion. Will be able to proxy these minions and also take the purple buff. Oh, big snipe oh. on the shot. He's in the mid lane. <laughs> Yeah, and just as best player passes in, gets a little bit of damage off with that Lycan Pounce. Hoon on the side with an Astral Meteor to go ahead and bust them down even further. Just kind of keeping on this onslaught as they are pushing their way through mid. Ooh, one small step over there for best player. A huge leap for Gaming Gladiators in terms of the objectives. Able to take the tier one in the mid lane. They took the tier one on the bot side, and they also got the last turtle that was on the board, and now up by three kills. So far, we've only seen Legacy be able to claim that first turtle, but now they're kind of falling behind on the objectives, and they need to be able to pick up the pace because Gaming Gladiators are one of those teams. If you don't give them some pushback, they're going to roll over you. Yeah, they do have a good secure onto this turtle, but oh, you can see Kuyu Ken in Ooh. trouble. Trying to get away. Hoon did fall, though, so he found one, an eye for an eye. Best player is going to be able to take him down. That is going to be the turtle going to the side of Legacy, though, to even it out on at least a couple of objectives, but you are still seeing Gaming Gladiators trailing. Yeah, and I, I talked a little bit about the confidence of this draft, and that's because when you have... Uh, when you have <laughs> Characters like Riles, when you have characters like Hilda, when you start to fall behind, you really lose a lot of the usefulness of some of these picks, especially out of the laning phase. Another engagement. Yeah, both sides fighting it out on the purple buff. We'll be able to claim it. A lot of CC, a lot of damage. Fried Chicken rushing in their best player. We'll be able to find one. Lincoln pounce in onto Jolie. Kuya Kin will fall. One member will be lost on the side of Legacy. Nobody for the side of GG. Yeah, and this is where GG really starts to enforce their... Oh, 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 oh man! Dune just got dusted! A very nice little positioning there for Riles and Hoon. I don't even think he knows what hit him. Yeah, I mean, best players getting some early and quick pickoffs, but same with Riles. Both of them running these aggressive junglers. But again, you are seeing these turrets fall at a fast fashion in Game and Gladiator's favor. I mean, they already cleared the Tier 1 and Tier 2 for the bot side. Yeah, and uh, right now, I mean, we're really starting to hang on to that legitimacy of that Hilda for Kuya Ken. As you start falling behind, he's going to have a lot of trouble trying to find these pickoffs, trying to kind of stand up into the front line as they are engaging a little bit here with Fly Chicken. Yeah, Kuya Ken needs to be careful. Astro Echo, Astro Meteor on his way out. The accuracy from Hoon so far on the Navarre. And I was just looking at the player cams. Is that a, a teddy bear? On shark. Nah, it's just that his shark just needs a little bit of a haircut there. You can see that very stalwart ah. stare from him there as he looks at the camera and just studying <laughs> the game right now. <laughs> yeah, definitely focused, man. Putting it all on the line for the playoffs. Another turret will fall on the top side in Gaming Gladiator's favor. So far, four turrets to none with Legacy. Yeah, and then this is what we were talking about, that engagement into the purple buff of their enemy. 
Ooh, Roz will find Chicken, though, to respond back. Takes down one member of GG on the invasion for that purple buff. Lord spawned in both sides, getting ready to take this fight into the pit. Yeah, and right now, kind of dancing around. Kuya Ken doing a good job of kind of being that front line, but on the side. Ooh, Zia will find one. 25 members on to Jolie. Last insanity from Whoopi. Ryo's will be able to claim a turret off screen. Whoopi, though, no Faraga armor. Needs to get out of there. Hit with a lot of CC, but Shark not going to go in, but best player will. Lincoln pounce. Forcing out the immortality in the tier 2 turret for the mid lane, and Whoopi will recall back to safety. Not a bad engagement here, and the Gaming Glider is not able to pick up a kill, but on the other side, Legacy actually able to get a tower. Now, starting on the Lord. Yeah, starting on the Lord, but not for free. A big knockup, Kuya Kim, 50% HP. Ryle will be able to claim the Lord for Team Legacy. Who takes down Kuya Kim. Shonsky trying to get out, forced to use a flicker. Best player on his tail. Lincoln pounce in. We'll be able to shut him down, but at what cost is they lost the Lord? Oh, man, I have missed. I've talked about this, how much I've missed seeing these Roger jungles. Just how fast he was able to close the distance there and be able to get the kill there. And just there's nowhere safe. You're just never going to be fast enough to be able to escape him. <laughs> It's definitely a treat to see. I mean, I love seeing the Roger kind of sneak back into the meta, right? I was just like this when Martyrs came out, uh, when everybody started playing the Martyrs. I feel like I'm getting that same type of joy uh, in terms of the current meta now. But speaking of meta, Gaming Gladiator is focusing on the rotations, able to take majority of these objectives. Lost that Lord, but it doesn't look like it's really phased them. They're still being aggressive and currently kind of maintaining the momentum for this match. I mean, look at the bot side. The Lord not even affecting them. You're already seeing Zia chunking it down. Yeah, but I mean, they got themselves a little bit of breathing room. They, and especially with a 2K deficit right now, you're you're starting to look at points where a lot of these heroes are starting to fall off. Nolan's not going to be as effective when it comes to a lot of these team plays. Kuya Ken's going to have a little bit of trouble. You've got a lot of heroes that really specialize in this pickoff. Whoa! Speaking of pickoff, synergized play, best player. We'll find Kuya Ken with the I'm offended setup from Shark. Fried Chicken rushes in. Electrifying Beats. We'll find Ryles. Astro Echo. Astro Meteor. Shonsky taking some damage. Full team forced back into the base. Gaming Gladiators not letting go of the gas, though. Jolie with the BMI back to safety and the Blazing Duet. But Gaming Gladiators continuing to claim this real estate. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. Sinski's Nether Realm just a little bit too late to save Riles. I feel like that could have actually turned the tables on that fight a little earlier, maybe given Legacy a little bit of a leg up on there. But unfortunately, uh, Riles goes down, the Nether Realm comes out, and they're still able to find two kills there. Yeah, you see Zia pick up the Blade of Heptasis as well. So he's going in trying to just burst down anybody on that initial engagement. They're being very aggressive, right? Usually we see them close that out around that 12, 13 minute mark. I mean, I would give it to Legacy. They put up a good fight in the beginning, but now the later this game goes in terms of the heroes that they selected, the synergized composition is not going to be the easiest to pull off, especially with Kuya Ken. Needing to find an opening now, but running into a lot of group CC, not only from Shark on this Ruby, but also on Hoon. Speaking of CC, though, Whoopi already getting hit with the majority of it takes all of his Faraga <laughs> armor. Yeah, all of his Faraga armor there. And then uh, GG doing such a great job of kind of clearing out some of those problematic bushes. A little bit of engagement. Yeah, you are going to see him be able to get out of there, though. I, like I said, the joy. It's like that gnat you can't swap away, <laughs> right? I mean, there it was right there. It was just one man army taking majority of those hits and then using the vengeance to be able to get back to safety. Yeah, no, 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 uh, you're doing a, they're doing a good job, of, like I was saying before, of clearing out these bushes, especially those places where a Hilda, where a Riles can actually sneak in there, get some of those plays off there. Now we're going with another engagement. Ooh, Lincoln Pants pounce, pounce into the Nether Realm. Almost said Lincoln Pants. That would have been a, an interesting <laughs> one. Maybe that's what Roger is wearing. But as you are going to go ahead and see the Lord burst down, another objective over there into Game and Gladiators. Favor now 11 to 5 at the 13 minute mark. And Legacy, they need to find a way to turn this back around. Yeah, and you're looking at this already about a 3k gold lead there for best player. He's got all of his items right now, so he is max build and just looking for an opportunity to kind of dive in and be able to get this damage on, maybe get another pick off there. You can see the damage there, 58,000 there for best Ooh. player. Oh, second only to fly, or a uh, secondary there is a fly to chicken with 53,000. It's just showing you how deadly the Roger is, right? You put him in the gold lane, effective, put him in the jungle. Sometimes even more effective, especially for a player like best player who kind of favors these aggressive junglers instead of the tankier ones. Who you can, though, unable to get back to safety, trying to test the waters, trying to give some vision and quickly spot it out. 
And this is that that point we were talking about where the Hilda has become less lethal here and now is going to have issues when it comes to taking on the entire team of GG. Yeah, the Lord will be bursted down though. Whoopi going to use that last sanity. You are going to see the inhibitor in the mid lane fall as long as the bottom side as well. Mortality being proxed. Whoopi trying to stay in there. No more Baraga armor. Needs to get out. Nether Realm to safety. Big play for an escape, but does it buy them enough time? Torn Apart Memories does go out. You are looking at Kuya Kin spawning back in. The full five-man team ready to defend for Legacy up against Gaming Gladiators. One last inhibitor to go through. Best player will claim it. Another last sanity goes out. Kuya Kin frontline the damage. Massive hits on the board for both sides, though. Big stun. Jolie with the BMI back to safety. And it looks like Gaming Gladiators, they took all of the inhibitors and nobody has fallen. <laughs> and not able. I mean, that's unfortunate for Legacy. It's just the, the ferocity in which Gaming Gladiators can come out, the precision. Come in, take out all the high grounds from Legacy. Legacy didn't even lose anybody. They were just powerless to stop it. Yeah, they're definitely putting on a very hard fight, right? But I will say Legacy's been doing better, at least in this match in the early phase, compared to what we've seen them typically do in the regular season. Now, I mean, this is a best of five private, right? So they do have a little bit more leverage even if this match does not work around in their favor. But for this match specifically to turn this back around, it's going to be a challenge, right? You have no inhibitors on your side. When you're looking at the uh, turrets for Gaming Gladiators, they only lost to Tier 1 on the bot side, and they definitely have the major advantage. And you're looking at overextending over there from Legacy. Riles going far past the base. Zia with the punish will shut him down. Last Insanity. Legacy trying to defend. Best player finds one. Kuya Kim will fall. Fried Chicken will find Shonsky. Three members make that four. Zia! Finds Whoopi. Shonsky back in play though. Jolie trying to defend against the five man team of gaming. Gladiators blazing duet is the last resort. Jolie finds right chicken, but the base crystal will be bursted down by gaming gladiators claiming game number one. Oh, and uh, I mean, a harder fought match that Legacy has put up here. But I mean, when you're talking about a team like Gaming Gladiators and their domination here, I mean, that's pretty much all she wrote. That's going to be game one going over to GG here. Yeah, great execution, able to kind of perform majority of the match in their favor. I mean, they kind of definitely had all the objectives on their side and they weren't really uncomfortable at any given time. You are looking at the KDA on the board, 17, 6, and 40 overall for the team. The rating, though, I like to kind of take a peek on that, almost hitting double digits <laughs> with nine. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the little shaky start for Gaming Gladiators, I don't think they expected a lot of the aggression that they got from Legacy, but I mean, we've talked about it before. Once they kind of hit that seven minute mark, they hit those little power spikes, they get their items, they in, they just really start to kind of force their way forward here. If we take a look at some of the comparisons here, I mean, uh, it, it's <laughs> it's sad because like at the end of the game, you don't really get to see some of the shining parts from Legacy here that uh, as they were able to kind of withstand a lot of it in the early game but gg i just it's we've talked about it before once they kind of grab on once they kind of get that little stranglehold they just squeeze tighter and tighter until there is nowhere for you to escape yeah and i mean it's aggressive play especially picking out that hilda it caught me by surprise i was looking at that picture and i was like who i haven't seen the hilda in a while at least on the na scene um but when you pick the Hilda, right, you got to be aggressive. You got to stop him from getting his orange and purple bars. We're forcing out the retribution, and we really just didn't get to see that work out uh, the best in their favor. And then as it gets to that mid to late game, I mean, when you pick the Hilda, you lack the group CC that your team kind of relies on. And that's where you start seeing GG punish, especially having the Ruby, especially having the Hilda. I mean, gold per minute, you're looking at best player, 856 on the Roger, which was in the jungle. Also the carry with the most damage dealt. Kuya Kin, the sandbag on the opposite side of the table for Legacy and Shark. Stacking up them assists with 11 as the forgotten one. Yeah, not just the assist, but it did not steal any kills uh, from from best player, allowing best player to get that 6-0 and a 10, allowing him to kind of chase in and uh, grab up some of those retreating members of Legacy. We see the, the mid head-to-head. -head. And this is Sinski, I want to say, who's kind of who was uh, actually traded in now. He's one of the newer players for Legacy here. And like I said, in the early game, not too big of an issue there. I want to say he was great with his rotations, but man, when you talk about the solidarity, the, the just uh, how great Hoon can be going through the entirety of the game. It, it's a heck of a match up there. Let's take a look here at the damage. 83,000 leading the pack for his teammate here. Best player. And we talked about it before. 75,000 for 
uh, for Fwide Chicken. He just had an amazing game, especially when he's allowed to kind of escape that lane very early, cut in, help out his teammate, and get a lot of that burst damage onto the entirety of the enemy team. Yeah, I mean, 94% over there from best player on the Roger as well for the team fight participation was all across the board getting it done i mean at a point though he was at a little bit of a race with riles on the nolan though i mean they were both kind of bursting down anybody in front of their path with the swiftness but overall just the synergized gameplay from game and gladiators when it comes to the objectives is definitely where they kind of thrived and we need to see legacy kind of pick up that same type of play style right we see them i think they did good they took the first turtle there was a point where they kind of gave up the second turtle they went in for a synergized play on the bot side to go in for the marksman they took him down for the trade-off and i like to see those kind of things right find an answer find something that can work in your favor but right after that moment we just started seeing turrets dropping left and right in gaming gladiators favor and we didn't see anything of a response from the side of legacy and that's kind of the problem. I feel like the composition was kind of an all-in early game type of composition that's coming out of Legacy, which they performed all right in the early game. I mean, this is honestly, when we compare this and we hold this up to how they performed during the season, this is definitely a better Legacy. They were getting to objectives quickly. They were ganking four-man ganks into the lane, which is what I've been wanting to see from them, making sure that you're cutting off the escapes of your enemy. There was nowhere for Zia to go from there. Uh, getting that vision, that aggression with the Hilda from Kuya Ken there in the early game. It's just unfortunate that you're trying this now against the number one seed in North America. And eventually they're going to find those holes. They're going to find those weaknesses. And once you get to the mid game, you have a Nolan, you have a Hilda on your team. They're going to start falling off because you you have a team that is now grouping. You're, it's going to be very rare, very hard to find some of those pickoffs. And that's where they started to fall off uh, through the mid game. You know, and not to mention, they also did a roster change, right? I mean, they swapped their XP laner, Whoopi stepped in. And when you're looking at Gaming Gladiators, there was no changes, right? They kept the textbook since uh, the beginning of the season. Uh, and sometimes synergized uh, changes like that can definitely affect the gameplay. I mean, we even seen the export having a hard time up against Chicken running on that joy. So I wouldn't say it was definitely the only thing, but it's something that they have to definitely make sure they're prepared for when you make that quick switch into the playoffs. Now, this is a best of five. So painting that picture, Everything is on the line. You can actually be knocked out now of the NACT. So you definitely have to bring your A game. And like you stated, I think this is a better legacy than we have seen before. Now, it's unfortunate for them that they sit, sit in that eighth position and going up against the number one team. So they definitely have a little bit of a rougher start compared to other teams inside of uh, the NACT for the playoff side. But that just means they have more to prove and more to showcase, right? I mean, we just want to see who can represent North America and, and hold that crown and I'm just glad that they're able to make it into the playoffs. It's a brand new team on the scene, Private, right? So speaking of brand new things, though, into the draft we go. Game number two. Yeah, we're going to see what kind of switch ups we have here with uh, Legacy going to be taking up the first pick here, which means that you're going to be able to get that two man response from Game and Gladiators. Last bands, we saw like the Masha taken off the board from them, the Matilda uh, taken off from Legacy, but they left open the Nolan. They left open the Joy, uh, which have been big hitters for Game and Gladiators. I'm wondering if we're going to see a little bit of a change here. Are we going to ban those out or are we still going to like the plan was to take one of them and deal with the other one but i mean fly chicken had a heck of a game uh only outdone by best player all right private how are we feeling about the roger man because the roger had a really good showcase from best player we thought it was going to go in the gold lane for a little bit right we thought it was going to go there and then we saw it didn't um last second but is that something that maybe legacy tries to pick up in the first half of the draft or do you think it's worth not banning and possibly letting gaming gladiators get again well, it depends on what they leave out there. But one good, uh, not one good thing, <laughs> of, of the many things that uh, Gaming Gladiators can be very successful in, it's with the draft there. They first picked the Ruby, which meant it was kind of flexible. It could have gone into the XP lane. It could have gone into the roam position. They picked up the Roger. We thought it would only be in the Marksman lane, so we thought that that was already ironed out, which left it open for them to go ahead and pick up that Brody. So they are very successful also when it comes comes to being flexible in the draft, making you guess where certain positions are uh, are being filled by certain picks. But we're going to see this Amasha picked up by Legacy, which has been, it's come on very fast and very powerful in the Mobile Legends scene very recently. Yeah, I'm excited to see it, right? But again, this is Legacy being very aggressive 
And I like the aggression, but also it, it, it makes a lot of room for mistake if you're not careful. So something they're going to have to watch out for, right? I mean, now the Masha being slotted in could be a secret weapon. Time will tell. But on the opposite side of the table, we are going to be looking at best player picking up this Frederick. Now, the first pick last game when they had first pick on the draft was the Ruby. Obviously, Ruby's banned now. They're going to go in for something that uh, is a little bit flexible in terms of utility, right? You have the Frederick who can frontline a lot of that damage. You can stack him up with the CC tank, but you can also stack him up with some support if needed. And he works really good with the pick like the Arlot who profits off of that crowd control with the Demon Gauge to be able to dash in for some additional hits. Yeah, and, and not just that, but he can be that tanky front liner that kind of maintains the front. The seats, it's just, he he has so many different things that he is successful at here. Uh, the And I feel like Kuya Ken on this Masha is going to perform basically the same way that Hilda does. Unfortunately, I want to say Hilda's early game is just a little bit more powerful than Masha's. It takes a little bit to get ramped up, which is going to be a problem if they're going to... Oh, they're going to go ahead and go with the... I feel like this is almost kind of the same plan that they had last game uh, with the, when it comes to these uh, very confident uh, pick-off style characters here. Uh, Nolan, who can put that fracture out. Masha, who can deal an absurd amount of damage. But I want to say Masha comes online a little bit more towards the mid game. Yeah, it's risky, though, because... It's very frontline damage, right? You're rushing in trying to get some easy pickoffs, but again, if you're too aggressive, you get hit with a little bit of crowd control, it could be a possible problem. We are seeing the Roger though this time be picked up on the side of Legacy. We asked the question earlier, was it worth not banning and picking up? Since they did have first pick, and it looks like they believe it's a valuable option for them this time around. I do think this may be inside of the goal lane, though, because this is a Nolan. So this is not going to be a Roger jungle like we've seen in the last match, uh, which is going to be a little different story. But you kind of mentioned some of the counters that we've been seeing to the Roger so far, right? Something like the Harith can definitely still be on the table if they're not careful. Another good option to kind of play a little bit safer and stack up, you know, those core items. Something like the carry could also be a valuable option. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they have already picked up the Brody right now, so we don't really have to worry. I mean, they're they're just going to use that for the Roger, I'm, I'm assuming here. Uh, use, I'm going to be taking off there, so they don't, they're not going to have a lot of backline dive options. I mean, you still got a Lapu out there for Legacy that can kind of come in there. Uh, it really kind of depends. Um, I'm assuming this Masha is going to be a roam. I mean, there's not really too much flexibility with it. You can use it in the XP lane, but it's got a pretty, I want to say, uh, uh, not the greatest early games uh, that Masha can kind of come up by. And I feel like gaming gladiators are really going to try to take advantage of this. I do like that we're starting to really take Hoon away from uh, one of those comfort picks, which is that Lu Yi, uh, which offers up a lot of that mobility and especially that surprise. The ability that they've that we've seen gaming gladiators use the Lu Yi to get behind enemy lines to surprise them, especially with their ganking ability on this. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, too. I mean, you're seeing a lot of prio on the mage bands this time around, right? You've seen the Lu Yi taken out, the Vexana, the Navaria, and then a couple of the supports as well. Minotaur being banned off the table, trying to limit some of the roam capability. Now, again, we mentioned Gaming Gladiators does have the Fredrin, though, and they also have the Arlot. So I feel like they have Group CC already checked off, and they don't necessarily have to go in for a Group Set tank. They can still go in for something to keep the team alive. And I'm looking at the table so far, far Fairness. It's still an option, but since they picked up the Lilia, maybe they don't slot it in. But we are still going to have to see the response over there from Ooh. Legacy. It is going to go ahead and be the Kufra. Definitely uh, mixing things up with the... I would say this is kind of unorthodox because you don't really see these uh, this team kind of play together with these hero picks. Well, yeah, I was, I was about to make a comment about the synergy that you have. Kufra's going to be able to come in. He's going to be able to get the sets. Uh, and then the uh, the Tyrant's Rage to kind of clap them against the wall. <laughs> and you kind of really need that AoE burst damage to kind of be able to take them down. You're going to be able to have that possibly with Riles. He's going to come in and be able to get the Fracture onto a lot of people there. But uh, I want to say, especially when it comes to the Roger pick there, Mosh is a very singular, uh, single target hero there. Uh, Valentina is going to be picked up here. This is, a, and I say, this is a, a decent amount of damage that you can have on there as well. Sinski going to be picking that up for Legacy. Oh, and I'm wondering what the final pick will be for the side of Gaming Gladiators. Do they go in for a set roamer? Do they put the R lot in the wrong position? I mean, that definitely can be an option. They're very flexible, and we kind of talked about Gaming Gladiators when it comes to drafting. They're surgical, right? They're able to break down each phase and keep you on your toes if you're not careful. So 
with what I'm seeing so far, in terms of synergized compositions, you have the Lilia, some great early game damage, especially with the Glooms. You have the Brody, when, in terms of survivability, especially when you have heroes that can get to him in the back line, such as a Masha, such as a Nolan. Shoot, even a Roger, even a, you know, Kufra can Ooh. get the job done. But they are going to go in for the uh, Raffaella, which I actually am a very big fan of. And the reason being is they're trying to limit the options available for that IMU from the Valentina. Yeah, this is going to be a very interesting draft from Legacy. On one hand, from Legacy, we have, I want to say, a few characters that specialize and they shine for different reasons. Like, the synergy isn't exactly there. I want to say, like, I would prefer a little bit more AoE when we're using a set roamer, a, a set potential roamer there. I mean, we're going to have a little bit of the spray from Valentina. We have a little bit of AoE that are coming out from Riles as well on that Nolan. But on the side of gaming, Gladiators, we've got a lot of AoE damage that we can hit with multiple targets. Uh, we've got the, uh, the the Blessing from Shark on that Raffaella. We've got the Glooms from Hoon. Zia can hit multiple targets and then with the Torn Apart Memories uh, Ultimate, he can uh, take down a lot of them too. And then the setting potential from a Flyed. And then of course, of course the front line from Fredrin. Yeah, and ladies and gentlemen, now jumping into the Land of Dawn for game number two of our first series for the playoffs of the NACT Spring Season. Legacy up against Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, we're gonna see how well this composition pays off for Riles and company on Legacy here. But like I said, uh, you've got a lot of single target mixed in with grouping abilities. We're gonna see uh, with on the side of Gaming Gladiators, you just have a lot of AoE potential. Yeah, and speaking of potential, a lot of damage on the bot side already. Zia, need to be careful with Shotsky. We took a, the camera off him for a split second in the mid lane <laughs> and already down to about like 10% HP. Yeah, and look at and Fly Chicken being very sneaky there too, almost uh, stopping him from uh, being able to uh, cut back there. We take a look at some of the emblems here, some lethal ignition stacked up on the side of Legacy there. And then of course, uh, Impure Rages to kind of keep up a gaming gladiator's mana, keep them in the lane longer, keep that mana up as well. Yeah, Jolie gonna run the quantum <laughs> charge as well. Riles though in the mid lane, forcing out the flicker from Shark on that overextension. Needs to get out of there, but the big set in Riles drawing first blood will shut him down you can see it has not phased shark in the, in the slightest still with that with that same smile and that headphones on but uh, as we move on here i mean uh, uh, already uh, legacy getting a good a kill here this is like we talked about it before a very good early game they just need to kind of keep up that synergy uh as we start moving into the later games to kind of keep up uh those winning conditions that they need Right, I mean, game number one, right? We see all gaming gladiators draw first blood, but this time it is going to be Legacy. Legacy was able to claim the first hurdle last game, but then they started falling short on those objectives. So can they find that momentum and hold on to it for the early phase? You are seeing some aggression, though, even from Shark. Still overextending the invasion onto the purple buff. Doesn't go in for the turtle, but wants to delay and deny the farm away from Legacy. And looks like they may be able to do it. Kuya Kin. With the bouncing ball, best player able to get the purple buff. Looks like he did use his retribution, though. Uh, yeah, and that, that's unfortunate for Legacy right now is that this is the problem when you have such a squishy composition. Uh, you're going to be prone to being invaded, and Gaming Gladiator is doing a great job of it, enforcing their will there, especially right before the turtle, not allowing Riles to get his buff. And now he has to, and they, they contested it, and th th that's the problem. That's a decision making you need to make. Are you going to be able to get this purple buff? If the answer is no, you need to go ahead, move on to another part of the map uh, instead of just kind of sitting there, uh, watching them do it, and then now you've lost a turtle and you weren't able to answer with it. Uh, you lost a purple buff and a turtle and you weren't able to reply. Oh, speaking of replying though, straight at the doorstep of Zia with the knockup from Kuya Kid. Riles in the bush though, looking for an answer. Corrosive strike for the knockback into the tier one turret. Zia finding his way to safety. I like that Zia waited to pop out that stun and create that distance until the absolute last moment. As Riles came in for the fracture, pops it off, creates that distance, and again, Legacy leaving empty-handed. Ooh, Kuya Kin will be burning out that flicker, though, to go back to the tier one on the bot side. Fried Chicken taking a lot of damage from Whoopi on the Masha, right? The new addition over here to Legacy with the roster change, but Whoopi, the response back from Chicken, but now a 2v1 oh. as Riles joins the party. Whoopi will be able to get the kill. 
<laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I was a little worried for Riles. He came in there, missed the fracture, and I was like, oh god, <laughs> if, if, uh, it's a two on one and you lose one of your members, that's gonna be uh, a little bit to come back from as we have a little engagement here at the purple buff. Yeah, best player again, trying to deny the farm away from Jolie. He does have gaming gladiators to back him up as well. Who in a position as well as Shark with that holy baptism. Praiser's Wrath is gonna drop down. Looks like best player was able to claim it yet again away from Legacy. Yeah, and uh, I mean, on the plus side, I want to say Legacy did not lose any members for that. Unfortunately, still not able to protect their buffs right now. And this is going to kind of keep on progressing that lead until gaming gladiators can uh, really enforce their will around the seven minute mark. Right now, though, only about 100 gold lead for gaming gladiators. It's like having a hole in your wallet, right? They're putting money in their wallet and it keeps on falling out. You got to find an answer to close that hole. You can't keep letting best player invade your jungle and take your objectives or he's just going to stack on the economy. Speaking of stacking, though, 4v4 on the bot side, best player will claim the turtle off screen. And now the rushing Kuya Kin trying to get back to safety. Zia will be able to shut him down. Riles will fall alongside him. The double kill for the goal laner of Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, and just like that, a double kill for Gaming Gladiators. Oh. Best player from the side. Oh, he's not done. He wanted Joe Lee, but he'll try and go in for Shansky if he can. Both of them forced to go back to safety. Yeah, and you can start seeing, uh, especially up at the top lane, a, a rotation there from Fly Chicken while the side of Whoopi is uh, still trying to answer the minions right now. And uh, it, that's just kind of uh, the problem with Masha in the early game. Before she gets that Blade of Hepestis, uh, Hepstasis, which she does have now, which means she's going to be able to kind of get that one shot scare damage as Fly Chicken goes in. Ooh, triple set from Kuya Kin. Best player will take down Riles in the siege for the tier one turret. Best player will find Kuya Kin for the double kill. Whoopi very low. Best player gets one. Zia gets the other. Whoopi will fall. Shonsky, last man standing, and Hoon will take the tier one turret in the mid lane. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, Riles is just hungry for a purple buff. Any purple buff for his side right now as gaming gladiators have laid claim in his jungle. Yeah, definitely taking advantage of the early phase again for gaming gladiators this time a little bit more smooth than game number one kuya kin taking some heavy hits torn apart memories to seal his fate and zia will pick up his fourth kill of the game uh yeah a, a much different game from the first unfortunate for legacy i feel like this composition doesn't really help them especially now that you have somebody like uh i want to say whoopee on this masha who's not able to really capitalize is going to be confined to that xp lane you can see already left the xp lane and chicken is just having a, a full-blown and just absolutely eating up there yeah we were wondering how the Masha would kind of play into this but not having the easiest time chicken definitely showcasing his mastery able to burst down all of the hp and probably take that turret down on the top side. Tier 2 will fall for the mid. Tier 2 falling for the top as well. And Zia getting a kill shuts down Kuya Kin. Yeah, and uh, right now, uh, Gaming Gladiator is a little earlier than last game. Really pushing through here. Very calculated, taking all these Tier 2 towers in a row and then moving on to the Turtle. And there's not much that Legacy can do here. They're starting to fall behind. 7k at the 7 minute mark. You can see, take a look here at the items. A 2k gold difference when it comes to the Marksmen's and a, a 1k gold difference for the junglers there. Yeah, Kuya Kin having a hard time too, right? Find his fourth death shark. On the bot side though, we'll find Ryo Zia able to connect and burst him down. Ryo's a very far over extension, especially with how many turrets they have lost so far. They're losing a little bit more. Jolie will find best player. Hoon trying to respond back, trying to avenge him. Fried chicken with the alley of that assist. We'll be able to burst down Whoopi. It looks like both sides will have to disengage. Not able to find another opportunity for a kill. But speaking of opportunity, Game and Gladiators stacked with the advantage. Yeah, and oh, ooh, Shark's going to be able to get away there. And, and, and this is the unfortunate thing. Ryle's doing what you're supposed to as an assassin, and you're losing the game. Start split pushing, trying to get some of these lanes out, maybe get some towers on the, on the side as well. But Gaming Gladiator's map presence, their map awareness is just second to none right now. They are able to see that quickly and be able to close the distance even quicker. Yeah, he needs to be careful, though, because he definitely didn't have the easiest start in terms of farm for the damage to be able to burst them down. And Gaming Gladiators, they're looking to try and close this out early, right? We said they're kind of one of those teams. If you give them that advantage, they'll definitely take it and close it out at that 13-minute mark. And this may be one of those games if Legacy is not careful. They need this one to be able to tie out this series in the best of five. But a final slash for Fried Chicken 
Connecting on to Jolie, a little bit of utility has been used for Gaming Gladiators, but they are still going to commit to the fight. Holy Baptism going down. Who will find Whoopi? One member falling for the side of Legacy, and now the Siege for the Inhibitor on the bot side. Gaming Gladiators with the full sin. Now Crackman open the base, and Legacy left to defend. Damage onto the base crystal. You are going to see the final slash going by Chicken Shark finds Kuya Kid. Black Shoes from Shonsky back to safety. Base crystal, 50% HP, the taunt. Not enough to stop Chicken. We'll be able to find another. Shuts down Riles. And now you're looking at the recall spam. Stacking up that damage. <laughs> hitting in that cheat code. Left, right, LB, LB. As they're looking to try and close this game out. Can they do it, though? Minions are in play for the bot side. That 50% now, 45%. The stun, Chicken with another finds Whoopi. Shonsky will fall Hoon to tear him apart. And the base crystal will fall, but they're looking like they're trying to take down Kuya Ken before it. <laughs> but down it goes. Gaming Gladiators claims game number two. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about uh, using some of these games, the time you needed to kind of maybe get your feet underneath you, uh, possibly for Legacy to get a little bit more, more momentum in their side, but Gaming Gladiators came back with a vengeance. When you talk about momentum, the difference between that first game and the second game, they seem to have found their stride and just unloaded onto Legacy. Oh, they're comfortable, right? I mean, they just stepped in their house, kicked their shoes off, and started playing Mobile Legends on their couch with that performance for game number two. Legacy needing to find some answers. Game number two looking a little bit more shakier than game number one. Now, let's kind of break this down, right? A couple things that we saw that maybe could help them for game number three. Definitely kind of trying to rotate and find a way for the early objectives. Maybe not going in for such a damage-oriented early aggressive composition but something that has more survivability toward that mid to late game just in case you're not able to pull off the early game like you would think you could with the roger with the nolan and then also with that masha well, for, for me, I, I feel like it, it's just that the composition shined at different parts. Yamasha, single target, mid-game, uh, Nolan, early game, uh, AoE type of attacks, Roger, single targets, I want to say needs to get fed. Uh, so you're going to talk about mid-game if you got him in the marksman position. And then the setting potential from Kuya Ken, which really shines with like AoE damage there. So it's just a lot of different aspects that didn't come together and synergize a well for Legacy here. We take a look at Zia, gold per minute, 840 to Hoon with the um, absurd amount of damage dealt there. Uh, Whoopi, I mean, the sandbag there <laughs> taking most of that damage. And then Shark uh, upping from 11 last game to 13 assists this game. Yeah, definitely racking up those assists for the team. The head-to-head -head best players up against Riles himself. You are looking at uh, about 73% kill participation leading in best player's favor. But in terms of what's kind of stacking a little bit higher is the KDA, right? And I think it kind of just starts with just best player able to kind of get off these invades and delay Riles on the farm. And when best player can't do it by himself, he has his team to back him up. Yeah, and you can just take a look here at the difference when it comes to the damage that was out there, too. Uh, Hoon, I mean, capping it off, 45,000 there. Zia right behind him with 41,000. But look at those, the team participation, the the trio. Uh, actually, uh, Zia, Shark, and Hoon there. 93% team participation uh, for those 15 kills from GG. Yeah, and it, I mean, it was a very fast game, right? We kind of said that 12 to 13 minute mark. This was under 10 minutes. Four game and gladiators just very comfortable so far just been dominating overall when it comes to the early phase legacy though they gotta pick up the paces and they gotta pick it up fast it's like we said this is not the regular season no more this isn't a point system this is make it or break it you only got so many chances before you get knocked out hopefully they can find their momentum find their groove to be able to claim i would say just even a victory uh so far to be able to at least find one in the nact spring season Man, and it all kind of boiled down. I mean, the the last last game they were able to kind of withstand that early game. This time they did not have that pressure. And, and to the point that uh, from the early minutes, gaming gladiators were all over their purple buff. Nolan not able to get his buffs, not able to make anything happen right before that turtle came out. And then it was all GG from there. So, and it's just a problem when it came. I want to say they had, they kind of approached this like they had the composition of the first game and they found out exactly why they couldn't execute the same way with this list of heroes.
And speaking of Game of Gladiators, let's look at some of the, look at the, some of the uh, deciding moments that kind of led to them turning the game in their favor. I mean, look at it. Five minutes, 30 seconds, two to two in terms of kills. Both sides were even, but a big final slash and initiation. And then the set for the stun from Kui Kin to respond back. But in terms of who was able to punish and make it work in their favor, best player able to get that triple kill off of that. And this is what helped them stampede from two kills to six, just in a matter of seconds. Well, and this is what we were talking about, what really shined with Gaming Gladiators. They had the setting potential, not just the setting potential, but they also had the AOE damage. So once you got that set, once you were able to collect them together, you had the glooms uh, coming out from Hoon, you had the damage from the rest of the players, and then you even had more CC coming out from Shark there uh, to be able to get them all stunned out there. So like once that first set came out, it was pretty much GG for whoever was caught into that. Yeah, I mean, and I will say something about Legacy, right? They're definitely keeping it interesting. I mean, we got to see the Hilda, now we got to see the Masha. I mean, you were just talking about the Masha <laughs> actually uh, sneaking up inside of the draft. But so far, again, I think we can both agree when it comes to overall synergized composition for what these heroes provide as a team, it's just a little lacking to what you typically see drafted from the side of GG. Yeah, uh, I, I want to say that the last draft kind of felt like we were more trying to take away from gaming gladiators rather than having a spot where these picks actually shined. We picked up Masha because she's OP, because we know that what the enemy can do with it. But did we really have a plan for the Masha on the side of Legacy? Uh, we picked up the Roger because we know he shines in the marksman position, but did we really have a plan for him uh, to, to really kind of bully that lane to kind of get our, our enforce our will with it to get us to that mid game yeah it's almost like okay you got the roger which is great for the gold lane you have the nolan which is great for the jungle but both of them kind of are very early and aggressive was masha even the right option in that synergized composition right you could have kind of sacrificed maybe got a little bit of set potential to work better in your favor or something else uh that would kind of help provide some defense against the Stampede over there from Gaming Gladiators. But now jumping in to game number three. Bands are on the way. We are gonna see the Kaja taken out alongside the Navaria for Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, uh, they're going to go ahead and take out that uh, the Vexana again. This time, uh, Legacy does not want the Masha on the table there. This is kind of a, a mirror of the draft we saw, or at least the bands we saw from the first game uh, coming out from both of these teams. I'm. I'm Right now, it's kind of hard to to really kind of predict. I mean, like, what do you change? Do you change out the bands? Is it even the bands? Well, I, I mean, I, I want to say, first of all, the composition. You, we need to get something that synergizes. But we had that in the first game, and we had a glimpse of that synergy needed in the first game uh, to execute it well. But Gaming Gladiators uh, just over overwhelmed them as we moved into that, that, that mid to late game as well. So it's it's really hard because there's, there's a lot of boxes that need to be checked for legacy here right now it's not just the draft it's not just the picks uh it's not just the synergy but like a great combination of them all of which gaming gliders have shown that they shine here in north america yeah i mean even the execution even when you have the most optimal draft definitely plays a part in that right you are gonna see the angela panned out chip will be first on the board this time for gaming gladiators can't wait to see the new hero in effect Definitely going to have a little bit of a uh, problem if they're not careful for the side of Legacy. Now, we're wondering, right? Is he meta? Is it make or break? Is it even worth picking up this early in the draft as you allow other things to be slotted on the other side of the board? Now, Chip, though, I will say, I mean, theoretically, I would assume he's going to be ran in that roam position, right? He can kind of teleport uh, his allies to the enemy for some additional damage and also he can kind of rotate around the map provide that cc necessary for the team on some aggressive plays but he's definitely not something that we're traditionally used to seeing yeah, not traditionally used to seeing, but I want to say if any team is going to be successful with Chip, I would say Gaming Gladiators would be too as well because they have that experience with Lu Yi and Hoon. And I want to say in that aspect, uh, uh, Chip operates a little faster than Lu Yi because Lu Yi, it takes a little bit of time for her ultimate to actually go off. For Chip, it's instantaneous. You're going to be able to, you're going to have a portal down. You're going to be able to get to your lane quicker. You're going to be able to kind of get from another lane to get to those ganks quicker and then get back to your lane uh before the minions are pushing at your tower so if there's a lot of synergy here there's a lot of synergization possibilities here for gaming gladiators yeah and you're already seeing the hair picked up too i'm assuming it's a response back to the roger for a possible counter 
for the side of gaming gladiators joy though will be picked up from legacy i'm not really seeing anything to stop joy in his tracks but he is gonna have to keep up with the benedetta now both of them highly mobile esmeralda okay we're switching things up i like it I feel like we're countering for countering for countering. Uh, right now, we picked up the Joy. We've got the Harith out there, which is a good counter for both Roger and for the Joy to kind of get in there. But then on the other side, we're going to pick up an Esmeralda, who's going to be able to soak up a lot of those shields from Harith that he has when he uh, comes down with that uh, uh, with his ultimate as well. But then now we're going to have kind of that raw damage uh, and that mobility that you get with a Benedetta there. I haven't seen, I want to say I've seen Benedetta more on yellow than I have on fly chicken so it's actually I'm actually kind of glad because I want to see how much uh that mechanical ability that fly chicken has here it's going to be interesting though because again I'm looking at legacy's draft and we talked about it right just some little odds and in heroes that I, I don't feel like have the strongest synergy as a unit now this is going to be interesting when you're looking at what they have right I guess this should be a roger in the gold lane a joy possibly going to be slotted in the mid or the jungle because esmeralda i'm assuming it's going to go to the xp lane but we'll have to see as this draft kind of prevails forward now in terms of set potential from both sides i mean there's not really much outside of uh i would say chip i mean i guess you have harris with the zaman force for that utility for that slow benedetta with the electo final blow for a little bit more slow but chip is really going to be the the bank on rushing in and initiating trying to get the the cc for the stoppage when i'm looking at legacy though you are going to have uh possibly esmeralda dropping down with the falling star moon for a possible setup outside of the esmeralda it's really just some some initiations for damage with the joy and, and the uh the roger alongside it yeah, that, that's a really interesting thing here, too, especially if you're talking about a Benedetta versus an Esmeralda right now. Uh, back in the day, <laughs> Esmeralda was able to kind of, like, cut the lane. Uh, it was the Esmeralda versus Uranus snooze fest, I want to call it, where they just both they both <laughs> just absolutely mirrored each other, slapping each other in lane. Then they would go to cut each other's lane here. But Esmeralda kind of lacks, especially the mobility that Fly Chicken's going to have with this Benedetta here. We see in the draft the Nolan actually getting taken off. Off there for legacy and a pickup of cc which means that this esmeralda is going in uh, go ahead and say it you know you want to say I, it <laughs> I don't where's know. it going uh, the jungle is there gonna be a jungle i don't know <laughs> that's I what honestly i'm assuming i think it's going to the jungle but i, I was like let him say it because then if he says it and he's wrong <laughs> hey i didn't know i'm just kidding but I, honestly i'm right there with the private i'm scratching my head i'm trying to figure it out legacy looks like they jumped in the matrix and they're looking for the source code right now hopefully it's the right programming, but you are going to see gaming gladiators with what I would say I'm a little bit more comfortable draft wise, right? I mean, when they threw the CC in there with the Esmeralda, with the Joy, it's like, okay, I mean, the Joy is already a little bit of an annoyance. You can't stop her in her tracks, but oh my gosh, this is this is just getting insane. I think uh, we might be I was casting just, the craziest I was just game. Sitting here. I was just sitting here thinking, you've got so much uh, uh, dashing and mobility from gaming gladiators. What if they picked up the Fanny too as well here? You're looking at a team that's going to be hard to <laughs> catch for Legacy, and you don't have a lot to stop this dashing ability from them as well. And I want to say Hoon here. I mean, I honestly, just being relaxed right now. He's <laughs> shades of uh, Gosu Zero here. You're going to have a Harley in that mid lane. Oh, but we do have a, a one suppression on the side of Legacy here. <laughs> he's got he's to pick his poison, though, right? You can grab the Fanny or you can grab the Harley. You got to pick somebody, right? But honestly, man, I don't know what's going to be tougher trying to get the suppression off on one of these heroes trying to stop any of these heroes with their mobility or is it going to be the cameraman trying to keep up with all the action because of how <laughs> mobile both of these compositions are yeah honestly the 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 answer here with the with the franco i'm kind of on the fence about because i almost feel like an akai would have been a little bit better just because it's not going to be that singular answer right now you have a choice like you said can i get the fanny do i get the benedetta or do i grab somebody else on their team and hope that we can bring it down oh i do not uh, envy their position right now speaking of envying things off to the land of dawn we go game number three for the first series of the playoffs for the nact spring season game and gladiators up two to zero up against legacy and currently sitting at match point 
Uh, yeah, you do see a, a little bit of aggression there from Kuya Ken coming into the jungle, but he grabs Fanny instead of the buff, and you kind of want the buff so that it resets. Oh, looking for it. I think we did get a retribution out of best player, though. Well, but he got a kill. <laughs> so I, I would say that's a fair trade, and definitely going to have to be something to watch out for. I feel like best player is probably going to go into that Blade of Heptasis super early. Just so he can get some additional pickoffs to bridge that gap that Gaming Gladiators is looking to lean in on. And you see Fly Chicken here on the back trying to be a nuisance. Already starting to cut lanes, and you can see both of them on the side. Esmeralda at the bottom as a well there. Whoopi trying to do an answer back with some <laughs> cut lanes of his own. Hey, I'm trying to bet whose fingers are moving faster, the cameraman or best player on the fanny. But you are going to go ahead and see Zia on the top side in the 1v1. But speaking of matchups, though, aggression inside of the jungle. Four members of Legacy trying to chase down one member. Jolie is going to find Zia, though. Shark trying to rotate around, trying to get out of there <laughs> with the chip. It is one for this one on the, the board, though. the slowest car chase ever. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know if he'll be able to get out, though. Best player wants it. He's going to be able to take him down, finding his second kill of the game. And that's the value you're going to get out of best player right now in with this Fanny. I mean, just I mean, as slow as he was up to uh, the little car chase up there on the legacy side <laughs> of the jungle. Best player able to close the distance so quickly. And that's what you're going to have is best player just zooming all over the map. No matter who gets low on the side of legacy, they're going to need to be wary. And Kuya Ken is going to need to be ready. I think we got to keep an eye on where the kills are going, though. Even though it's two to one, best player picking up two kills. If he keeps stacking them, he'll be able to burst down majority of the members. Riles, though, will find one to even out the scoreboard. Takes down Shark. Deadly Magic on the Shonsky. Forced to get away, taking some heavy hits. And best player looking to clean up, but not able to get to him. Whoopi, very low himself. Shonsky will fall. Best player off to a good start. Finds his third kill. Hoon will find Whoopi as well. Four to two on the scoreboard. And this is kind of the issue right now and why Franco is not a, a regular meta pickup. Even though Riles tried to go in there, tried to get himself oh. a steal there, gets picked off by best player. At least Kuyu can grab the purple buff. No, that's not really worth the trade. <laughs> but uh, any, anything best player can get, he's going for. I mean, he's already 4-0-1. Take a look, though, off screen. We got C Zia versus Jolie. Wrestling with the Lincoln Pounce, just showcasing how strong the Roger is. And technically, I mean... The hair is supposed to be the counter. Uh, yeah, I mean, a uh, good job up there uh, by Legacy up there and uh, by Jolie. But what I was going to say before, though, is that the problem with the Franco pick here is what you're seeing. He's not a tank. He's a support character. And they're really taking... Oh, this is that teleport we were talking about. Yeah, there's no way he's getting out of that. Deadly magic, five-man team, high mobility for a turret type as well. Some great execution, but Hoon unable to escape. Kuya Kin will be able to take that kill, but that's the roamer for Legacy. Zama Force dropping down. Jolie able to get out of there, but hit with a lot of damage. Bloody Hunt does get out. Zia will be stopped in his tracks, and Jolie, with the assistance, will be able to pick up that kill. Yeah, six to four. I mean, not absolutely crazy <laughs> right now. I do like the synergy of those teleports, though. Uh, it's It's got a lot of options there, especially you're just kind of looking, waiting for your team. You're like, all right, you guys all ready? Whoop, we found somebody. Boom, engage, and you've got four members at the snap of a finger loading, unloading on you. And there's not really much that you're going to be able to do there. We'll take a look at some of these items here. Uh, yeah, not too much right now. I mean, like I said, uh, just about a 1K gold lead for Gaming Gladiators. But you are going to see best player trying to get a hit kill. Flame shot for the still Hoon. A little bit greedy there. Doesn't want to give the best player. Going in for another on the double kill. Shonsky, deadly magic. Not going to be able to deal the final hits, but a very close call. Blade of the, or Blade of Heptasis, though, was picked up by best player, and he is hitting like a truck. Yeah, I mean, already he's, he's sitting at 5-0 and 2 right now. And teleport again. Ooh, going to make the most out of shit. Jolie. Taken down by Fried Chicken. No connection over there with the hook as well. Riles rushing in, trying to deal some damage. We'll be able to catch Shark with the electrifying beat. We'll be able to find the trade, but may fall. Chicken on the chase, able to shut him down and goes back to safety. Yeah, and right now they really, I mean, this is what we were seeing when we saw those uh, Lu, uh, Lu Yi uh, gameplay there, is that they're getting behind enemy lines. They're finding, uh, and they're cutting them off, which is the biggest thing. Yeah, speaking of cutting things off, 2v1, whoopee! Turned into a, a, a easy death over there from the side of Gaming Gladiators. Two members falling, though. It's now 11 of 5 in five minutes. GG.
up on the advantage. And this is one of the reasons I was really kind of talking about. I would probably have preferred the Akai pick there. Kuya Ken is just, uh, he's just a bag of gold out there for gaming gladiators oh. right now. <laughs> Doesn't have his, 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 uh, uh, his de defensive items right now. Best player too far ahead to really even be stopped. Yeah, and speaking of stopping things, Hoon will find another. Shuts down Jolie. Everybody just out for the fight, out for a good time. You can definitely tell Gaming Gladiators is just chasing the kills right now, but still able to claim the objectives alongside it. Tier 1 will fall for the top side. Yeah, 20k to 15 right now. 5k gold lead for Gaming Gladiators at the 6 minute mark. Whoopi, I mean, doing an alright job down here, but we're starting to see the towers fall in favor of Gaming Gladiators as they get there first and are looking to kind of continue this push. Yeah, I mean, hey, we got to see Chip in action. Not the way that I would have predicted, at least drafting-wise. Bloody Hunt, though, gonna go ahead and catch him in his tracks. Kuya Kin. We'll be able to draw that advantage with that kill. Off to a good start over there for oh. uh, Legacy to be able to turn it around. But Zombie Force dropping down Jolie. We'll fall. Zia shuts him down. Zia gets a double. Shuts down Kuya Kin as well. Tier 1 turret in the mid lane will fall as well. Zia off to a great start to be able to try and steal the MVP away from best player. Yeah, I mean, this kind of is just at that question. You saw a great set and a pickup there for Kuya Kin on that Franco into the top. Oh, just leads more gaming gladiators a kills. Yeah, speaking of kills, I'm force drop down. Zia will find Whoopi. Maybe able to get another, but Chicken able to deal the final blow. Takes down Whoopi. Shansky falling alongside him. Two members down for Legacy. The kills are climbing as GG is rising up that ladder. Yeah, and nothing has been able to stop best player right now. Kuya Ken is uh, a super squishy at the moment. I mean, he's able to find a few. Oh, nice little hook. Yeah, we'll be able to stop him in his tracks. That's the suppression that we're looking for. Jolie <laughs> gets best player. Blade of Despair picked up by Fried Chicken to deal some massive damage. Man, Private, I don't know. I don't think they'll be able to do it at the 9 minute 30 second mark like the last game. But this is another fast one for the side of GG. Azia will find another shuts down Whoopi. But yeah, we can take a look here. I mean, uh, we've already got the Feather Heaven there picked up for the Harith there. Zia is going to be doing an immense amount of damage. We were talking about that BOD now picked up for the Benedetta. I mean, you've already got a huge amount of damage uh, coming from her. But now with that BOD, you're really going to kind of be crushing it. And we got the Malefic Roar and Blade of Hepsises picked up by best a player right now. Sitting 2k gold ahead of Riles. Yeah, Zama Force dropping down again. Zia being a problem out there for Legacy, trying to deny them any farm, and now invading into the tier two turret, forcing four members of Legacy back into the base. Complete bully so far, passing that 30k threshold in terms of gold. Yeah, trying to make another quick one out of this. I want to say the the synergy right now. Oh, look at the damage right now uh, being capped off there by Azia uh, with twenty eight a thousand. But like I was about to say, like Shark with these teleportation portals out there right now is just doing such a great job. I mean, it just it doesn't even matter. It pops up right on top of Tower, and the rest of the team just kind of folds into Legacy, and there's not anything that they can do. Yeah, it's, it's a tough situation, but just how mobile Gaming Gladiators is and already how they're good at making the most out of the micro and the macro across the map. I mean, look at them getting comfortable. There goes the uh, teleport we were talking about. Going to go ahead and possibly hit that shortcut. You are going to look at uh, Kuya Ken Shansky trying to give some vision, though, trying to rotate around. But in terms of who has more items on their side, 7,000 gold lead for GG so far. There's the teleport in. GG <laughs> may go in for the siege. <laughs> it's just so uh, a uh, best player kind of come in there. He's like, surprise. Oh, there's nobody here. So now he's going to go back. It looks like they're going to go ahead and focus their efforts onto the Lord right now. Man, credits to the cameraman able to keep up with this high mobility so far. Best player will be able to take down the Lord for the side of Game of Gladiators. But on the top side, Electrifying Beats may be able to find one. Falling Star Moon drops down. Whoopi will be able to shut down Hoon. But the Lord in GG's favor. Yeah, Lord coming down at bottom lane as well, which means you're going to have an immense amount of pressure. Whoopi, not long for this world. His best player gets a hold of him and cables him into dizziness. We are going to have a lot of pressure coming up at the top lane. I'm expecting to see Gaming Gladiators kind of split, prioritize this so that you have the Lord at bottom. And now you're going to have to answer up at the top as well. You see Zia kind of hunkering down in this bush. Right, we have passed the 10 minute mark. You are looking at Gaming Gladiators being very aggressive so far and it's worked 
in their favor. Highest kill so far in the game is going to be best player, though. Only falling, finding one death so far on this Fanny. But I feel like it's just a race for kills on who can kind of get the most in today's game for GG. But speaking of kills, both sides finding it out. A lot of aggression. Kuya Kim will find Fried Chicken. Best player. Preston takes down Riles. Bloody Hunter drop down for the stun. Jolie with the alley-oop will take down Zia. Two members falling for Gaming Gladiators. One for the side of Legacy. And GG will back off. Yeah, they actually had to back off there. It looked like Shark kind of threw down a portal. The rest of the team, I want to say blindly, kind of just leapt into the portal, not really having a real good garner uh -oh. for what was going on. Oh, best player. He did connect with the hook, but no bloody hunt for the follow through. And it looks like best player was able to get out. Yeah, I was about to say, like, the, that portal, I feel, I felt like GG kind of jumped into there, didn't realize what was going on, uh, and then you had the rest of the team got uh, eaten up. Not like this time, though. Whoopi just uh, gets deleted. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Control-Alt-Delete. Just putting that on a macro right there with how fast everyone <laughs> shut him down. Whoopi at the brunt end of that 1-6-0. and zero. Having a hard time getting online, but I feel like the later this goes, maybe Legacy can turn it around. Maybe they try and play for the late game. Game of Gladiators with their aggressive stance, though. Will they even give them that opportunity, right? They're starting to try and sink these uh, lanes, possibly go in for some aggressive plays. Just because they have the dive capability, they're able to engage and disengage because of the mobility. Well, and, and the problem here now comes to the point that you can't even split push because if even even if it's just Shark that finds you, it's all over because you can be able to throw down a portal and then you have the entirety of Gaming Gladiators coming for you. Oh, speaking of gaming gladiators, chicken, electo final blow. Riles getting out of there with the hair on his chin. One HP escape. Yeah, 21 to 10 right now. 7K gold lead for the side of gaming gladiators. Looking to close this out right now. 19 seconds left on this Lord. I'm not even sure what you can do here. You've got a danger all over the map. If it's not even, even if it's not just Shark who's able to teleport the entire team to your position, you're talking about how quickly best player can close the distance. Yeah, and speaking of best player, gaming gladiators on the bot side, rushing in, trying to get some blood. Whoopi will fall, Zia. With the Zombie Force, we'll be able to shut him down. But the hook and the Bloody Hunt into the turret. Kuya Kin on the trade-off. We'll take down Fried Chicken. Zia will fall. That is going to be Jolie picking up that kill. But best play to respond back with the swiftness will shut him down. Yeah, and uh, that, that's basically what we were talking about. The shark able to uh, throw down a portal. This time, I want to say Gaming Gladiators a little bit more choosy and patient before they entered the tur the portal, then got out there and were able to find themselves about the two or three kills there onto Legacy. Yeah, best player rushing in with the steel cables. Almost able to find one. Shonsky will shut down best player. Not able to escape the last minute damage on the aggressive play. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, doing on a back foot right now, Legacy actually able to answer with some kills of their own. But I mean, they're still being pushed into their turret right now. They're into their turrets. They're forced to turtle right now. And it's kind of up to th this game's momentum is really on the side of gaming gladiators. It's on them to make a mistake. Legacy looking for an opportunity, though. You see this Lord just kind of laying in wait and gaming gladiators just kind of kind of throwing out the bait. Yeah, Shark will teleport, bring Zia and Hoon alongside them. Riles gonna use the Electrifying Beast. There goes the hook and the ability hunt for the suppression. Hoon will be caught out of position. Chicken going into battle, Electrifying Blow will not connect, but he will get a little bit of a slash off for some damage. Falling Star Moon from Whoopi, forcing out the Cosmic Fusion, forcing out the Zombie Force from Zia. Rushing in, Shonsky on the retreat now, trying to get away. The stun on to Whoopi as well. That is gonna be one member falling for the side of GG. Nobody falling for Legacy, but the Lord Pit still in control for the Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, I was about to say, it did look, kind of appear like uh, Gaming Gladiators were playing with their food for a little bit, but now starting to focus up on the lore, they're just going to look to end this right now. Best player going in, uh, actually getting a decent amount of damage, but I want to say not having that same effect. This is what we've seen before from Fannies. Yeah, you're going to see the shortcut activated, but Riles will be able to find one. Shuts down, a fried chicken shark will fall as well. But the response back from GG, best player will take down Riles. Jolie forced to jump into wolf form. Kuya Kin taking some serious hits. Hoon on the chase. Cameraman trying to keep up with all the action. A lot going on so far. 24 to 16 at the 15 minute mark.
Yeah, you've got just uh, players from Gaming Gladiators appearing at random <laughs> points of the map with these portals, with uh, the cables coming out from Best Player right now, the dashing coming from Zia, how quickly Benedetta can kind of traverse the map, especially when it comes with that uh, Electo Final Blow as well. And, and all the while, Legacy trying to get a grip, trying to get some farm <laughs> onto this. Yeah, you already seen another teleport. Just the presence of what ship provides it's very hard to deal with and legacy forced to the drawing board looking for answers but they're not able to find them you are looking at gg working on this lord this may be their final push to be able to close out this game if legacy is not careful legacy needs this game though right if they lose here they'll be knocked down to the lower bracket yeah, well, I mean, we're at the 16-minute mark, about a 4K gold lead. This isn't the worst we've seen gaming gladiators uh, in the last two games uh, deal with Legacy right now. So still, I want to say a little bit of an opportunity, but I don't really see a way forward here unless they can kind of take advantage of gaming gladiators with these portals, maybe turn the tides a little quicker uh, when they all try to portal in. Lord coming up at the top means we're going to have some pressure at the bottom as well. Just too high grounds left for legacy yeah luminous lord slowly making his way into the base only those two high grounds to hold on to and you are looking at legacy ready to make a final stand gg trying to close out the series with a sweep can they do it though you are going to see shansky take down whom with the assistance of the bloody hunt and the iron hook from kuya kid this player with still cables though with the cutthroat will find shansky one member falling for both sides final slash going down with the electo final blow Kuyo Kin, Immortality has been crocked. Jolie, forced into the wolf form. Wolfie Jin back in the base. Whoopi, sustaining the damage. The Iron Hook will grab Chicken. Jolie, with the Lincoln Pounce, will be able to shut him down. Two members for Gaming Gladiators will fall. And Legacy, able to take down the Lord, but they're not done. Best player will find Jolie. Gaming Gladiators still going in for the Siege. You are going to see the inhibitor in the mid fall. Zia will be able to claim that. Kuya Kin. Taking a lot of hits back to the base, he goes. And they're still going in. Private, I think they're trying to close out this game. <laughs> and they do it, though. Minions are slowly falling. Zia doing a little bit of that chip damage. Falling Star Moon from Whoopi to clear out that minion. Here comes the next round, though. Do they pull their punches? No, they're not done. They're trying to just be find that opening. But I don't know if they can. Riles is going to shut down Shark, though. Maybe a slight mistake on the over-aggressive play. Uh, I, I want. I'm not even sure if if it's a mis we can even call it a mistake yet. I mean, they're chasing them down right now. They're looking to try to get these kills. Are they going to be able to close the distance? They do get onto Ooh. Zia. Almost though. The Iron Hook was looking promising. Whoopee though. Very low chicken. Trying to change the narrative. Best player alongside him. Two v four. Jolie will find best player chicken now. Trying to retreat. Hoon with the deadly magic from the side play of the bush. Grabbed by the Iron Hook and Shotsky. We'll find him. Who will find Shansky to return the, that uh, favor, though? A lot of bodies dropping in the land of Dawn today. Both sides, over 20 kills. Hoon <laughs> is not having a favorable game here. It's like Legacy have chosen one player on the side of gaming gladiators. They're like, they might beat us. They might trounce on us and get into our core. But gosh darn it, we're going to make sure Hoon has a heck of a game here. <laughs> Uh, as they've been able to find the, the, the hooks onto him. And Shark actually in a little bit of trouble here. Yeah, Winter Truncheon trying to save him. Maybe the high IQ play he needed. Zia will deal the final hit. to Shark able to get out of there alive? Chicken trying to bait out this Lord with the aggro. Yeah, and Kuya Ken lying in wait. Trying to make find himself an opportunity. Rest of the team coming in from top. Yeah, able to connect though. He's going to grab best player. Whoopee. We'll shut him down. That means that the Lord may be in the taking for Legacy as they do have the Retribution, but they need to be careful. They're going to disengage, though. A lot of utility was baited out there, and Gaming Gladiators will be able to claim this Lord with no Retribution. Uh, with no Retribution, and you had the opportunity. They didn't have Riles, though, so both teams didn't have their oh. Retribution here. Whoopi trying, uh, trying to escape back to his base. Ooh, Chicken will find Whoopi not able to get out of there alive. Immortality being picked up by Jolie last second. Trying to sustain himself for the siege from Gaming Gladiators. Looking to close out this series. The Petrify dropping down. The Zaman Force alongside it. Chicken against the world right now. Zia will find Riles. Jolie proc that immortality. Still alive, still in the fight. Zia will find Shansky for the double kill. Jolie back to safety. Two versus four. Who you can 
hit with the stun, and down goes the base crystal. Game and Gladiators takes victory over Legacy with a clean sweep. Clean sweep and a best of five. Three games in a row for Gaming Gladiators. Unfortunate for Legacy not able to find the answer against North America's number one seed. You can see right there, I mean, uh, a great game. I want to say a funner game for Gaming Gladiators there. I felt like they were a little bit more lax here. Uh, not as, uh, especially with kind of trying out this chip and the, the functionality of some of those uh, portals. Woo! Like I said, I don't know who the MVP is going to go to, man. We were going to have to see. There was a lot of bodies dropping for that last match. But overall, Game and Gladiators, like you said, showcasing why they're in that number one position. KDA for the entire team, 31, 23, and 64. Team rating overall slightly ahead of Legacy by two. Had it, didn't hit double digits, though, which is a little bit surprising, sitting at that 8.82. Yeah, and you can take a look here at uh, some of the um, the damage and the gold coming out. I mean, like, it wasn't a, a, a completely wallop from Gaming Gladiators. Uh, the macro definitely in their favor here. 10 kills for Zia there, 12 for best player. <laughs> Who took six deaths there? He was just getting kind of walloped there. And then 21 assists for Shark on the chip. Yeah, I mean, man, I never thought... I would see all 10 of these heroes in the same game together. But hey, anything's possible for the North American scene. And there it is. Definitely a treat for the first series of the playoffs. Gaming Gladiators, though, overall able to claim victorious. Rich Guy going to Zia. The carry as well. And then the sandbag will be Whoopi. The new addition, the last minute flex pick. And the forgotten one will be Shark this time with 21 assists. Yeah, I mean, he he went up from, uh, what was it, 11 assists to 13 assists, now 21 assists. And here, I mean, uh, not even really a contest when it came between the junglers of this game. 12 kills for the side of best player and really kind of holding Riles at a heed right there. Five, six, and seven for him. Uh, and they just kind of closed in on them. They are able to find some kills. Riles, I mean, I want to say, like, he's done a great job when it comes uh, to his position, able to find some of those kills, but it's... It's just not on him solely. It's on the rest of the team to kind of come together. And unfortunately, it's not a team of five Riles. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> here, when it comes to uh, against a team like Gaming Gladiators, uh, they really enforce their will and uh, able to press forward uh, with a clean sweep over Legacy. Yeah, and I think it just kind of pays homage to best player running his comfort pick, right? He picked up that Fanny. He had a great start in the early phase. I mean, he was racking up those kills with ease. He picked up that Blade of Heptasis, and he bridged the early way for the team. And then that's where the high mobility took over. That's where Chip started dealing massive damage, able to get the team from point A to, a to B to C to D at certain points of the game to where we were having a hard time even keeping up with all of the action. And you can see here 159, just basically 160,000 from Zia uh, right there. And then uh, Team 5 participation kind of spread out a little there for Gaming Gladiators as they were all kind of coming together with some of those portals, but uh, otherwise kind of split off around the map there. But man, 31 to 23 here and uh, Gaming Gladiators just basically making a statement here in North America uh, at, the, at the cost of a legacy here. This is why they are number one here, even with... Uh, uh, some of the the better engagements in that first series uh unfortunately i mean we're talking about a, a team like gaming gladiators and there's a reason they're at the top of na right now yeah i definitely agree with both of you with gaming gladiators it's the result is nothing of the unexpected but starting from the first game we can see legacy it definitely made some pretty good fights against gg actually clinching some turtles on their way but was not able to connect in the end what i want to know guys is we saw that roger going in for the jungle lane how do you feel about roger coming back in jungle or are we going to see more of that in the upcoming matches well i'll tell you what i'm a fan of it i mean it's kind of like i said it reminds me of the uh martis when martis started stepping into the scene able to get those early kills able to bridge that gap but Roger just shines so well because he can dominate in the gold lane, but he can dominate in the jungle as well. And I mean, if case goes to show, we saw that today. And I think it's going to kind of shift the meta around with what teams are kind of prioritizing. I, I kind of asked Private the same question as well. And I mean, we've seen just how capable the Roger can be. 
if the if this Roger in the jungle continues, it does open up for like a lot of flexibility when it comes to the draft and having that Roger out there. But we have to ask too, is, is it because the Roger is meta and he's gonna be doing well in the jungle? Or is it because Gaming Gladiators were facing a team like Legacy where they felt they could be a little bit more lax in some of their picks? Well, I mean, second, third game, we did see some Harley picks coming back in. So <laughs> that's a question we'll, we'll continue find, finding out about later. But the chip pick, though, we wanted to see chip back into the scene. And we did see it in the last game. How do you guys feel about chip? He's hard to keep up with, I'll say that. Even just the cast, you're kind of like looking at one side of the map and then boom, here he goes on the top side, bringing two players with him as well. I think he, he can provide a lot of uh, pressure to teams that are not able to kind of focus on aggressive teams. So I think you can easily overwhelm teams that just don't know how to kind of think on the fly to adjust for defense. And I think that's where kind of gaming gladiators shine toward that mid to late game. I saw something today that I didn't see last week with the chip pick, and, and that was a game where chip made a difference. And of course, it's, I mean, we're talking about Shark here, so if he's gonna be able to make a difference, it's gonna be uh, him. Uh, but when you saw these engagements, you saw uh, he'd be able to kinda, as long as chip was the one that closed the distance on somebody, he's able to lay down a portal, even underneath a tower. The entire team comes out, uh, goes ahead and bashes uh, whoever they're ganking, the marksman, the XP laner, and then they're back into the portal, back to their lane very quickly. It does have a, a lot of, I want to say, opportunities in five-man play. I, I know in, in ranked games, uh, when people playing it, there have been some issues with shit because you don't have that same synergy with uh, random people that you're playing with. But like, I mean, here in five-man play where everybody's communicating and everybody can be like, all right, everybody in the portal now, they go in, they get back to their lanes very quickly, quickly i mean there is a lot of opportunity for a character like that and we'll start to see teams picking that chip as they gain more confidence and practice playing it in the five-man roster and the mvp of the series will go to best player from gg i know you guys had a hard time picking your mvps <laughs> but let's take a look at best player's gameplays let's take it away well, it's a surprise a little bit. It was definitely hard to figure out who it was going to be. Honestly, I probably would have gave it to the cameraman after the last <laughs> game. But best player definitely had some great execution. Like we said, we've seen him on the Roger inside of the jungle. Traditionally, we've been seeing the Roger inside of the gold lane. So he's able to kind of mix it up and keep even us casters, you know, on a swivel. And then also pulling out that Fanny for that final series and just having such a great game, right? There goes the Fanny right there all over the place and he's like a one-man army he can get the job done he picks up four or five kills before gg even needs to initiate and help him around the map and just that utility that he provides for the early phase is what helps them dominate overall yeah, and this is why you see a lot of those bans on some of those mechanically heavy heroes when teams are facing a team like Gaming Gladiators because best player has the ability, especially for heroes like Joy, the Nolan, Fanny, he's able to use them all very precisely. And we've seen there, even without the chip, he's able to get around the map, even into enemy territory uh, at the early game, find the kills, find his way back out. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's just a, a sight to behold. <laughs> Yeah, and when the first time that I saw a best player playing that Fanny, I was pretty shook when he had the recall game going on. He actually does recall a lot throughout the game. And if you ha guys haven't checked out his recall little one trick guide, go check it, check it out on our YouTube channel. And today we have an interview with Hoon from Gaming Gladiators. Let's see what she got to say about this match. Hello, Hoon. How are you doing? Hello. Good, thanks. Hello. Thanks. Flame shot Harley. What, what was going on there? Six deaths. Oh. Uh, I got trolled. I got baited. You Every got time baited there into was a chick Harley? ultimate. No, I mm -hmm. say, come, come, come. I go and I got hooked. What can I do? So you're the troller with Loi, and then now the troll's on you. <laughs> Pretty much. Facing my own medicine. Pay that time. <laughs> so yeah. what do you think about the Chip versus Loi uh, matchup? Is there an opportunity for both Chip and Loi on the same team for the um, competitive scene? Oh yeah, I was actually going to go Loi there, but I thought Harley would have been uh, more fun. That's why I picked Harley, but definitely mm -hmm. Loi can work with Chip. And you can troll each other throughout the game. Yeah, it would be, be an amazing macro with those two. Yeah, we'll definitely like to see that in the upcoming matches. So if 
you guys beat um, Legacy and bring them down to lower bracket, what would you give them as one advice as they walk into that lower bracket? Oh, Legacy. Um, I don't know, maybe Raz can pull out the fat, uh, not Fanny, Harley. He's actually pretty good at Harley. What about the Hayabusa? Uh, maybe if this was like three years ago, I think it's kind of washed on high yeah. I He's mean... good Harley though. <laughs> well, give it to you, Rouse. Uh, Hoon said it. Put, put, pull out the um, Harley, so maybe we'll see that in the, in their um, upcoming match. So, who do you guys think is your toughest opponent going into Vegas for GG? Um, I mean, definitely. I think the top teams that we worry about is uh, Air 77, BTK, DA. Uh, so, I don't know, we are going up against um, either Area 77 or Fiends. So I think we need to worry about that first. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those, who, those three who, teams who, that I mentioned. The... Okay, so out of the three teams that you mentioned, who do you think is the biggest challenge that might potentially bring you guys down to lower bracket? Uh, I'll say BTK because they're the only one that beat us so far. Mm -hmm. Then talking about BTK, what do you think about their chance making it to Vegas? Uh, I I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, good. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, we're very excited to see how Gigi performs. Can you give us a little tour of your uh, of your jersey? This is the first time we're seeing your um, gaming gladiator oh. your jersey live on stream. So let's take a look at what it looks like. Ooh, looking strong there. All right, all right. Thank you, Hoon, for joining us for the interview. Best of luck to Gigi in the upcoming matches, and we're gonna continue cheering on for you guys. Uh, thank you. This well, is the moment you, every like the time during stream. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was waiting for Liz to leave, but I, I like the New uh -huh. Jersey. Honestly, I, I, it was interesting when he talked about the Hayabusa, right? I was wondering if he was going to kind of give credit to it because Riles is a pretty good Hayabusa, but I do agree, just currently not with the meta. Maybe trying something like the Harley <laughs> could be a game plan, but I thought he was going to say, like private, I heard him kind of whispering it, drink water, Ben Mathilda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as uh, with the for advice. Uh, and yeah, he's he's right, though. There are actually some buffs coming in Hayabusa's uh, future. I'm not sure if that's going to pull him into the meta soon enough. But yeah, he's had a kind of a rough ride of it. And while Riles did make a name for himself on the Riles, he, or on the Hayabusa, he does respect the fact that it's just no longer in the meta. And I mean, to use it is really, especially at this tier. We actually saw him use the Hayabusa a little bit in the qualifiers but I mean I, I want to say that's just a little bit of a sign of respect that he has for the top eight he's not pulling it out here he knows that it's it's not a meta pick it's not something there are better opportunities for and then uh I want to say I love the cap off there with uh seeing the jersey a little uh black and gold there uh for it there L nice colors on it uh really appreciate it and especially uh gaming gladiators there it's uh, uh, a good respectable uh victory for them here tonight yeah, I mean, black and gold kind of matching with private here. We're all going with the gold scene because today a little gold earring and then we have the gold tie. So we're definitely pulling the gold off and looks like GG also have that color palette going on. Actually, last week, Shark did wear the gold, <laughs> wear that jersey, but we haven't really caught that. So this week we saw it on his uh, teddy bear. Very interesting a camera roll. Very, very interesting watching the games for sure. Now with the Harley advice, I feel like that was kind of a troll advice. I mean, are <laughs> we really go going to see Harley in a jungle position? Can is Harley even viable for the jungle role right now? Hey, there's only one way to find out, right? Well, I hopefully we'll see it today, <laughs> but no, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. Uh, just because it's not oftenly picked to be at least have enough statistics and I don't really see Harley shining that much. Plus, I just feel like it's easily uh, counterable. You can grab somebody who can kind of deal a lot of damage to be able to burst them down. You can go the tankier route to be able to sustain yourself against the magic damage. Uh, but who knows? I mean, I, I feel like anything's possible nowadays with the way the meta is kind of shifting. 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's opportunities, and, and maybe it's just the the play style that Riles has might synergize well to, to make it an option. But uh, it, it's going to have to definitely be something that the rest of the team is building into, like we saw from that second game of uh, Legacy, where you had some single target damage, you had some group damage, you had some. Uh, it just it didn't synergize well, and you you're going to need something like that, especially if you're going to pull a lot of Harley uh, in the current meta that we have. But for Legacy though, today they had a very challenging matchup just because they're going against the top tier GG. But just as general prospects for a Legacy, coming from you guys, what do you think Legacy can do to, um, I don't know, get a match win? <laughs> get a match win? <clears throat> oh, I mean, this is their last, they have one more chance. So they have to be able to claim uh, the series in the lower bracket. Now, in order to gain one, I, I guess if we can just speak on their gameplay, I mean, it's kind of harder to pick when they win against GG because they kind of dominate every area for the most part. But I would say the early game uh, should be one of the main po points that they kind of focus on. Finding a way to be able to take these objectives with little to no loss and trying to delay the trades from the enemy side. The second thing I would say is probably a little bit better drafting, in my opinion. I kind of feel like uh, there was a lot of times where it was just kind of awkward with... Uh, certain heroes playing with others like synergized compositions maybe going in with like that standard oh somebody with group cc somebody who can provide support some late game damage some early game damage and then uh you know probably somebody somebody with split push capability of anything of that nature i think would be a little bit better but we typically see them pick a couple of heroes that kind of do the same thing and it's a little bit overkill when you stack them together uh, for me today, we saw, at least in the first game, I, I want to say we saw uh, synergy. We saw better macros, better mechanics from them. They were able to uh, use the Hilda very well. They were able to get ganks, uh, four-man ganks, cover the escapes of enemies. Uh, it just turns out that eventually they got overwhelmed uh, with it, and they, they were able to shine with it. The draft, uh, and I feel like that was the plan that they came with, with this very specific specific draft. Uh, unfortunately, when we got away from that draft, uh, it felt like it, it was, they just had issues. They didn't know what they were supposed to be doing, where these characters really shine, uh, especially if, uh, a character like a Masha or even the Franco pickup uh, was questionable. I don't want to say it was bad, but I just feel like there's better options uh, to be able to do it. We saw, like, I, I immediately knew as soon as Franco was picked up, he's going to have a heck of a time surviving the damage that was going to be output by them. Uh, because like I said, he's not really a tank, he's a support. And it's something that you want to have like a strong front line for to be able to to, to kind of pull that off uh it's just there's there's little issues when it comes to those type of drafts and decision making for some of the characters uh i'm not sure that but that's kind of a question up there is that because of hero pool is that just because they they panic during the draft i i don't know but what i did see today was that they are they are getting better when it comes to synergizing they're getting better when it comes to whoever's making the calls out there uh, from the first game the second game i mean I mean, I, there's very little you can do when you're getting pushed back that hard to, to really kind of shine and uh, when it comes to macro and uh, mechanics there. But, I mean, they're getting better and they're improving. There's a reason that they are top eight. They made it through not uh, 64, 128 different teams to get here. So, I mean, there is respect on that. They, they're still a top eight team in North America. It's just it, there's such a huge shadow that is cast by the rest of the teams here at the top eight. Yeah, they might be struggling against the other seven teams. They're still doing a lot better than the other 100 teams that didn't make it to the regular season. Yeah. So keep that in mind, guys. Now, before we go into the next series of the day, Area 77 versus the new revamped Fiends, we have a giveaway for all of you lovely viewers who are staying Ooh. in tune with us right now. On the screen, you have the, the giveaway code for one of these permanent skins. We have 40 today, actually. Not 31, but we have 40 quantity for the skins first come first serve so make sure you redeem that code type that code in for one of these skins they actually upgraded to 40 guys i mean it's not a big upgrade but it's something right yeah hey, i mean i always say the best price is free so definitely claim it while it's available and like <laughs> i said i'm a collector myself so i love uh getting every single hero skin in mobile <laughs> legends when i can obviously we can't grab those because we're on the desk but there are some out there for you guys so make sure you guys get them while they're still there. 
a nice round number 40 instead of like the random <laughs> 31. <laughs> like, it just comes out of nowhere. 31 uh, available. I, I assume that at some point, nine, nine staff members got themselves some skins. And that's where we got that number from. But 40, we're up in it. We're up in the ante here in North America for you guys, giving you guys a, a little something back for our, our lovely viewers out there. Yeah, I mean, Trek spreading the propaganda that 31 is actually for, for stuff Weezy to grab, that number one spot <laughs> yeah. for Weezy, but we're trying, we're, we're not actually, actually taking any prize away from you guys, just to keep that in mind. We have a little break coming up. The next match is supposed to be scheduled at 8 o'clock, but we are only going to have a 15 minute break. So come back with a glass of water, refresh up for the next series, Area 77 versus Beans. See you guys in 15 minutes. The rumors? About what? The rumors from the border. The demon. demon. He's coming! What happened? They're all dead! Oh no, no! It's him! He's coming! He's coming! <laughs> Impossible! Get him out of here! He's coming! <laughs> <laughs> Who's there? Again. A princess in a tower is just a bird in a cage. before your queen. It won't take long, I promise.
Alright, she'll get it back soon. Oh, would you? Would you right now? Yeah, cool. Yeah, oh, sure, it's yours. Jeez. Look at Angela. Jesus okay. Christ. Oh, yeah, let's jump this. Yo, that's in a red open. Double dash. Flicker, flicker, flicker. Bell, bar, flicker, bell. Bar, 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 bar. Yeah, yeah, we're on him. I'm blocking. We can't eat. They're on me. Yes. Oh, we're gonna try to eat things. What? Load. What the f? I'm <laughs> trying to open you. Oh. Oh, yo, you know. Yeah, he did, he did. We're bad, too. I'm fine. He's still as old. He was trying to. It just got cancelled a bunch, that's why. Yeah. I stun him, I stun him. You missed your stun, my boy. Wow. Yeah, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. After kill. Nice. Nice. They're probably in there. Oh, oh, she yeah, has no flicker. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Angelo. Uh... Help me. I think you're fine. You good? Carlos? Nah. Uh... Okay. No. I'm dead. I'm dead. End the ball. End the ball. Send pro. End the ball. Nice. End it? Uh, yeah. You end it? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> And four. And style. Yeah, I didn't even notice this guy was ending. Holy sh! I know. Keep going, keep going. I mean, I'm up in five. I'm up in five. Yeah, you'll be up. You'll be up in time. I'm gonna. I'm going for the tower. Right? Yeah, you, 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 you might have to. You might have to go to that. Me. All right, top, 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 top. Both of you guys go. We should just be able to tower lock. I'm top. I'm top. Any dice? Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. I'm almost there, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Right here? Yeah, we, have another, we have another way too, we have another way too. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going! And then, and then, and then, and then, and then. Nice. Oh, oh my god, god. okay, okay, okay. Gosh. That's, That's crazy. crazy. One more. In the midst of the midst. You three, you three stay mid. Me and uh, uh I'll fuck, uh clear wave because they can't rush Lord. Okay? Yeah, watch out, uh, watch out top. I, I think we can, yeah, just us three. Yo, G. Nice. Hey, no, we can, we can, we can actually push, 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 push. Yeah, push they have no wave clear. No wave clear. No wave clear. They have no wave clear. We could end. We could end. We could end. No wave clear. Clear mid, clear mid. Yo, 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 kid. 3G. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to give it. I don't want to give it. Oh, no, no, even... no, 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 back, back, back. We good, we good, we good, we good. No, we can no, end, no, we can end. Push me here, push me here. They're so low, they're low, they're low. Push mid, push mid, push mid, push mid. We can zone, we can zone, I'll zone, I'll zone. I'll zone. Push. Yo, 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 it's missing push by ourselves. We should go back here, no? Uh, yeah. Yo, 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 yo,
at their finest moments. Right, but the Lord is down to half health already. BTK, do they want to try to end this here? Oh, the final slash does lock on to Pro Destroy. Milo back in, Whoa. knock up, taken out. Basic able to pick up the kill. Kahari. Magic taking so much damage, but Kahari is up and ready to go. Speedy Light Wheel. No. Not able to connect just yet. Nicolette able to find another. It's nothing but Kohari and Turo against the world. And the minions are closing in. Will this be a 2-0? Fiends still trying Milo. to put it all on the line here. BTK feeling confident. Dropping the toss. Toss. Just lock onto the base and finish it. Kohari going to be the next to fall. Milo looking for it. But now Kohari gets the shutdown. And now the minions are back up. It's Turo and Kohari still against the world. But BTK is not playing anymore. We're entering the 20-minute sleeps in trouble. Ooh. Ooh, a lot of damage on a sleepy, but they got to get back to base quick. The Lord is already oh. almost there. Uh oh, Minoan's Fury does come out for Barrage Flicker, but that is a lot wasted there. Can they clear it out? No, they're locking onto the base, and that is it. Well, so it's just like a great combination by them. Ooh. Oh, another the Divine Judgment. And Melon able to get the kill. Lord still coming. Bloodhounds down one member. A lot of damage on Ooga Melon able to get the kill. No T finds him asleep. Gets away with just a sliver. Yato flickers in. Lord is on the base, and it's five members chipping it down. DA take game three. Yeah, it's the vengeance just pretty much doing the damage itself in Jay here. Oh, they tried for the Divine Judgment, but did get caught. Ohari finds the kill there. A blazing duet from Iso, not able to find too many marks there. You can see the vengeance from Uneven with those electrifying beats. Able to put some damage on Kohari on the back line, trying to shred down. Your rest, you might be the next one. Oh and that is it. You can see Kohari. There are no more members for him to take down. Melon on to T, cushion to the backside, looking for Boca. Taking a little bit too much damage. Uka Buka able to force him away. T also taking a lot easy peasy, finds the decimation. Immortality oh. down, T down, but the Lord has fallen as well. Base. They want to lock onto the base. Can they finish this? Ooga Booga does it. Iso finds the tower into the oh. back. Nicolette with that time journey to try to protect her team. Bursted down, taken down by Mark Cutie. This could be the end. Iso still pushing into the tower. Oh. It's just Kolo left. We have minions up at the top. Basic with the blazing duet, trying to clear out the minions. Gets taken out by Iso. Here oh. comes Mielo with the damage he gets taken out by mark Cutie. it's just cold world left but they have no minions still gonna try to force it at this mid tower we have zane. the timers up your reshi coming in zane is back out is he gonna have the heavy spin ready the, the, the core goes down this is gonna be a sweep for area 77 both sides are gonna kill their first kills of the game you are gonna see kuya nash get the kill for the side of legacy but the invasion on the orange buff Ooh, a lot of damage on to Riles there. I mean, Rams is there. Rams is going to take it. Praise the Wrath goes down. Oh. Rams is able to just get away with a singular HP there. But we're already seeing the possibilities from the side of LG, the invades. Whoopi now there as well. Ooga Booga looking for the invades. Able to get the knock up. The Tyrant's Revenge. The Templates goes down. Ooga Booga taking a lot of damage. Whoopi looking for the final punch, the knockout punch, and knocks him out. We're still looking at seven turrets in favor for GG, though. But maybe some more for Devious Activity as they are now seizing the opportunity. Ooh, big final slash onto T. T goes down. Melon on the run. Five chicken finds the kill. Kush might oh. just be next. The three for one trade. Be well, best player's been down, and they don't care. Yato now in trouble in the wall, trying to get away. Shark oh. not going to let it happen. It's the final slash, and all that's left is Mikasa. Can they end this here? It's nothing but Mikasa on the field. Mikasa pops the ult. Gonna try to. Oh my god, look at the damage. No. Mikasa is immediately taken out. GG will close the night out early. The teams are ready for their battles, but only two will make it to Vegas for the final showdown. NACT, it's time to pick your champion. Hello everyone, this is Fly Chicken. Welcome to my Hero One Trick Guide. Today, I want to show you my Ruby Sparta Guide. Ruby's arsenal is packed with crowd control with very short cooldowns. Also, Added on top of the lifesteal you are getting, it makes common sense for you to play more aggressively, Sparta style. AKA, don't be afraid to limit test and die a few times, a fly chicken signature. In this example, my jungler got caught in quite a bit of trouble by the opponent's XP laner. Well, we're back guys for the second half of today's playoffs match. We have Area 77 versus Fiends. Very interesting matchup. We know Area 77 didn't change their roster even for a bit, but uh, Fiends are looking at a pretty drastic change. So what do you guys feel about it? 
Uh, I mean, with new roster changes comes new challenges, but also sometimes new opportunities. So I, I will say I'm looking forward to it. I myself am a fan <laughs> of teams that kind of keep their roster the same just because, I mean, at least in, in ACT, it's been proven that those teams are a little bit more successful in the long run. But I mean, sometimes changes for the better. And I guess we'll be able to see that today for our second series. Yeah, I've, I've been uh, on the same uh, same set of music there as Wheezy when it comes to kind of changing things up. I've been a big advocate of why mess with a formula that is working for you. But we've seen some some success when you, you have maybe a hole that uh, isn't being covered well. You put somebody else in that position. I mean, we saw, I mean, just speaking of legacy, just a while ago, I want to say this was a much better legacy than we've seen during the season games. I mean, given they were facing a team like Game and Gladiators, so they're really wasn't much wiggle room for them to uh, really uh, explore that but I mean anything is possible when it comes to uh, some of these changes but for Fiends they actually put Kohari on that roam position which is very interesting because throughout the regular season we were all talking about Kohari the brave Kohari <laughs> the guy who's carrying his team to victory in that marksman lane but he actually decided to go roam which is very interesting change because we don't know that much about the new players they added onto the rosters but well, I'm guessing that they feel like Kohari will get outshined by the marksman they're adding in <laughs> yeah, I mean, outshine? I don't know if it'll be outshine. I mean, Kohari was really good in the goal lane. I, I, I will say a couple of times he was overly aggressive. Uh, I called him Tony Montana at one point. Like, he will go against the world for a final stand if he has the opportunity. Uh, but he was still an, a pretty decent goal laner. I mean, he's kind of newer on the scene, so you got to work out some of those kinks, especially against the upper echelon marksmen. But I think he was pretty solid. But now seeing him inside of the Rome position, he's up for a challenge, right? I mean, the Rome is a very hard role to kind of step into is you have to initiate so much in the gameplay, right? You have to be setting the tone, rotating around the map, creating the opportunity. And he likes to be aggressive. Sometimes that could be great for a Romer, but other times it could not be. So we'll have to see as we move forward with these matches. Yeah, yeah. for me, I know there's been a lot of talk, especially from him transferring from that marksman position to the Rome position. And just because of that, that Tony Montana mindset, when he was a marksman, it didn't matter if his team was ready. He just charged <laughs> in, get the kill, and get out. You can't do that as a Romer. So I'm definitely looking at Kohari. I want to see what the changes he's made. Is, have we, are we going to see a brand new Kohari out here that's patient, that's waiting to get those sets for his team, that's making sure that his team is ready before he goes in that's going to be i want to say that's going to be the big point for me on the success of fiends here tonight can i it yeah, reminds I mean, me of one thing Ooga Bo you mm -hmm. remember when Ooga Booga was running in the marksman and then he swapped to the roam position i mean we've half seen it before uh, it kind of reminds me of that situation and Ooga Booga was very aggressive in the roam position after switching that so maybe i don't know we'll have to see how it goes <laughs> I mean, if you put it that way, I mean, judging by private space, doesn't seem like it's very convincing with that <laughs> swap right there. But <laughs> let's take a look, full look at the team's updated rosters. Let's see what it is, private. Uh, we've got a Brainar Kahari. We know is now taking up the Rome position. Churubami in the mid lane. Pro Destroy still in the jungler. I. I actually thought he was, uh, no, he's going to be sitting in their jungle. And then we're going to have Yuri Cutie, who is now in for the XP lane. So we're going to have, uh, I want to say, two new players and one swap of a position here for Fiends. And what do you feel? How do you feel about that, Weezy? I mean, he is right. That's two new additions. I mean, with uh, Brian R and then Yuri Cutie two new players not just one like we've been seeing a lot of teams just switch out one player but two man that's almost 50 percent of your team right there that you're switching out that's, all, that's almost a brand and then a, a, a roll swap for the third player <laughs> that is a brand new team at that point uh so i i don't know i mean i feel like with their team though fiends kind of took the world by surprise right they've been uh doing pretty decent in the nact it's not the same story as uh the first series that we got to see today with legacy they've had a little bit of a different route right they've taken their wins they've also taken their losses uh, but this in their eyes is an upgrade and hey i'm all for it i mean they're a brand new team on the scene and they're trying to make a name and i feel like this is just the beginning for these guys yeah and points wise they're pretty neck to neck when it comes to area 77 and fiends with this new update though we'll find out how they performs but wheezy why don't you take us through the area 77 full roster coming in today 
That's right. As you are seeing a lot more of a familiar type of roster. ISO, J Cutie, Mark Cutie, Tars and Cutie, and your Reshi. A lot of these players have been kind of spread across the land of Dawn in the top eight teams of North America for a decent amount of time. I will say one of the most interesting things about Area 77, at least this time around for NACT Spring, was Mark Cutie, right? He switched over from being a gold laner uh, from the previous NACT to swapping over as a... Um, mage and i think uh i was wondering how that would kind of play into into a uh, part for him and i think it's been pretty well i think he knows how to be aggressive and he also knows when to pull back when needed and uh this is where we do see new additions such as a role swap or swap into a new team actually work in their favor well yeah and that, that kind of carries along i want to say there's not a huge amount of difference when it comes to a, a role like the uh, marksman into the into the mage position that i mean well there's a lot of difference but there's a lot that carries over into the mid lane and that uh you're waiting to kind of get your power spikes the damage you're, you're looking for those uh the squishier members to try to get that damage on i think the added thing from the mage position is your rotations now now you're looking for opportunities to get those ganks onto the side lane so it kind of lent itself and really helped mark cutie to kind of shine in those positions Positions. But like we were talking about, I mean, no changes here. And especially for a team like Area 77, who in the playoffs has been known to really shine. Yeah, and let's see what our casters predicted for this matchup today. Oh, wow. Ooh. Looks like Zeke joined UA there with the Fiends hype. <laughs> Zeke believes that fully, fully in. Fiends' potential today, what do you guys feel? Because I personally felt that Area 77's roster was working pretty well. They had some uh, roster swaps there to there because of Mark Cutie's schedule. But overall, they've been doing very well throughout their series. They're actually one of the two teams that took a win against uh, BTK. So definitely very strong there. And Fiends' new lineup is a little bit questionable for me. But what do you guys feel? Uh, I'm right there with you. I, I agree with the BTK statement. They were able to kind of surprise the world. Uh, with that victory and it was a good look for them and also not changing too much on the roster means we already know what to expect with our synergy and so do they jumping inside of the land of dawn and this is kind of why they earned my vote not to mention i mean we've seen area 77 do really well private made an excellent point on talking about them kind of showcasing their talent when it comes to the playoffs right we saw them make uh what was it fourth place in uh, the last nact right they were able to get into fourth place they've actually performed in an offline event as well so it just showcases how capable of a team area 77 can be i know i'm gonna date myself here but uh call me agent molder because i want to believe in extraterrestrials <laughs> here uh tonight uh area 77 they've come on the scene very strong uh i don't even and honestly i want to say i'm a huge fan of what they've been able to do especially the last two seasons last season got uh, so many upsets in the playoffs that like that completely shocked me this season i'm not surprised by it anymore we saw them take a lead over btk and here i'm actually looking for these to be i want to say my my pick for underdogs uh, the the surprises i feel like uh, i feel like area 77 is going to carry a lot of surprises in these playoffs for us here in North America. And the alien nation and the fiends <laughs> are ready, so let the assassination begin. And that's right. Here we go. Jumping in to the draft for the second series of the day for day one of the playoffs for the NACT spring season. Bands are already on the board. We're looking at a little bit of a support taken off the table for both sides. For me, Area 77, they're going to take off that Ferramus on the side for you, Private. It looks like it will be the Mathilda. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a pretty basic bands here right now. The big thing for me is I've felt that Area 77 has really carried uh, a lot of weight when it comes to a lot of the compositions that they put together. They're, they're structured well. Like from what we saw, like uh, some of the, the fallacies of Legacy, where they didn't have picks that really made sense, that they were kind of maybe characters that they weren't too, uh, too good on. It's completely the opposite for Area Area 77. Every pick has a purpose here. Uh, they do well when it comes to counter counter picking against their enemies here, and that's a big thing. That a reason why they were able to be so successful uh, here to get fourth place, uh, even a victory over BTK. So I'm definitely looking for them to continue to shine there in their draft here against Fiends. Yeah, and I mean 
kind of take a look at at least both of these teams from their last performance uh, to close out the regular season. Area 77, fresh off of a sweep up against Legacy 2-0. But on the other side of the table for Fiends, they went up against Game of Gladiators and they got swept 2-0. So one of these teams is fresh off being swept and the other one is fresh off of putting down the broom. So now we're going to have to see who can kind of push forward with today's series. And it's going to be definitely one for the books. We did get to see uh, we did get to see the Roger picked up in both games for Area 77 up against Legacy. I wonder if that's going to be a game plan for them. It's, it has not been banned on the table so far. They did keep things interesting with the chip on their shoulder as well to be able to provide that CC and those teleports. But I mean, we kind of talked about what chip can provide and not really one of the strongest options. But speaking of strong options, Playing a little bit on the safer side, Area 77 with the Frederick. Yeah, we're going to see what Fiends have to answer. I know I've talked a little bit uh, in length about Area 77, but Fiends have impressed me so much in this tournament, especially right from the start of the qualifiers. The first team, they put down Gosu in the first qualifiers. Anybody who's been uh, here in North America for a while, they know Team Gosu, I mean, a, a, a staple here for North America. And to be put down by a team, and you thought maybe it was a little bit of luck, and then you saw the performance of Fiends throughout the playoffs uh, throughout this or throughout the season here and how well and how successful they've been here so i mean it's and it brings up how good maybe kahari has been that maybe he's even better on the roam position than he is in the marksman position he's still a question here as we're going up against area 77 but we see we get a lot of that cc uh and the setting potential kahari picking up the minotaur and then we're picking up the roger for a, a little bit of that uh, marksman lane domination yeah i mean you are seeing that valentina picked up looks like it's a response especially with the kohari having that minotaur from the minoan fury the Roger, we, we predicted this, right? We thought Area 77 would take it if available. They didn't pick it up first pick, which allowed Fiends to kind of counter that and grab it for themselves. Now, Roger still can be flexed. Doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be in the gold lane. It can also be inside of the jungle. We got to see that today in both positions, and I think it did pretty well. Speaking of things that are doing well as well, CC picked up over there by Yureshi, one of those heroes. Very hard to keep at bay, especially providing that split push capability, being able to rotate around the map, get to the back line will be his main focus and they need something to either keep him in his tracks or keep up with that pace yeah i'm expecting uh, it's very interesting here because i'm expecting to uh see uh as we move into the second banning phase we're going to probably end up taking harith off the board we're going to take off some of those count with the roger here uh pro destroy still kind of lingering on his pick we got 13 seconds to go there or are we looking for maybe something to help out i mean uh against the cc right now uh depends on what we have for the side of fiends if we can possibly play a benedetta i know our lot's taken off the board there uh oh and then we get a vexana so i'm expecting uh, i mean that's a, a a great and powerful pick we saw this banned out there there's a reason she was banned out the entire first series uh, uh, is because of the immense amount of damage and CC that comes out from her. Especially, she's such a huge factor in a lot of these objective fights and pushing off the jungle uh, to help your jungle get that retribution. I think those are all excellent points. I feel like the Vexana is good here. It can definitely provide that damage. Doesn't give too much profit to the Valentina, but I think the Valentina is just going to focus on the group CC, which puts Area 77 in a good position to maybe not even go for a group CC tank possibly go for something different entirely if they really want to they could still pick up something like a Raffaella, keep the team alive keep them mobile if they really wanted to go that route that's really the only other support that i can see them picking i don't see the florian sneaking up in here but speaking of uh utility and heroes i can kind of provide that export taken off the table this side for uh area 77 trying to limit the xp lane capability right you mentioned what heroes can give the cc a hard time you talked about the uh benedetta i think that's an excellent option highly mobile able to sustain itself and also able to keep up with that pace i think uh if left unchecked could be a possible option i don't see the black dragon going down i feel like the black dragon's a little too risky just because there is a valentina on the other side of the table but there goes that Harith that you mentioned which would have been great to counter the roger in a smart play by Fiends. 
Yeah, uh, it's going to be very interesting here because uh, I don't imagine a much can keep up with the CC. Heretic is taken off the board. They actually really focused on making sure that this marksman lane is going to have at least if it's just a 1v1. They're making sure that this marksman lane is uh, going to be free for Fiends, which means there's going to need to be some pressure from Area 77. If Fiends may be looking to delegate where Area 77 puts the pressure. They're now saying you're going to the picks that are left, you're going to need to answer because Roger's going to basically walk all over it. On the side of Area 77, they're trying to kind of protect Tarzan, the front line there, making sure that Xborg is taken off of there. They're taking off that early game there. Nolan just taken off the board there for them. So we're going to see what we have in answer for them. Still looking for a, a marksman and a roam position for the side of Area 77. Yeah, I mean, they could pick up something like a Claude or even a carry, right? I mean, we kind of mentioned the uh, carry going up against the uh, Roger could be a possible threat if you just let carry stack up for that late game. He can survive and do the damage necessary. I feel like the uh, Claude can definitely survive. Maybe a little bit harder when you're jumping into him and knowing fear for the knockup, but it has survivability in his kit. Brody still could be a viable option, especially when you have a Roger who's going to jump in with the Lycan Pounce, try and burst you down. You can use that Corrosive Strike, get the stun, and flicker back to uh, safety. But speaking of picks, going to go ahead and lock in the jungler for the side of Fiends. Just going to confirm that Roger, at least so far, is going to be inside of that uh, gold lane position. Yeah, we're going to see what we kind of come up with. You brought up a good point that uh, if you have a Valentina and you're taking the Minoan Fury, you maybe don't need a tank with setting potential. But I mean, uh, I want to say Tigreal still out there. Diggy is still available as well. Um, we're looking. Oh, we're going to have a Grok. You were right about the Claude pick kind of coming out there as well. Going to be able to spread out a lot of damage. And Grok uh, going to be able to kind of use that wilderness charge. And especially his passive. Uh, his his uh, his his passive being able to be next to a wall while he's holding his ability. He doesn't get CC'd. He's got a little bit more tankiness as well. Uh, yeah, it's going to see how well this stacks up against uh, Fiend's last pick. Yeah, the last pick on the board. Will it be an XP lane, right? Now, technically, this could still be flex for Fiend's, and that's why I kind of like this. But it looks like it's going to be a solidified uh, Barats in the uh, jungle, which means a Paquito will be in the XP lane. That is going to be up against a CC, though. Now, Paquito has been hitting pretty hard, though. We've seen him in the regular season deal a lot of damage from a lot of XP laners from multiple teams, and I think he's a great answer. Now, CC is a little bit more mobile in my opinion, but I feel like Paquito has a little bit more tricks up his sleeves when it comes to survivability. Now, overall, when it comes to team fights, when it comes to the neutral objectives, I'm expecting a lot of heavy engagement for both sides. Mm, yeah, the Paquito really shines against, I want to say, some slower but uh, heavy hitters uh, in the mage position in the marksman position uh, for me right now i'm kind of wondering is paquito going to be able to close the distance on a valentina close the distance on a claude or a cc especially because you like to set up a lot of these objective fights uh paquito brings somebody down and then you move on to the objective Speaking of closing the distance, into the land of dawn we go. Area 77 up against Fiends for our second and final series of the night. Who will be able to push on forward in the upper bracket? Yeah, all eyes. I want to say this is a very anticipated match, especially for me. I definitely want to see how Kohari performs in the roam position. And if Area 77 can bring that same synergy and playoff stability that they have in the past to this match. Yeah, that's a big step. From a cold laner to a roamer. You don't see that happen too often in the NACT. And Kohari definitely willing to step up to the plate. But was it the right uh, decision? I think that's what everybody's kind of asking right now. But on the bot side, though, Ooh. we're seeing a lot of early <laughs> engagements in these matches, Private. I'm like, the camera's not even there yet. And you're seeing people at 10% HP. <laughs> That's a lot of quantum charges on the side of Area 77. And this is what I was talking about. There's going to be a lot of mobility. And so I'm wondering if Yuri's going to be able to close the distance with that Paquito to a lot of these who are going to try to kite him away, especially with the immense amount of damage that he brings uh, to a lot of these fights during the objectives or, or trying to get, you can see already here and in the lane, he's having a lot of trouble against Ureshi, who's actually zoning him out away from starving him from from his lane minions. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of mobility, but it's going to be kind of facing against a lot of damage, right? You've seen that double impure rage, a couple of tenacities, and then one quantum charge from your cutie to try and keep up with the high mobility that Area 77 has. So speaking of mobility, the flicker out your cutie 
not able to escape the wrath, and Yureshi will be able to draw first blood into the hands of Area 77. And unfortunately, I want to say that the side of Fiends just a few seconds too late to help out with that. But even if I want to say Tarzan didn't aid in that fight, it felt like Yureshi really had that in the bag in the first place. It's going to give Yureshi a great advantage, too, because, I mean, he's going head to head up against uh, Yuri Cutie. And you kind of mentioned that it may be a little bit of a challenge for uh, Yuri Cutie to get to the back line. Uh, speaking of back line, though, big knock up. Airborne goes pro destroyed. Need to get out of there. Tarzan Cutie able to claim the turtle for Area 77. First blood and the first objective in their favor. I, I, I want to say I, I love the faith that Area 77 has in their jungler, the faith that the jungler has in his team. He didn't go to try to help them, focused on the turtle, made sure that he got that. After he got the turtle, then he went to help them. They got the shield, and then they all backed up in a good game plan by Area 77. One kill up for them. Yeah, one kill up. Still anybody's match, though. I feel like it's going to be a little bit of a closer game than the last series that we watched, especially with both of these teams kind of a little bit more even in terms of being objective focused. But Synergy should be in favor for Area 77 since they did not change their roster that much. But will that be the difference they can lean in on or will that be the strength that Fiends is going to try and hone in on for this match? You are seeing ISO on the top side. He is running this Claude. Has a survivability, but he is going up against that staple pick Roger that we've been seeing dominate so far for the meta. Yeah, and uh, he's uh, doing a good job of pushing his wave there as well. The, the, and that's why I want to say the difference is that while Yureshi is kind of bullying Yuri, he's trying to make sure that he's starving him from his minions. On the other side, I want to say Brynar just kind of forcing and pushing his way toward ISO, which I want to say the better game plan is to kind of try to starve out your opponent there uh, to make sure that he's not getting the goal. A little bit of engagement here at the bottom. Yeah, 2v1. You're cutie again. Force to use a flicker, but this time able to escape. The bottom rotation from the side of Area 77, almost finding his second death of the game. <laughs> a little bit of a wall there. Didn't actually do anything because Kahare just walked the side of it. But ISO clearing up mid lane as well. Right now, not too much going on. Very slow paced. But I want to say, very slowly, a little bit of a gold leak coming from Fiends as Area 77 already got themselves a little bit of a, a about a thousand K or a thousand gold lead. Yeah, speaking of leads though, Kohari, Minoan Fury for the triple knockup, flickers away, but unable to escape with that distance. Yureshi will find his second kill of the game to shut him down. You are looking at an invasion though, into the jungle for Fiends. May need to be careful though. Tarzan hit with the Terrify, hit with the CC. Pro Destroy on the chase, forcing him out of his jungle. And Jay Cutie hugging that wall, trying not to get caught up by that CC turtle. 50% HP, both teams willing to clash it out. Yeah, Jay Cutie doing a good job trying to bait out Yuri Cutie here, trying to put some damage. Yuri looking for an opportunity. Ooh, looking for the opportunity. The wall will drop. Turtle, very low. Tarzan will take it for Area 77. They may get more. Praise Raft drops down. We'll find Pro Destroy. Jay Cutie finds another. Churro Bombie will fall. Yeah, I, I want to say very slowly this game starting to edge even closer into Area 77's favor. Yeah, Ryan um. on top side, very low. Your cutie <laughs> hit the top 3v1. They really want him bad down there, not letting him <laughs> escape at all, giving him such a hard time, overwhelming him with the numbers. <laughs> I feel like every single time they engage, Area 77 comes with more members at the bottom. They weren't able to take care of it with two last time. All right, we'll have three for you now. Upping it to five and O oh against Fiends. Uh, I want to say a little bit more one-sided than I expected. Yeah, you need to see Fiends find some answers, find some trades. If not, they're going to be digging their own grave, and they may not be able to climb out of it. Area 77. We'll be able to claim the first turret of the game on the bot side, left unchecked, and may be able to get a little bit more on the invasion for the purple buff, the airborne knock with the eternal guard. Pro Destroy, able to get out of there in last minute. Play into the survivability from the Barats. Uh, we, we just saw the items there earlier, and we saw kind of the gold lead right now. Area 77, I want to say, at each position, about 1k over their opponents in each single roll there. So they actually have, like, about an item, except for you can see at the roam position, which is kind of a slow starter there in the first place. But, I mean, they're doing such a good job right now. They're starting to overwhelm fiends. Fiends aren't able to find... And this is the thing, too. Where's the last time we've seen fiends go for a gank on their own? They just continue... It looks like they're just continually replying to what area 77s do on the map 
Yeah, I mean, two core items to one right now for ISO up against Brianar, right? He already picked up the Corrosion Scythe and the Demon Hunter Sword. Brianar only having the Wind Talker to work at his disposal. Off to a great lead, and so far, I mean, they've been checking all the boxes off in Fiends. Looking like they were studying for the wrong test, as you are going to go ahead and see Area 77 pulling the aggro for the next turtle, and it looks like it may not go contested as Jay Cutie on point with these walls right now. <laughs> Pro Destroy, the tiny little dinosaur there. They're doing a great job, like to the point that Pro Destroy isn't even able to find his stacks to keep them, to keep uh, him up right now as we continue on with an engagement. Yeah, turn of guard, heavy left punch, rushing in, airborne knockup on a Pro Destroy, and Yureshi will be able to get the kill off of that. Area 77, not only claiming the second turtle of this game, or third turtle, but also a body on top of that. Shurabami with the response, so we'll find Tarzan Cutie. Big knockup from the Minoan Fury for both sides. Iso finding Kohari, but needs to disengage. You're queuing the mid lane. Brian R, very low. Mark Cutie wants blood, and he will get it. Brian R will fall. Shurabami in the hands of your wretched Cutie will find another. That's a one for three trade and a turtle to Area 77. Yeah, right now, uh, I mean, as much as uh, oh, ooh, a little bit of a, a Yureshi in trouble there, getting uh, beat down there by Yurikiri on that Paquita. But like I, I was about to say, I, like I can't even really blame Kahari here. Like we, a lot of people have had their eyes on the Rome position here. 35k there, you can see there by the CC oh. right now. But when it comes to like the team right now, Fiends are just not executing when it comes to like getting those ganks or rotating around the map. They're just, like I said, they're just continually replying to Area 77 in Instead of making plays themselves, instead of uh, finding out that they, they're not going to be able to take the turtle here, they're not going to be able to, uh, to get to this lane a little too late and forcing something at another lane. Right now, they're kind of just stuck in this like uh, continual like getting there at second place uh, when it comes to each of these lanes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're being reactive when it comes to Area 77, who's being more aggressive and claiming everything they want. Wild Charge will connect for the stun on a Brian Arm. No one Fury from Kohari. Not able to get the set he was looking for. Lackey Pounce goes out. Iso will find a turret. Tutu will fall. Kohari will fall alongside it. Tarzan able to get that kill. Iso getting ready. BMI. Blaze Duet onto Churubami. We'll be able to connect. This is BMI to safety. Pro Destroy will fall. The double kill. Iso the Magician. Coming alive, the aliens are landing soon. Yeah, and, th and this was kind of the question a lot of people had. Uh, at this point in the game is usually where Kohari would start taking off, regardless of where his team is. He starts kind of getting those kills, starting to get that damage in here right now as we continue on to the top high ground. Yeah, speaking of high ground, airborne knockup to a mountain. Iso finding Kohari, the siege for the inhibitor on the top side, trying to crack the base open with the response back. You're going to see the Eternal Guard drop down, trying to rush in. Iso forced to use the BMI. Your cutie very low. Hit the Terrified Chain CC. Too much to handle. Mark Cutie able to get another two for none trade. Area 77, 14 to 1. A great bait there you saw from ISO to lure in uh, Yuri Cutie to try to take that damage. He uses the BMI to get himself out of harm's way, and the rest of Area 77 comes in to claim their prize. <laughs> Pro Destroy trying to soak up all that damage, but he can only handle so much. There's four members surrounding him, <laughs> nowhere to go, and Jay Cutie will take him out. Yeah, and, and this, this, I, I feel like this is the result. This is what a lot of us talk about when it comes to changing up the roster, losing some of that synergy, especially there were teammates at mid for Fiends, and unfortunately just couldn't close the distance to help Pro Destroy, to even get any type of damage there to help him out and kind of secure his escape. And this is the result of like what we talk about when it comes to synergy, playing with these guys for a little bit. So when you're going up against a team like Area 77, who has been playing together, blazing duet into the back, Line. From ISO, BMI's back to safety. Base has been opened up. Lord crashing in, ready to go to the base. Crystal, Kohari, trying to find the set for Fiends, trying to keep them in this game. Area 77, trying to land on an additional planet. ISO will go ahead and claim an inhibitor. All have fallen. Fiends up to a possible final stand. Minions in the mid lane, pushing through an Area 77, ready to take it to their home turf. But can they close it out? This is still very early, 11 minutes, a possible fast finish on the way. Yeah, they're, they're looking to kind of close it up here. A good job from Fiends trying to defend this, but I mean, you're looking at about Whoa! 15K gold difference. Wild Charge will connect two for the knockup. Pro Destroy, able to grab up ISO, but not doing barely any damage. Blaze Duet, hit with the knockup, though. Manoan Fury from Kohari. Marquita will find Pro Destroy. One member falling from the side of Fiends. 
Who will fall next? Your cutie! Responds back, takes down more cutie. Both sides losing a member. Make that another as Yureshi is gonna find Yuri cutie. Go hard with another knockup for J Cutie, Tarzan cutie, and Yureshi cutie. Brian R joining the fight, trying to clear out these minions. Shurabani works into the base very low. The base crystal though. Can they take it down? Yes, they can. Area 77 taking game one against Fiends. And what a dominating performance. This is the Area 77 that I talk about, especially when we saw it from last season. When it comes to the playoffs, Area 77 does not disappoint, and they come here to take heads. Yeah, the aliens, the extraterrestrials, definitely showing up to a new planet and ready to take it over. Game number one, looking very good for them. They looked strong, the resolve was there, and the objectives were nothing of a challenge to them to be able to take. Fiends, on the other hand, needing to find some answers after game number one, especially with Kohari. You know, he switched over to that Minotaur, had a little bit of a hard time in the Rome. I wouldn't really say it's because he switched roles, but it was just a hard composition, especially when you kind of first pick that Minotaur to rush against this and you allow the Valentina to pretty much use the Minoan Fury alongside you. Yeah, and I talked about it here, especially the Paquito pickup. While I do like the damage of a Paquito pickup, you're talking about some very mobile, like he likes to close the distance and get those kills onto the squishier heroes, but you're talking about very mobile heroes here. Valentina, who's got uh, dashes up the up the wazoo here to be able to kind of get away from somebody like Paquito. The, the battle mirror image from ISO on the claw to be able, and then of course, Yureshi Cutie, who's able to pretty much jump all over the map, almost like a, a Ling. Uh, to be able to kind of get away. So Yuri just not able to close the distance. And when he was, it was basically a bait from ISO that allowed Area 77 to get the, the, another kill onto Yuri Cutie here. Uh, I mean, I, I want to say a very greatly drafted game by Area 77. And then when it came to the synergy, uh, getting to those side lanes, getting those pickoffs on a lot of these deeds, they just executed to perfection. Yeah, speaking of perfection, Yureshi picking up the highest kills in the game, 5-0 in 10. Like you said, is it synergy, right? Area 77, they're known to not really make too many changes, but work on their flaws. Fiends, on the other hand, a little bit of a newer team on the scenes, made some major changes, probably the most changes out of every single team for the playoffs, this NACT, and it's definitely coming with its challenges, but they need to find their answers fast, right? There's not that much time to be able to figure this out as we are now in the elimination phase. We're in the playoffs. Somebody will be knocked down to the lower bracket today. Yeah, and I also want to make a comment too about Brainar on. Oh, we can take a look here. Well, first we're going to go into the stats. We can see here gold per minute ISO on the the, the gold lane. Uh, just I mean, uh, expected there almost a thousand per minute there. Uh, damage dealt out there. You're rushy. There's a reason he had so many kills there. Sixty nine thousand, and even uh, and even Mark Cutie with eleven assists. Pro destroy. I mean, unfortunately, somebody has to take the damage that was getting, that was being uh, executed out here by Area seventy seven. But uh, another thing is the the roger in the in the gold lane when you are pressing so hard into claude that claude just backs up into the tower he starts just getting his minions at the tower he's like okay if you're gonna be so if you're gonna push so hard on me i'll just sit under my tower uh grab these minions continue to farm slow and steady wins the race but what that also does is that also makes it so that fiends do not have a lane to gank they're they're gonna tr if they try to go to claude's lane to try to help out the roger pick there they're gonna they're not gonna be able to to they're gonna have to dive underneath the tower for claude basically and it, you have the option of the bmi to get him out of harm's way he's just not really an option and it, i just feel like there's just little things like that that uh that fiends had trouble with that area 77 that was really shining with yeah i mean even when you compare the Roger up against the, the Claude, right? I feel like the Claude has a lot of survivability with the BMI. The Roger, he, he can kind of like dash in. He has a little bit of survivability, but he's more of that engager. Now, I will say there was often a lot of times when we saw Area 77 just put a lot of focus into the XP lane, right? They were shutting down the Paquito. They were overwhelming him with that pressure. I want to say it was like two or three kills when we saw a three-man rotation over there, but we didn't really see those type of rotations from Fiends in the early phase. And then on top of that, stacking these turtles, stacking these objectives is where they start the snowball at is you are going to go ahead and see the damage dealt from both sides highest will be Yureshi. i mean he did have the highest kills in the game as well 88 percent team participation 
Yeah, and the the especially in the early game on the side of fiends when it came to damage, you had Chirabami who uh, brought up almost fifty thousand damage. But the other answer you wanted was the Paquito. Unfortunately, with that pressure put on there, and you can see here uh, taking a heap of damage, uh, second only to Pro Destroy. They really shut down uh, the other fifty percent of fiends' possible damage uh, by putting so much pressure onto this Paquito. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of pressure on the line in Area 77. I mean, they're looking focused and ready to take it to the Land of Dawn again. For Fiends, on the other hand, they need to go back to the drawing board, in my opinion, right? They need to kind of, even, even in the draft, I feel like it was a little bit shaky. They first picked the Minotaur. I was kind of a little questionable on that because there's a lot on the table that you're allowing to walk and also to counter up against it. And they did exactly both of those things, right? And I feel like maybe going for something more staple meta in terms of getting something that can be a little bit more valuable that early in the phase and not easily as counterable should be what they're working on first. So this time around, hopefully they can do that. But yeah, there's just a lot even dissecting that that uh, we'll have to see them kind of turn around. And it's an upscale battle. These are one of the things that happens when you change so much on your team in a short notice, right? I mean, Area 77, they're not really changing much. This is the same Area 77 that we've been seeing for at least this season, and they've been improving. Yeah, uh, it's unfortunate, uh, and hopefully in this next game, I mean, they've got two more games here to try to uh, find their footing, find something that works for them. Uh, like I said, I feel like there were just a, there were just little things that, uh, it's those little mistakes, the Paquito pick here, possible. Uh, some of those rotations uh, and how they handled the lanes and the pressure that they had in those lanes. Right now, at the playoffs, in a game against a team like Area 77, you just can't make any of those little mistakes and you have to be uh as sharp as possible but we're here second chances here for the side of fiends who are going to be starting with their first pick yeah speaking of picks bands on the table mathilda nothing out of the ordinary for area 77 the fredron though that's a little bit of a surprise for me at least for fiends it's a little uh, on the riskier side. I feel like there's some other things they could have possibly taken out. They're gonna, it looks like they're limiting the jungle capability, right? They're going to take out that Barats alongside the Fredrin, right? Now, Roger's still on the table. I wonder if Fiends is going to try and pick it up and make it work at their disposal. But then there's still a lot of strong picks out there to kind of counter up against it. There goes the Faramist, taking a little bit more support off the road. Speaking of supports, the Angela is still walking. Can definitely be paired up with something a little bit more beefier, such as an Akai. We've seen that pick up work and take down the top team in the number one seed for the NACT. It could be a possible game plan for Fiends. <laughs> it's funny, is it bad? I, I saw the Fredrin ban and the Barats ban. I kind of thought Fiends were taking on BTK. Those were the <laughs> usual bans that you get against somebody like Moba Zane here. Uh, the, the tankier ones taking off the table there. I mean, they're... Uh, for me, I, I feel like uh, sometimes when it comes to there's there's just so many options uh, that are out there, especially for somebody like Tarzan. He plays a very fl uh, flexible jungle, a lot of different picks that he can come into. So I mean, uh, if it's uh, I, I feel like there's other things that were kind of issues for them. I didn't feel like Fredrin was like the main reason uh, for Area 77's uh, success. Uh, so we'll see how this kind of works out for them. Maybe they have a, a game plan in mind here uh, as they take out the R lot as well. CC is still going to be open. We're still going to have that Roger open right now. Uh, Nolan as well. Dexana, Navaria, two mages walking too. So there's definitely mage prior on the table. Lu Yi, we've been seeing deal a lot of damage could be picked up it's definitely a possibility last band for the first phase for fiends they're gonna go in for that r lot man there's a lot walking on the table right here now <laughs> i think area 77 is trying to get the roger they, they've been performing on it they've been doing really well even uh in the end of the regular season they picked it up twice back to back for a sweep over legacy i wonder if fiends will let that walk i mean last time we got to see fiends have the roger and it was up against a clod and the roger really just didn't have the easiest time so I don't know if that's uh, what they want. And I think Area 77 is like, hey, we already beat it once. So if they want to pick up the Roger, I think we can afford it. But if not, we'll definitely uh, kind of punish them with that. And that's just one of the things that these new staple meta picks kind of provide on the table. It even further diversifies the draft. But speaking of drafting, playing on the safer side for Fiends, they're going to go in for that Ruby who, like you mentioned, took a little bit of a nerf. Yeah, it took a little bit of a nerf. Uh, Kahari picks it up here. So maybe uh, I actually like 
that Ruby pickup if it's going to be on the uh, the roam position for Kahari because I want to say uh, Ruby takes a little bit of a more mechanical hand right now to play well to find those opportunities to get a lot of that CC but in answer to that immediately we've got the Minotaur pickup the Valentina who right now has her I want to say she's got her pick right now you got an I'm offended out there that she can take you've got the uh, uh, the ultimate from Novaria out there as well uh, the astral echo so I mean she's kind of got her pick of ultimates out there we're gonna see what the next uh, word possible we're gonna be picking up for fiends here oh uh, yeah this is gonna be interesting Natan is gonna be picked up I actually didn't expect that one at least this early from them you know what's funny about this is uh, <laughs> I feel like Area 77 is trying to make a statement, right? They let Fiends pick up that Minotaur first, and this time they pick it up first for their part of the draft. Instead, maybe showcasing that they can perform it a little bit better. But this time, it's smart with what they did with it, right? They picked up the Valentina alongside it to deny them to have that IMU hmm. and also use it against them. There goes that Claude again. Uh, they were able to perform really well on it against the Roger. This time, it will be up against the Natan. Both of them able to deal massive damage when it comes to late game, and it's really going to be dependent on how their teams rotate around and get these neutral objectives. And if it kind of paints the picture from last game, we saw Area 77 do a little bit better. So if Fiends can find a way to disrupt their synergy, rotate around, possibly delay some farm in the jungle, get these turtles, it's definitely going to help boost that gold for ISO and also uh, the gold laner for Fiends. Yeah, a little bit of focus from both teams to focus on the jungle. A little bit of respect there paid for the uh, Fanny of Pro Destroyer we saw from his first game of the season. He's an absolute maniac on it. Uh, almost shades of what we saw from Best Player. And then on the side of uh, Fiends, they're going to go ahead and take out Nolan. So that's a lot of uh, early game damage from them. It's going to be, I want to say, the synergy of Brainar and Kohari is going to need to be on point. Because I want to say Natan needs to get pretty close to the battle to be able to do a lot of... Of, uh, to really have that effect he does a lot of damage and he can really close and and even it out very quickly but it's going to be on kohari to make sure he's protected to make sure that he's not getting ganked because for me that's going to be my number one target you know it's interesting though because it's starting to seem like the strategy okay i guess we could say ruby can still be flexed though this still could be an xp lane ruby uh, so it might not be uh <laughs> kohari i'm not really sure if it will be uh but i think what I'm noticing is Fiends is trying to prioritize Kahari getting comfortable first before they do the rest of their draft. That's at least what I'm getting so far from today's series. Now, there's a lot of range, there's a lot of damage, a lot of backline to the side of Fiends and, and some CC, but we still have yet to see who they're going to slot inside of the jungle. Speaking of junglers, though, that Hayabusa has been taken off the table. I didn't, I didn't expect a Hayabusa to walk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of cocked my head a bit when I saw the, the Hayabusa van out there. Um, uh, we Because we just talked about Hayabusa. He's not exactly uh, a, a, a prime pick right now in the current meta. There's just not that he's terrible. There's just better options. Uh, I feel like uh, right now, Area 77, they've got, I want to say, some of the same keys to success that they had from last game. This CC, the Claude right now. I mean, they had excellent games in their first match here of this series and hoping maybe there's an answer on the side of fiends as we move into the second game yeah answers is definitely what fiends needs right now i mean they were not able to take game one area 77 more of a one-sided story the way the draft is looking so far though i mean it's not too bad i feel like they have some value there for both sides x borg able to walk through not be banned out is going to provide some utility for the side of fiends he'll be able to Get that Ice Queen wand, provide that slow, have the Faraga armor, stack immortality. Very hard to kill. And that's pretty much going to confirm him inside of the XP lane. At least at least if I'm seeing this right. But speaking of fighters <laughs> in XP lanes, Dyroth. Now, we've seen this a couple times, probably. We've seen it ran in the jungle. And it did pretty well. But can Fiends pull this off with their new composition? This, this all is the... I was just waiting for it. I was I waiting for the I early game because they're not going to go for a tank. They're going to go for something early game, uh, something that's going to be able to to really kind of claw out there, especially against a Dyroth. Uh, so the Dyroth, the wind, the wind uh, 
the win capabilities for the die rollers. you need to get that early game uh start getting those kills allow nathan to kind of come online now you've got this increased huge burst potential from your teammates and a lot of cc to help you but do you ever take off if you've got a martis on the other side he's gonna be able to mortal coil his way around especially to try to dodge that uh, abyssal strike from pro destroy on this uh, die rob and you've got a lot of mobility that's the thing too he's gonna have to land that abyssal strike uh, and he's gonna have to land it on opportunity on opportune moments when these these guys have used their dashes and are not going to be able to create distance and speaking of distance looks like we are going to be jumping into land of dawn for game number two for our second series our final series of the day area 77 up against fiends who will be able to claim victorious and take this match yeah, we're going to see here if there is a little bit of a difference here between uh, the first game here. Area 77 was quite dominant in that first, really taking advantage of the new roster of Fiends here. We're going to see there's a little bit of a difference here. I'm looking for possibly for Kohari to kind of be that difference maker for the Fiends. Audius predictions are out. Everybody, 78%. For Area 77, 22% <laughs> for Fiends. Speaking of Fiends, Kohari. Switching to that roam position, trying to provide some vision, but taking a couple of hits. Doing so, need to be careful though. Keep in mind, he is going up against a Martis who thrives on the low HP, especially when he can get that decimation. Now, probably you know what's interesting? I'm looking at three impure rages right now for Fiends. They're definitely looking to take the fight in the early. Yeah, I definitely not want time to go back here. Speaking of fights, a little bit of engagement here at mid. No worse for wear. I want to say well blended on the side of Area 77 when it came to the emblems. On the side of Fiends, yeah, definitely looking to stay in these fights a little longer. Stay in their lanes, not having to go back uh, for that mana there. Uh, so we're going to see if that kind of pays off against a team like Area 77. Now, the biggest thing for them was their ability to get to those side lanes and get those ganks in the first game. Ooh, focus on to Kohari, though. A lot of damage. Hit with the stun, catching JQD, but Tarzan QD will be able to take him down for first blood for Area 77. Yeah, already right into the early game, finding Kohari. He gets that decimation onto him, really setting the tone. Nine seconds left for this Lord, so all teams are going to have their five, but Kohari's just going to be slightly behind the mold. Yeah, need to be a little careful, especially with the chain CC that Area 77 has. You have a Valentina with a Martis, both of them able to kind of grab you in their clutches and not let go of you for a decent amount of time, especially when they team up on you. Speaking of teaming up, the battle over the turtle on the way. First neutral objective on the game, Astro Echo will go in. You rescue Cutie in position. You are going to see JQD walking around with the stun. And oh, Fury, last standing from your Cutie though, with the grab. Tarzan will find Pro Destroy. Your uh, Kohari on the chase, on the JQD as well, maybe able to shut him down. Your QD, very low. Mark QD dealing the final hits, but Tarzan QD will be able to take the kill, and Turtle will go to the side of Area 77. Ugh, they just such a switch up. I mean, even even in that, you saw the last insanity go out, and at the last moment, Kohari catches on, and I'm offended to make sure both members took the full front frontal blast of that uh, of that uh, last insanity. But still, Area 77 able to come out ahead, three and O, oh, and with a turtle in their pocket. Yeah, and that's huge, especially this early in the game. I mean, it's almost a 2,000 gold lead within the first three minutes, getting everything they wanted in that trade so far, and it's going to put Fiends in a little bit of a harder position. But speaking of Fiends, Kohari trying to catch him out of position. They're just looking for him, trying to um, hopefully get the early kills off him in their advantage. Yeah, the, the, the one thing right now that I'm starting to see now is Kohari uses the I'm Offended onto Mark Cutie. None of his teammate was actually in a position to capitalize on it. So, I mean, you just kind of wasted your ultimate to put some damage onto Mark Cutie. It really wasn't a difference maker as we take a little bit of engagement here at the top lane. Yeah, 2v1, Yuri Cutie sustaining himself, does have the Paraga armor, should be able to uh, be just fine up there. This is one of the things where the export kind of profits with the survivability. But you mentioned Pro Destroy and the Dyroth, right? Needing to have an early start to be very effective. And so far, he's found an early death, but looks like he's trying to change the narrative. Vengeance proc by your rescue cutie, not wanting to be able to get hit by that Abyssum Strike.
Yeah, I, and, and Pro Destroy smartly and wisely moves right away from that. And that's kind of the, the problem here right now, what I was saying. he's uh, like, Who is his target and how much success is he going to have uh, actually being able to lay down that Abyssal Strike onto somebody? You've got the Vengeance from Yureshi. You've got a lot of mobility from Mark, Cutie, and Iso who are going to be able to kind of get away. As I was talking about that, Iso in a little bit of trouble here. Ooh, Pro Destroy, Abyssal Strike, not able to find the hit onto ISO, a good call, but falling short at the Mark Bryan arm. Still alive though on the bot side, neither member will fall. Yeah, and this is exactly what I was talking about, is just how quickly they're gonna be able to disengage from that abyssal strike. And then we go ahead and there's gonna be a clean turtle take here from Tarzan. Yeah, it looks like he is gonna be able to get it. Sure, Bombi very low, your rescue cutie will find him. That's gonna be four kills unanswered, area 77. Looking to try and close this game out even earlier than the last one. Fiends, can they turn this around? They need to find their proper footing. I mean, right now you're looking at Area 77 with a one-sided domination as the Tier 1 turret in the mid lane will fall. Yeah, I, I, only the five minute mark. They already have about a 3k gold lead. Mark Cutie dives under tower, finds a kill onto Yuri Cutie. And that's just, a, a, I want to say the story right now is that Fiends are having trouble maintaining their jungle, their towers right now, and Area 77 are just uh, basically laying claim on the entire map. Yeah, just having a really great game so far within the last five minutes. Now up by almost 4,000 gold and climbing. As you are going to see that turret on the bot side fall. And that's going to put him at a huge deficit, especially having the Natan. We kind of mentioned the late game marksmans, right? Iso um, running on this Claude, Brynar on the Natan. Both of them needing their teams to take the neutral objectives to give them that power spike super early to be able to do that damage they're relying on, which is going to take even longer for Brynar to get online, but even faster for Iso as he picks up the Demon Hunter Sword. Yeah, I mean, he's already pretty much got uh, uh, enough items for him to start shredding through into the back line here. Brian are going to have to use that ultimate to get himself to safety as now still continuing to push onto these towers is Area 77. Yeah, they're looking for more. They're taking these objectives very fast, mind you. Fiends, they just got to work on their defense a little bit more. A little bit of synergy is lacking so far, and it's showing, especially up against Area 77, who seems to have their composure a little bit more together. Right now, you are seeing them still trying to defend, though. Airborne knockup, ISO. We'll go ahead and take down Pro Destroy. That's gonna be the sixth kill of the game for Area 77, and no answer back from Fiends. Yeah, and uh, right now, there's just there's nothing they can do to stop it. They're about a 5K gold lead at the six minute mark. We're already almost to the high ground towers of Fiends right now. They're not, they don't have the damage, they don't have the CC potential, and they're not able to get any gain right now onto an offensive area 77 yeah, and area 77 slowly like you know playing chess one step at a time but major steps every time they claim an objective speaking of objectives mark cutie will go ahead and take the tier two on the top side tarzan cutie will take the turtle two more things that is going to give fiends a little bit of a harder time trying to catch up now a 7,000, almost 8,000 gold lead highest kills in the game we'll go over to tarzan cutie with three kills Oh, yeah, a little bit of engagement happening. Yeah, Pro Destroy is going to be able to shut down. ISO first kill on the board for Fiends. Last Sandy going out as well. May be able to find an answer, but no. Marquita with the response back. Full dive in with the last Sandy the IMU. Tarzan will get one, gets two. Takes down your cutie. And Pro Destroy Kohari will fall, making that a triple. He wants the Maniac, though. Brynar will fall. Tarzan <laughs> cutie will get it. Brynar will find him in response. Maniac achieved by Tarzan cutie worth it. <laughs> I think that I know that that's what he's saying there. You can see the damage out here actually being capped there by Mark Cutie. 27,000 out there. And I want to say you can start seeing the frustration from Pro Destroy. He's able to get the kill, but then lets out a an abyssal strike at the hole of Area 77 that was chasing him. It's like there was no way you're going to get a, a kill onto somebody there. Uh, you, just a little bit of frustration coming from him uh, before he goes down. Now, Sitting at a three and ten k uh, ten kill game uh, and a five k gold lead still and established for area seventy seven. Yeah, and it looks like they want to increase that lead even further. The I'm offended though, connected on a Mark Cutie entropy activated over there by Brianar. Both of them not going to lead to a kill, which is a lot of basic beta utility. You are going to go ahead and see that uh, astral meteor go out as well. The echo 
alongside it. We'll connect on to Mark Cutie. Look at the item so far, though. You're already looking at over a 1,300 gold lead for uh, the gold laner ISO compared to Brynar. Yeah, you can already see the Hunter Strike and uh, Brute Force Breastplate picked up uh, by uh, by Tarzan, and they both have the Oracle as, or the uh, the uh, the healing item as well. So, I mean, they're well on their way. The, the dominance right here is uh, is pretty established right now. Area seventy seven just uh, pushing and enforcing their will. A little bit of a surprise there for Ureshi. Oh, it looks like they're committing too. It looks like they're getting a little bit more comfortable trying to take these fights, but is that the right answer? Braga Armor will drop Area 77, trying to maintain the pressure on the map, just trying to keep them at bay to allow the Free Lord to go in their hands. As you looking at uh, Tarzan Cutie already chunking a lot of that damage down, ready to take it, and nobody there to really contest, and down it goes. Area 77 with another objective. Yeah, and that's just kind of speaking towards the lead that they have right now, is that you're able to leave your jungler absolutely alone at the Lord while the rest of your team is on the opposite side of the map. Uh, they're not even afraid of him getting ganked. They know where Fiends is on the map, so they're just going to create that pressure, all the while uh, giving Tarzan an easy open with that Lord. Yeah, definitely a major opportunity for Area 77 to try and open up the base for fiends as you are seeing the lord starting to march down the mid lane and it looks like area 77 is going to start trying to sink the side lanes on top of that for a possible push and can they do it though i mean fiends oh it's gonna be rough right i mean they are very far behind in terms of items so in terms of the fight they should have the advantage for area 77 and speaking of advantage blake duet going out by iso clearing out these minions not going to connect for the damage zone no one feared for the knockup yureshi is going to find one marcuti takes down your acuity two members falling for the side of fiends your executive will go ahead and open up the base down goes the inhibitor for the mid lane yeah, I like that, that uh, ISO jumps in there, doesn't even lock on the targets. His goal was to clear out the minions so that they have an open base and hopefully maybe able to close this one up early. Yeah, it looks like they are trying to go in for another early finish. Astro Echo, though, for the four-man set, is going to go ahead and slow down the side of Area 77, but not stop them on the push. But Brian R with Entropy finds Tarzan Cutie. You rest Cutie, very low. Vengeance being activated. Last Insanity on the chase. Giving it all to try and take him down. To still play from Kohara, wrap it to the backside, but nobody to follow up even if he does get the set. But you are seeing them slowly make their way out of the base. Iso, though, from the side. Blazing Duet in the BMI end. Finds Brian R. The rest of the will find Kohari. It's going to be three versus four. Area 77 having the numbers. Fiends on the defense trying to hold them off. Minions still in play for the bot side. One on the top. Pro Destroy getting hit. Last Insanity. Iso will find Pro Destroy. You are going to lift the frog armor dropping. Your Rescue Cutie will fall. Jay Cutie able to pick up that kill. Chirabami by himself against the full five-man team now in play. You're looking at Tarzan trying to catch him. He's like, wait for me. Let me get to the base. Crystal, don't you end it without me. No, he's going to go in for the purple vote, but they could just end right here anyway. And that's exactly <laughs> what they're going to do. Area 77 claiming game number two against Fiends. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a dominating performance by Area 77. 10k gold lean here. I mean, it's not 15k from last game. So uh, we could say that uh, that they're getting, fiends are getting a little bit better. But man, Area 77 uh, just right on the button. Sharp as a nails right now. A great execution of that and a very early victory for them in game two of this series. Yeah, I mean, another one-sided story. I mean, right now, it's it's a little rough, right? I mean, when it comes to Fiends, I just feel like the Fiends in the regular season was a little bit stronger. And I think this is just boiling down to the synergy being a little bit off, right? I mean, that's a lot to step into, a lot of major changes this far in the game. It's an upscale battle. I mean, you're kind of fighting this internal battle on top of all the external sources you're going against, such as Area 77, who's already a little bit more comfortable on the scene 16 to 4 for game number two at a 12 minute finish yeah and uh i mean even with uh, some of the changes you can see they're not a single tower or objective for the sides of fiends they quickly got overwhelmed here by that and this was kind of uh i kind of saw this when it came through for the draft you can see there for the sides tarzan seven two and two yurashi again uh laying his claim there are three zero and ten jq doing a great job with his 10 assists as well they i mean just uh the entire team area 77 we talked about it. it's just unfortunate area 77 with how strong they are how much synergy they 
they have and how well they play in the playoffs. It's just not a team to be testing a new roster against. And it's unfortunate. I've heard that Fiends, they have issues. Uh, the issues was with like uh, school, uh, work, quizzes, and uh, midterms and things like that coming off, which is unfortunate. But that's kind of the rules we play by here in North America, uh, where like there's just other things that happen when it comes to the teammates there. For me, <laughs> like my question right now is how bad is Bray and R on Rome? And can we put Kalhari back in the in the in the marksman lane? Because oh. it just it, it feels like like is, is Brayno that bad that we can't have Kalhari there in the marksman lane? Uh, just to kind of because he was always the the highlight reel for fiends right now. It just feels like they've lost that magic right now. You can see here, rich guy nine oh three ISO in the gold lane. Mar Cutie coming up as the carry. Uh, Yuri Cutie uh, getting that eighty nine thousand damage onto himself, and Jay Cutie with ten assists. Yeah, Area 77, just a really good game. Yureshi over there, head to head in the XP lane, up against Yuri Cutie. I mean, it's KDA alone, man. It's just a very rough game. I think it just kind of boiled down to overall the objectives, which uh, kind of outshined the side of Fiends when it came to game number two. And also, game number one, a little bit of a repetitive pattern. As you are going to go ahead and see that damage dealt, the highest damage for today's match is going to go to Mark Cutie, right? Once a goal laner, now in the mid lane, wreaking havoc with the Valentina. Yeah, I, I, a huge amount of damage there. And I, I, I don't want to say, like, I kind of talked about it. I feel like right now it's not just the roster, but it's also kind of the the ability of the roster that's uh, we're kind of ironing down Pro Destroy to certain jungle picks, too. He tried out this Die Roth. Immediately I knew, like, what was his target going to be and was he going to be able to close the distance? I think the closest person he came to was getting uh, was trying to get onto ISO. We're, I know in the late game he was able to find a kill onto ISO. That's just because he got very low during a team fight. But when it came to like where Dairoth shines, when it comes to those those lane ganks, uh, he was still having trouble trying to be able to close the distance. And it, it's something we saw right from the beginning. Yeah, and I, I feel like the tank mage synergy is also something we have to kind of look at too, right? I mean, it's like the glue, the spine of the book, and that's really where uh, Area 77, I feel like, is doing a little bit better because we don't really see Chirobami and Kohari rotating together as a unit as if they're reading two different books. But speaking of uh, reading things, we got something, a little bit of a surprise for everybody out there in the Land of Dawn before we jump into the next match. That's right, guys. We are going to be having a giveaway Make sure you guys claim this hero skin, the Reactor Core Atlas. When was the last time y'all saw that Atlas in the Land of Dawn? Definitely would be excited to see it today. Hey, maybe going to manifest that into reality, but the skin is available. Limited quantity, 30 out, first come, first serve. Yeah, not 31. 30 this time and not 40. <laughs> so uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, snatch that up quickly. A little bit of a uh, uh, little giveaway for you guys uh, right away. You have to be fast though. Got to be uh, very quick on your phone. Actually, you don't even need to. It's got the, it's got the, the scanning code right there. So you just kind of scan it while you're watching on your screen and uh, boom. You're, you got everything all loaded up for you. Yeah, they need to claim that code faster than the cameraman trying to pan around on that last uh, game we had when <laughs> it was that high mobility. But, man, Private, it's been a day so far, right? We've I would say the first series was a, a sweep game. Uh, series 2, it's 2-0. Two, two it's match point, Fiends. They need to find an answer to turn this back around in their favor up against Area 77. Man, I got to say... I think, man, you can agree on this. It's it's the synergy, right? I mean, I, it's when you change so much at such a fast rate, you don't have time to really practice it out and, and figure out the kinks and flaws. And it's a very risky move this late in the game. And I think that's something that uh, Area 77 has been leaning toward for this series. Yeah, it's, it's a commonality that we've seen here, especially from the last series. I mean, if you thought there was a domination from gaming gladiators in the last series here, I mean, right now, Area 77 is kind of taking it to uh, the Fiends right now. I mean, you, they went from a team that was able to take down, uh, that was able to take down Gosu, that uh, was having a, a little bit of success here in the seasonal games that right now they just have not been able to find their footing uh, and especially just uh, not able to find, uh, even when it comes to like ganks, uh, 
the the only real gank that we saw there was from Pro Destroy, and he was kind of by himself. And, and this is kind of the complaint I made a little bit about uh, Legacy when it came to their synergy kind of getting around the lanes where they used to just go at one person was going there. It was the whole team needs to respond either to the objectives or to those ganks on the side lane to, to help facilitate that, uh, to make sure that maybe some of those abilities are burned out already so that Claude doesn't have the BMI before uh, before Pro Destroy comes in there for that Abyssal Strike or something like that. Yeah, definitely keys to victory, especially when they pick these heroes. You got to be able to not only to execute, but understand like what it takes for that hero to start having the impact you're looking for. Like you mentioned, something like a Claude, something like a late game marksman. They rely on survivability and they rely on your team getting the neutral objectives. When neither of those happen, when you get bursted down or when you, your team is not getting these turtles and they're not finding the trade-offs, it makes it harder for you to kind of shine where you're supposed to. In Area 77, I mean, they're kind of looking like how Game of Gladiators was, right? They're taking all the neutral objectives, they're taking everything with little to no contest, and you're not really seeing too much of a kickback from Fiend. You see Kohari pop in here and there, he's like, hey, I'm here, but you guys are here too and you got the numbers, and, and then he ends up getting taken down. And then that's just kind of where the disaster starts to happen. So we kind of have to see where this goes moving forward. I will say, I don't like seeing sweeps. I like seeing things go all the way. And hey, this is the playoffs, Private. Day one, best of five. If, if you had any chance, this is your shot. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I uh, do have to say uh, a little bit of the lag. The uh, apparent reason is that we do have a roster swap coming up for the side of Fiends. You can see there, Pro Destroy uh, is going to be subbed out for Magic, but it's not going to be Magic coming in as a jungler. Uh, from what I understand, we're going to be swapping around the roles a bit here for Fiends, and uh, Magic will be going to his normal spots at mid, and the uh, rest of the roster is going to adjust for that. Oh, man. That's <laughs> it's like committing uh, open heart surgery and brain <laughs> surgery at the same time in a, in a, in a burning oh. building. But uh, we'll have to see how this kind of goes with the roster changes. Hopefully it works in their favor. Hopefully everything's all right. But Synergy. Synergy is going to be their biggest enemy even outside of Area 77. And I hope they can find it in game number three. Yeah, that's going to be interesting is uh, because uh, usually they had Churubami at mid, so I'm assuming maybe Churubami might be going as the jungler. Whatever it is, I'm kind of hoping that uh, the answer involves Kohari in the marksman lane because, I mean, not to take anything away from uh, from Brayanar, but Kohari has been that staple for the Fiends uh, that no matter, it's it's one of those those little talking points that I bring up when, it, when we talk about the greatest marksman in North America right now. It's marksmen that are able to do their job get their gold and be successful despite how their team is doing and kohari has proven that he is one of those marksmen that even if his team is behind eventually he's going to hit his power spike eventually he's going to be able to first forward and he's going to be able to get a lot of those uh those kills and turn around uh, a lot of that momentum for his team but i mean we've been harping a little bit uh, on uh, fiends here but let's not take anything away from like how great Area 77 is and, and has been looking out there from their picks to dominating their lanes to how well they've been rotating. Uh, it's just been, this is uh, an Area 77, like I said, that we love to see here in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of a funny little statistic to throw out there, but Area 77 is four wins in a row right now. <laughs> They're definitely on that train and they, they want to mm -hmm. stay on it as long as they can. But speaking about staying on track of things, we're going to jump into the draft. Area 77 up against Fiends. Both teams ready to take it out again in the land of Dawn. But now we have to see where this goes, right? Area 77. <laughs> Wait, are we? We're in game. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, as we are, uh, yeah, we're keeping things interesting. But looking at the band so far, we are looking at the double support knocked out for both sides. And now we're looking at me in private again. Private. What's up? Can't wait for it to <laughs> jump back into there. But hey, let's just jump back on that When you were talking about Kohari, you were talking about um, what he kind of provides for the team. I think he's the tempo setter, right? I mean, when he thrives, they thrive. When he doesn't, they don't. So I think they just kind of need to play into, play into Kohari, and that's going to be their strongest thing. But now back into the land of Dawn. We are going to go ahead and uh, get ready to class it out, though. Ignore the roll icons. It's just uh, we like to keep things interesting. Keep you guys on your toes. All right. But another support taking off. We are going to see the Angela for Area 77. 
I, I do like this band coming out from the side of fiends here. I was about to say, CC and Claude are the main issues right now for Area 77. You just need to either have an answer or just take them off the board for Area 77 as uh, uh, both of these players, Yureshi and Iso, have shown just how dominant they can be in their lanes with these. We're going for that first pick for Area 77 now. Yeah, first pick on the board. A lot to grab, and it looks like it'll be the safety route. With that Fredgen, most likely going to be in the jungle, which means they have a lot of frontline capability and some CC stacked alongside it and survivability. On the other side of the table, Fiends going to risk it early, going to go in for their mage. They're going to pick up the Valentina. Now, I'm not too against it. I don't necessarily think I would have picked it there, but it still works because it provides draft pressure to make Area 77 think twice before they slot their next picks. Yeah, I was about to say too, like, I, I, even though I, I prefer Valentina in an answer to something because you see ultimates out there that you're going to want to steal. But at this point, if you pick it early, it does mean that it kind of delegates to Area 77. Now you have to think about what ultimates you're going to give me because I have an a uh, Valentina out there. And it, so it's going to have to adjust some of their roster. You see a Zaman Force out there for uh, for ISO. Uh, Valentina's not going to be able to do much with that. And we're going to see how. How many other ultimates we're going to be juggling around here for area 77 yeah and speaking of answers a little bit of a counter right there you're going to see the harith picked up the response over there to brian r on the carry brian r has a little bit of a harder time so far from what we've seen you kind of mentioned some of the key points earlier today and it's going to be a little bit of challenge especially up against iso when he's running that direct counter speaking of counters though the Minotaur into a Valentina. Now, that's a very bold statement because the Valentina <laughs> will profit off that as well. Yeah, it, it, she'll profit off of it. It's, uh, and when you were talking about the Harith pickup here, it, it's uh, it's almost like kind of a, a uh, basically telling you guys, I dare you to pick Roger. We're trying to take that off of the board. Uh, it's also a decent counter for Joy, but we, I don't really think there's too many people on Fiends that, uh, that really like to play that Joy. And in fact, I, I'm not even sure who's jungling on their side right now. So, uh, I mean, that actually kind of might be a little bit of a plus on the side of Fiends because it's all kind of up in the air. We don't even know who's jungling, so we don't really know what picks are there for them and what are or what is available so maybe we take off uh, we don't take off some of those more mechanical heroes and maybe somebody there on fiends actually plays a decent mechanical fanny a decent mechanical joy or a nolan oh this is called in so we do got the rolls now it is going to be kohari inside of the jungle this time whoa oh Switching okay it up. magic will be in the wrong position brian r will be the gold and shirobami the mid and yuri cutie will be in the xp lane is that something you would have pre predicted? Would that have been your guess, Private? It, it, honestly, if 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 I was uh, set on Brian R being in gold lane, the only other adjustment I would have made was Kohari as a jungler, which fits. We've talked before about how well some of these roles kind of lend themselves to another role that might be uh, that might be beneficial for it. Marksman lane and the jungle kind of come in together. Uh, I want to say because the jungle is what the marksman wishes it could do but it has to be patient it has to get its gold it needs to wait for the team to get in there and then you get to the, the mid game and you're able to shine off the jungle can do that right away and i feel like it might benefit uh kohari's play style man I'll, I'll tell you what he might be breaking the record for swapping the most roles in the nact <laughs> in a single season i mean we've seen him run uh, the gold lane, the roam, and now the jungle. I mean, man, this this dude can definitely do it all. That's his new nickname, Mr. Do-It-All. I mean, he, <laughs> he just has a trick up his sleeve every step of the way. But the options that he has available, are they the right choices? And that's what we're going to be looking into today. Another pickup, though, for the side of Area 77. They are going to go ahead and slot in uh, that Vexana. So they're going to be able to have that Eternal Guard, that knock up to be able to provide a little bit more damage to the side of Fiends. But speaking of Fiends, they have mobility. They picked up the Yuzon. Ooh, and the Masha pickup. It's uh, is that's gonna be in the XP lane as well. If you guys haven't seen uh, a lot, I know in North America it's been slowly picking up. Masha does an immense amount of damage, especially now that her Thunderclap ultimate resets with every single bar that she loses. I know we saw it a little bit. Uh, I want to say from the side of Legacy, who I, I feel like they just took it off the table because they didn't want to see. 
it on the gaming gladiators. But here, I mean, we might be able to see here, especially as you go into the mid game with Masha. Once she gets that first item, usually a, a blade of hepsis, uh, she's going to be one shotting a lot of these targets here on the side of Fiends. I think Private's uh, talking about some of his ranked matches he's been doing recently, man. You definitely know <laughs> he's speaking from experience. But speaking of experience, something that we've seen across the land of Dawn for a, a decent amount of time. Ube Strat may be in effect for the side of Fiends. They are going to pick up that Estus alongside that Barat. So they're going to be playing that little tank and support uh, method to be able to rush in and take these neutral objectives. We know the heals from Estus can definitely be overwhelming. Now, I'm really excited to see how this plays off. We don't really get to see the Estus and uh, Barat's combination too often. They have late game in the bag as well, too. They do have that carry, but it may be a problem up against the Harith, who is the direct counter. Yeah, hats off right now to uh, Fiends, especially Kohari, dude, who has been, he's basically laid claim here that, I mean, I don't know where my team needs me, but I'm going to fill that role to help out this team, regardless of how the roster is uh, doing, his be doing his best here to try to help out Fiends uh, where they need it. Yeah, it just shows how flexible of a player he is and how dedicated he is to trying to win this out. Area 77 up against Fiends, game number three, match point. Fiends needs to find a way to turn this around. Can they get the reverse sweep or will Area 77 knock them down to the lower bracket? 1% <laughs> moving over to Area 77. <laughs> it was a uh, 80% to 20% there, and I think they uh, they lost that 1% with that last game, unfortunately. Uh, we're going to see here how well it kind of comes together. I'm eager to see how well. Uh, I haven't seen too many Mashas in the uh, XP lane. I've seen a lot of them as a roam position. I've seen some Masha junglers. I'm eager to see how well, especially because Masha, her early game is not very favorable. Uh, and against somebody like Yuzong, who can potentially bully uh, it might be a little bit of a, a mark there. As we see a lot of impure rages there when it comes to the emblems for the side area 77. Yeah, and I mean, hey, this is a, technically a new lineup for Fiends right now, right? I mean, this is different synergy from game number uh, two and one, and they're being very aggressive, but it looks like it's kind of working in the favor, at least on the bottom side. A lot of damage is dealt over to the uh, JQD. He will be forced to go back to the base. Uh, yeah, and uh, a little bit of a, a press up at top. Uh, not too big of engagement. Now we're starting to see Kohari move to the top. Uh, the big thing here is I want to see how well the team synergizes together. Do we have the callouts from Kohari? Are we going to get more of a group of like three or four people looking for ganks uh, in some of these lanes? And are we going to all be lined up when it's time for these objectives? Yeah, you are seeing Magic. He is rocking that uh, Quantum Charge, so it would be a little bit more mobile, especially running that Estus, needing to get back to safety. He does have the Flicker to be able to expand that distance as well. The heals may be a problem for Area 77 if left unchecked. You are going to go ahead and see Fiends, and then this is different than the last two games, right? They're looking like they may be able to take control of these neutral objectives if they play it off right, but Area 77 not trying to let it go without a fight. First turtle going to Fiends. Yeah, a little bit of a difference here. I mean, last uh, last game, uh, Area 77, last two games, I want to say, Area 77, uh, barely even let Fiends uh, even get sight of the turtle. Here, Fiends get their first turtle uh, unanswered from Area 77 here. Yeah, on the bot side, ISO taking a couple of hits. Brian R doing a good job sustaining himself down there. Nobody has fallen so far, but the first turtle will go to Fiends, giving him a little bit of that boost and momentum and also the economy over Area 77, as well as experience. But speaking of experience, 2v1 rotation to the top side. Your cutie hit with the Eternal Guard. Your executed trying to go in for the final hit, but it looks like you will be able to get out of there with very low HP. Uh, yeah, a, a little bit of a bait oh! there from the side. Oh, still got him. I'm wondering if that was the uh, Eternal Guardian or uh, a little bit. Yeah, that, that had to have been the Eternal Guardian eventually caught up to Yuri <laughs> Kitty, slowly but surely making his way to uh, Yu Zong. I think the Eternal Guardian was able to get a battle spell of his own like he used the execution on him. <laughs> Last second, trying to close that distance. Well, speaking of closing distance, Zaman Force dropping down. Brian R, very low. Kahari wrapping around. Magic keeping the team alive with the Blessing of the Moon God. Goddess, JQD and ISO 2v3. Make that possibly four. And sure, Bami thought about going down there, but quickly shifting focus to the mid lane. Yeah, he's going to try to clear up. Uh, well, and this is the thing, too. Uh, he's going up there while you see this engagement still kind of happening down at the bottom, looking for something here onto your cutie. Yeah, very low, though. Not going to be able to get out of there. Too much CC to handle. Tarzan will be able to take the second kill of the game for Area 77. They want more, though. Airborne knock up your Reshi. Finding Shurabami for their third kill. Brian R, very low. ISO, 
Man looking like Tony Montana out there himself. That was a 2v1, and he was dealing a lot of heavy damage to Brian Art. Yeah, and you can see here already. Oh, uh, actually starting with the C halberd uh, is Ooh. the Masha Yuri Cutie. Uh, so he's going to try to take away a lot of what kind of makes that Yuzong stand out. A lot of that regening ability. He's going to want to try to dominate that lane there. And on the other side, we see we're still trying to keep up with our first items. The only one that actually has it uh, is Carry. Yeah, big Minoan Fury, but the turtle will fall. Sure, Bami is going to go ahead and take one. J Cutie will drop. Your cutie takes down Tarzan cutie, your rescue cutie to respond will find magic. That's gonna be a two for one trade, but this time the turtle goes to area 77. Yeah, and you can see there, Yureshi Cutie comes in, Thunderclaps, finds himself two kills, and just narrowly able to find himself an escape. Zaman Force down. He's gonna drop in the mid lane. Brynar doesn't want any part of that problem. You're looking at a, a different story right now from what we've seen in game number one and game number two. And hey, I, I said it. I don't like seeing sweeps. And if they keep up this pace, you know, Area 77 may have to find a new strategy. Yeah, and uh, right now, I mean, it's, it's not too bad right now. About a 1,600 gold lead for the side of Area 77. Not as dominant as the game they had before. The games they had before this. Ooh! Then his welcome will connect for the stun onto Jay Cutie, but now the counterplay, the Manoa Fury knockup, setting up Magic Brian R and Kohari. Jay Cutie able to get the kill off of it as well. Fiends changing their plans. A quick escape out of there. Area 77 finding their footing. Oh, Kohari seeing red there, dives a little too deep into Area 77 territory to get that Detna's welcome, and then ends up kind of costing his team as it was the perfect set, the perfect opportunity for JQD to come in with a Minoan Fury, which kind of set his entire team. Yeah, and Guardian's helmet picked up by Kohari. Should be able to sustain himself and stay in these fights even longer with some region as he rotates around the map. We are gonna see the turtle spawn in the next 15 seconds. Both sides actually able to claim one so far. You are looking at Area 77 up by three kills, but this is still anybody's game. And I think they realize that, right? They're not trying to overstay their welcome. They're just trying to wait for Fiends to make a mistake, but it doesn't look like they plan on doing that anytime soon. Yeah, and uh, right now, I mean, 5-2 to two right now, it's a much more even game. Area 77 now starting to get a little bit more dominant. Uh, Fiends just not in a position to really counteract as they start coming in. Black Dragon from Yuri Cutie dropping down with the Petrified Tarzan Cutie appraises Wrath last second before the stun claims the turtle for Area 77. Furious dive, though, enhanced soul grip, knock up for the known Fury. Yureshi Cutie will find magic. Yuri Cutie finds a response back, takes down Yureshi. Mark Cutie! We'll find Kohari a one for two trade in the turtle pit, but in the mid lane, the chase still on the way. And Chirobami on the bot side, forced to use the flicker. Very low, needs to get out of there. Mark Cutie will find him. Iso finds Chirobami. A full wipeout against Fiends, wondering where they went wrong. And Area 77 finds their rhythm. Yeah, and even though, like, I mean, Yureshi Cutie came in there, set the tone, dove in, thunderclap, gets himself a kill, dies in the process, but sets the tone as the rest of Area 77 able to kind of collapse in around the fiends, and then they just picked them off one by one as they were trying to make their escape. Yeah, a little bittersweet for them. Definitely not what they had planned right there. This is going to give a big boost to Area 77 inside of this game. They were looking for a mistake, and they found one, but a response back possibly on the way. Detna's welcome will connect Kohari very low. Yureshi Cutie with that thunderclap going in is going to be able to take him down. Magic on the retreat. Brian R. Chirabami by his side will be able to burst down the eternal guard, but you are going to go ahead and see Area 77 with ground control. Yeah, 4, 1, and 2 for your Rushy Cutie right now. Uh, he's having a heck of a game right now. Looks like he's building. Oh, he just got that BOD. So now, I mean, you thought he was doing damage before. He is going to be uh, coming in there with haymakers. Every single time these uh, engagements come out, Ope, uh, come open and it's it's so hard this is why Masha is usually banned uh, at the top of NA right now because there's just really nothing you can do to stop her especially once you start reaching into the mid game and once she starts getting her items yeah and this is different than the Masha game we've seen earlier which really didn't have any profit <laughs> and this is interesting because you mentioned that Masha picked up the Sia Halberd first as a response over there to Yu Zong and it's still 
worked inside of Yureshi's favor. And right now, 12 to 3, up by a decent amount of kills at the 9 minute mark. And leading in terms of turrets and turtles, they're looking to claim some more real estate. You're going to see the knock up on the way, but no one's sure you're not going to be able to connect for the set they're looking for. Kohar with a lot of chain CC. ISO will find the kill. Your cutie, wait a second. Black Dragon trying to stop them from taking the tier 2 turret for the mid lane. Not able to get there in time, but Yureshi on the Masha. Full dive to the four-man team, trying to find a pickoff. Oh my goodness, the essence, the residue, will connect on to Jay Cutie in the kill, going over to Yuri Cutie on the Uzong. Yeah, and uh, you're actually doing a good job there. He goes in, bursts down about uh, two health bars. Once he gets down to his last one, he makes himself an escape. All the while, fiends have to back off because every single punch that he lays out there is doing an exorbitant amount of damage to them right now. Fiends right now sitting at four kills, a 10K gold deficit. Uh, well, um, a 9K at the nine minute mark. Uh, and this has just been the play style right here for Area 77, 1K per minute uh, in advance. Ooh, speaking of advancing, that is welcome connecting for the set. Yureshi very low. ISO will find Kohari just in time. The Praises Wrath dropping down, but hit with the Terrify from Shura Bombi, but rushing in with the energy eruption. Tarzan on the dive. ISO with the follow-up and the Siege on the way, trying to claim one of these inhibitors' minions. Intact Area 77 on the push. Yeah, right now, Area 77. I mean, they're just a, a well-oiled machine here, pushing their way into it. They got all the towers uh, until the high grounds, and now trying to force their way through mid. Yeah, trying to close this out, looking for the sweep, the second sweep of the day, possibly to knock down Fiends into the lower bracket. Two more inhibitors to go through, and a four-man team. They have the numbers, they have the advantage, can they follow through ISO? Taking an inhibitor, big knockup. Tarzan will find magic. Black Dragon from Yurikuti getting back to the base for regen. Kohari will fall. Thunderclap over there from Yureshi to secure the kill. Furious dive from Yurikuti connecting to three members of Area 77. Yureshi will find Yurikuti to respond though on the aggressive dive. Base crystal 50%. Brian R finds Tarzan, Cutie, Turabami, and Brian R in the base. Against the four man team of Area 77. Make that one as ISO finds Shurabami. Brian R gets a double, finds ISO. The base crystal will fall. And Area 77 takes down Fiends with a clean sweep. Victory! A clean, a, a refreshed playoff level Area 77 here. I mean, I mean. What we'll say about this team? Your Reshi and Mar Cutie leading the charge here, uh, and absolutely laying waste to their opponent. Yeah, laying down the law, letting them know, hey, we are here and ready to stay, landing from a whole nother planet and taking over yours. Now, team stats on the board, 19, 6, and 40. I wouldn't say it was the easiest game for them, but they were still able to pull off that nine rating, higher than the last game, mind you, as well. Now. That Fiends did look pretty promising. I think they did a lot well in the beginning, but then Kohari was not able to find the defensive stance on that Barats to be able to make up the dis difference, even with the Estus, to keep him alive in Area 77 punished. Uh, yeah, there there were just some opportunities. Kohari, I want to say, split off from the team a little bit, uh, not respecting the damage. That might be a little bit of a play style or just not, uh, not as understanding of the kit of uh barats there i mean he he charged in he left himself open for a lot of those uh those engagements it, and he was getting bursted down there's a certain point though too where it just comes on to the fact that area 77 was just so far into the lead so much damage that there's not much that kohari would have been able to do when you're dealing with the zaman force the magic damage that's coming out of mark Uti and iso there as well and then uh i want to say yureshi here six one and four a great job probably a staple right now for these last three games Games here for area 77 and then like i was saying mark cutie sitting at three zero and eleven just really laying down that suppressive fire to really burst down uh even a t player and a character as tanky as kohari on that barats and speaking of the game just a little bit of a look at a couple of the stats so far the rich guy iso highest gold per minute and also the carry with the most damage seventy five thousand kohari the sandbag taking a lot of that damage on that Barats and the forgotten one racking up those phenomenal assists sitting at 12 JQD.
yeah uh great gameplay by them uh and this is just uh showing the dominance of area 77 this is why i kind of picked them as my underdog pick here for to do well in the playoffs regardless of who they're facing man i mean this is just a team that when it comes time for the playoffs when it comes time to really show out they really step up to the line you see here head to head uh your reshi cutie really laying down the law into the xp lane and there just wasn't much that yuri cutie was able to do yeah, I mean, it looks like they sparked a fire and Fiends was not able to put it out and it lit up the room very quickly. It took down the entire building for Fiends. I mean, they did their best, right? We just saw them go through three different rosters uh, today, three different types of uh, play styles trying to find an answer and it just wasn't there. Area 77 at every single door waiting for them to open it and they were able to execute. They were able to perform and like you mentioned, they're a team that's went the additional mile, that's made it to an offline event for the playoffs previously in NACT, and it looks like they're trying to take it there again. I just really like this composition from the side of Area 77 too, because you have so much CC, you have so much suppressive fire being laid down from the Vexana, uh, from ISO there, that when Yureshi came in there, it was just easy pickings. He's just like finding the lowest person, punch, you're down. Finding the other next person, punch, you're down. Uh, all the while, they're kind of trying to burst down his life bars, and he's just able to kind of find that escape, except for that one uh, death he took in the early game great games guys did you expect it to go down this way i mean we expected area 77 to take the victory but not in this fashion though oh man you gotta expect the unexpected especially this nact i mean i we're breaking records today i mean we're seeing players swap to multiple roles not something that we've seen it too often and i mean it's definitely something that can kind of hinder you sometimes it can work but this just didn't seem to be that occasion this time around but hey there's still another chance so we'll have to see how they kind of play it out in the lower bracket but area 77 that was a little bit more expected i, I think we predicted this i think all three of us predicted area 77 kind of taking this victory just due to the <laughs> pure reason of the roster changes now fiends I, you know, I gotta extend this question to you guys too if fiends never switched their roster and this was the same fiends for the regular season would you still have picked area 77 so confidently or do you think it would have kind of shifted you in like either direction private why don't you take, take, take a go at it <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for me, uh, with Area 77 opening and beating BTK, I instantly became a fan. So I'm kind of biased in that regard. I would have Area 77. And plus, uh, it's hard to kind of pick against their showmanship from the last season, too. I have seen, I know how they can play in the playoffs. And uh, Fiends was still that question mark, even with that 100% roster. Yeah, I would I would agree. I mean, if one thing that the regular season did for us is to provide us this ranking of the tiers of, of each each teams after the points that they collected, and we can see that Fiends, although had a very great start, were not the top four contenders. The top four area semi was one of the one of the top top players. So definitely I would agree that might have still voted for area seventy seven, but I I think Fiends could have maybe taken a win or, or or there. But that gives me the question, like I want to interview Fiends and get to the bottom of it. What caused the roster change? I mean, what went on for them to, like Private said it during the games, like it must have been that their roamer was just not it for Kohari to drop that goal lane and, and go into roamer. Because what else could have triggered that change? Oh. I feel like there could be a million reasons, you know, it'd be, it'd be very hard to speculate. But nonetheless, I think it ends in the same results. It's just not proven to work in your best interest when you swap, especially in the playoffs, uh, so suddenly. And hopefully, uh, you know, they kind of learn and they progress and they find that more solidified team that they can focus on and perfect their flaws. Uh, it's, uh, from what I've heard, and this is only, uh, rumors, but like, it's mostly school exams, uh, outside, uh, things that they needed to take care of that caused uh, some of these roster changes. And that's kind of the friendlier side of some of these roster changes. And an unfortunate thing that you get here in North America, where a lot of these guys have other priorities, uh, when it comes to education and stuff like that, uh, that you're going to kind of for, uh, which I'm gonna say is probably a little better than some of these, uh, some of the roster changes that happen because they feel like the other player might be better. Uh, it, regardless, there is a synergy uh, uh, toll 
that must be paid uh, when you do make some of these swaps. And uh, Area 77, uh, it uh, continues to impress. And that's, that's another thing, too. You, you got all these tests against a team like Area 77. That is just, uh, it's basically a, the, what we've seen here is kind of what you do with some of these shakeups against teams that are established, like Gaming Gladiators and Area 77, and that uh, know what they're doing and have that synergy. And you've kind of seen the cost here tonight. Yeah, for sure. And we understand with North America, these players do have other priorities and we fully respect that. I mean, it is difficult to commit fully to the NACT when you don't have the fund, the fundings, the sponsors, everything. So, I mean, just hopefully they will do better in the lower brackets. And the MVP of the series will go to Drum Rose, please. You rushy cutie. Stuff we see, take us through it. Oh, Yureshi, man, he's been a problem. He's a shot caller, he's high IQ, you go, you name it, he's got it. And it definitely showcased today, as you are seeing him dominate with multiple different heroes, especially inside of that XP lane, initiating where needed, split pushing, creating the separation, and allowing the team to take the neutral objectives to give him the slightest advantage. Yeah, not just that, but I've heard that uh, Yureshi has a big part when it comes to drafting, when it comes to a lot of these calls as well on the team. And just, I mean, he's just got a level of experience that is just uh, uh, matched by very few people here in North America. And it's in that lane showed it to the point where they actually had to ban out that CC because he was so dominant in the first two games, but then picks up the Masha and dominates anyway in another fashion. Yeah, and I mean, I, I hope this season at Yurashi's uh, visa situation has all gotten fixed up because, I mean, he was a strong dominating XP laner for for the past year or so. It's just not always does he is he able to, to shine and then to have that stage to perform. But this season, I guess we're going to see them um, continue uh, to continue outdoing themselves. I mean, we saw a uh, maniac coming in from Tarzan today. So yeah. a lot of uh, surprising plays, a lot of surprising hero points as well. Yeah, I mean, hey, that's what I'm all for, right? Yeah, we got to see a Maniac. We got to see two sweeps today. I was hoping for a, uh, a long run in the five, but hey, tomorrow's definitely another store and we're just getting started. I mean, this is only day one of the playoffs, but guys, keep in mind, this is not the points anymore. This is not the regular season. It is make it or break it as teams are gonna be getting knocked out here soon. Yeah, we still have two more series, uh, exciting series coming from round one tomorrow. But all that's been answered today is that there's going to be an exciting match of Gaming Gladiators versus Area 77 in round two. And I'm really excited for that one, too. Yeah, for sure. And like Kohari actually said in a previous interview, he thinks that Area 77 has a pretty similar draft with um, BTK. And that's why we saw some similar bands to counter out Tarzan's hero pull. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we don't have an interview with Tarzan today. Um, uh, we are going to see how Area 77 plays against GG, like you mentioned. Maybe they, they might clinch a win here and there because best of out of five gives you a lot more opportunities to and and a lot more um focus on how well you can continue to drive that momentum after five series unfortunately today we didn't get to see the full five series but maybe tomorrow we are gonna see more of that because tomorrow we have some very um exciting matchups coming from the four teams they are very neck to neck with their points in the regular season. And we're gonna see a similar trend of um, one side switching up their rosters and the other side not doing it at all. So, I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think any of the roster changes coming in tomorrow might actually help the team instead of what they did today? Oh, uh, uh, Joy Boss. I think Joy Boss will be an interesting one. I mean, him jumping back into the scene. He's played on two different teams so far. This NACT, both of them, did not make it into the regular season, but now Joy Boss having a second chance to redeem himself on a team that has that top eight caliber, maybe the different stories. So that is one that I'm looking forward to seeing. Now, can they pull it off? Even though he's a great player, I, I think it's still going to boil down to like the synergy, maybe a little bit of challenge compared to other teams who don't switch it as often. But I would say that's one of the teams I am looking forward to seeing. I want to see just how well uh, with Devious Activity picking up Joy Boss, how effective they will be. And then they also have Melon too, switching. So that'll be interesting for the gold lane. 
Well, well, Melvin, uh, he's already been a mainstay. I think he was subbing in for the last few matches uh, for Devious Activity. That's the, I think that's uh, the big question. Devious has got a lot of changes to their roster. Uh, but as far as like the overarching uh, support, you've got a lot of people who have played together on that team for a while already. Joy Bajato, uh, T, they've played together. Uh, they've got a long-standing history in North America oh, yeah. playing together. So, I mean, if anybody's going to be able to be the exception to the rule, even though I kind of, I, I hold that rule to the same. <laughs> Synergy means a lot more than I feel. A, it ha it needs a lot more respect than I think a lot of people give it uh, in a lot of these matchups. So, so I, I, as much as I feel like they, they have some synergy, I feel like maintaining that same roster, it's just, it's a powerful thing, uh, especially as we move into these playoffs. And we've seen, I mean, I want to say like, there's just been a difference between how some of these teams perform in the playoffs. I mean, even Legacy stepping up, I want to say a, a lot more aggressive, a lot more uh, synergized with some of their ganks into the side lanes and how they operated, not able to get over the hurdle that is gaming gladiators. Uh, but then, and then also uh, how fiends uh, uh, kind of had uh, some issues uh, coming up uh, above a lot of the roster swaps that they had here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Devious Activity is pulling back that BTK 2.0 vibes with the new <laughs> roster swap. That's definitely a roster swap, swap that's more tactical and strategic rather than just players not being able to, um, to commit to the tournament. But let's take a recap of today's matches. We had pretty straightforward matches that Gaming Gladiators and Area 77 continues their path to victory. First series, Legacy tried to pull out some plays but ultimately was not able to clinch a win from Gigi's pocket. Beans also had some roster changes, got our head scratching with what they decided to change, faced a 3.0 defeat, showing you that if it ain't broken, why you try to fix it. But what surprised me though was Kohari the Brave this season trying to prove us that they, he is the jack of all trades as he <laughs> went from Marksman to SP Lane to Rome and ultimately to Jungle. So that's got to be something to look out for. Now bracket wise, why don't you take us through it, Safuizi? That's right. As we did finish day one, our first two series for the playoffs, both of them ending in 3-0 sweeps tomorrow will be some more exciting matches. Two series, both of them will be a best of five. Thirsty Kings up against Bloodhounds and the Night Horde up against Devious Activity. And it's going to be full of surprises. Like we said, there's been a couple of roster changes here and there. Will it be the difference to be able to push that team forward or will it drop them down to the lower bracket? Yeah, not just that, but you saw there at the lower bracket, it's going to be Fiends taking on Legacy. So still some opportunities for those teams, uh, despite uh, how they performed or uh, how the results ended here today. Uh, still some hope there for Fiends or Legacy. If they can, I mean, we saw some some signs of life from Legacy. Maybe that is going to be what is going to be enough to take them over a Fiends who is struggling right now with their roster. I mean, even if Legacy continues to face the troubles they've been facing, it's also a record to break that you haven't gotten a single win the entire season. That's something to um, hold it into your books, you know, and that's another accomplishment. Not every team are able to do that as well. So um, I think that this entire season has been pretty entertaining for all of us. I mean, for Legacy, they had their shot, they had their fair shot. It's just everyone else this season has been just exceeding our expectations. Yeah, I mean, I will say Legacy definitely has the most room to grow, which is also a great thing for them. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're the new team on the scene, so they definitely have a lot more people trying to expect a lot out of them. Uh, but this is their first time. A lot of these other teams have been here a couple of seasons, and it definitely showcases inside of the gameplay. But you did mention they broke a record. I guess that's a great way to look at it. I mean, maybe we, we do a little diamond prize or something like that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we work something out down the line as throws that into the, the next NACT. But nonetheless, it doesn't take away from the excitement that we have to offer from all of these matches with all of these teams is, again, the total purpose is to find who can represent us in North America on the international scene. And I think we have some great prospects. Well, I mean, on that note, uh, when it comes to like some of the history here in North America, Fiends was actually what uh, it was a combination of two former teams in NACT, one of them being Aggravate ones who, if you remember last season, 
didn't have that different of a season from Legacy, where they kind of went winless uh, in a lot of their series. Is coming back this season, they were able to find the roster, find the combinations that made them a little bit more successful. So, I mean, uh, hopefully, uh, no matter how the results happen for Legacy, hopefully, this is just the beginning of their story of competition here in North America. That's a great way to put it. I almost, I almost forget that um, Fiends actually came from uh, aggravated ones, and they're doing so much better this season compared to last season. So we are expecting a lot more from Assassin Riles and his assassination at eSports. Now, forecasters, any last words before we end today's broadcast? Uh, today was fun. Definitely, hey, one guy, <laughs> one person we didn't give credit to is that cameraman on the other side and i wanted to say hey that was some great stuff especially on that high mobility uh series for the first series game number uh three so definitely shout out to that liz it's been a pleasure private as always thank you so much for casting alongside me and i look forward to seeing you guys in future nact matches I absolutely, uh, an absolute pleasure to just open up things and, and set the tone for the playoffs here uh, with a lot of these teams, with casting alongside Wheezy and Liz. It's always been a pleasure. I'm so excited and uh, waiting to see how much more we can bring here for the playoffs and then hopefully uh, when where we end up in Las Vegas. Hopefully. I mean, that wraps us up for today, day one of the playoff stage. Tomorrow, we have BTK versus Bloodhound and Nighthorde versus Divas Activity. Competition are fierce, stakes are high, and can Nighthorde continue to see that momentum we saw in the last of regular season? We'll find out tomorrow. It's uh, Liz, Steph Weezy, and Private signing off. We'll see you tomorrow.